Ark 12, Heavens, Chapter 5 What the fuck was I supposed to do? I wanted to rage, to tear in there and bring half the building down on them all. I would, too, but it would only make more of a mess of a messy situation, with people and pieces of people caught in the rubble along with dangerous capes and explosives. I wanted to take this egg he'd made to be uncrackable and take it apart, figure it out, unravel the riddle, but there was a small army in the way. I wanted to curl up into a ball like the one in front of me, like my mom could do. I wanted to think all of this through, and I didn't have the time to. I couldn't do any of those things. I studied the scene and the egg. A light glowed within, and a dulled red glow made it through the places where flesh was thinnest, whether that flesh was covered in skin or not. Everything fit together, and there didn't seem to be any seams or keyholes. All was rigid, frozen, and held up in space. I was put in mind of Clock Blocker from back home. I thought about the fact that something like the broken whip, which I'd last seen in Rain's possession, would have been needed for this. Was this a second version? Something not like a whip? I'd networked as best as I could, and I'd done it with this kind of situation in the back of my mind, with situations like Sveta's in the back of my mind. My thoughts briefly settled on Chris, Lab Rat. They touched on other alternatives. How would a biology-altering power interact with this? No, not if it was effectively clock-blocked, for lack of a better way of putting it. What else, then? Tackling the army so we could get close and do something more effective? The glowing light shining between flesh made me think of my dad, of my mom. It was uncomfortable to think of the glowing, widespread tangle of horror and associate it with my own time in the hospital, which, of course, led me back to the non-solution that was my sister. I didn't want to get trapped in circular thinking— that panic space like a nightmare that had persisted from my first nights out that hadn't ended in winds. Trying to save someone who'd fallen from a high place. I'd fly after, grab their hand, only to find it so slick with blood that it slipped out like a wet bar of soap. Again and again as they fell impossibly far. Or like the nightmares that had been the hospital room, where all I'd had had been my mind and that mind hadn't had enough stimulation. No place to go but in circles. I turned my eyes away from the scene and turned my thoughts out and away from the circle. One deep breath. I focused on the tangible instead, the chill air that was trapped inside the bubble that was the wretch with me, the smell of oxygen, for lack of a better word, of earth and trees and the lack of the city smell. It had been the first things I'd trained in doing when I had panic attacks. What was I supposed to do? Something. Anything. Non-action was the only thing that wasn't allowed here. The wall I was running into was just that. A wall. An egg I couldn't penetrate without hurting innocents or allies. I hugged the roof, dodging the flashlight of the patrol that had settled at one corner, and flew to the opposite end of the building. Sveta. That you? she asked. It me. I could grab it. It's huge, but it's hollow. Pretty sure I could do it, Sveta murmured. I considered that option. There are a lot of things about that option I'm not sure about, she confessed. Yeah, I said. What if I can't? Yeah, that's an issue. If you can't budget and everything goes out the window, and even if you can, where do we take it? No exit's big enough, so I have to tear a hole in the wall, I said. And if you're in a position to do that, then we could be doing other things. Yeah, it was the best I could think of, Sveta said. Those poor people in there. Is that Moonsong's group? Byron's ex? I think, at least some of them, some of our group. Ashley's foot, Tristan's middle. Yeah, I whispered. He's buying time. Yeah, 
I said. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that when it's close to time for him to wake up, he'll have all of the mercenaries he hired come back. Any we didn't disable, any he had elsewhere, anyone helping March even. March. I thought of the situation at the city, the city unfolding. It's what Paris said. We can't take action without hurting people. Probably. He might have decoys inside, or he might be inside with people set up. He had to anticipate that we might be in this situation. And what happens next? He gets to this stalemate, then he has plans to move to another Earth? He bails? It's a lot of enemies to be making. I had another suspicion, a worry about what Cradle was considering, but I didn't let myself consider it. I'm going to talk to the others, I said. Can you keep watch here? I can. Happy to be useful. High five, I said, putting my hand over the ledge. She slapped it, more like a whip than a hand, but not too audible. Thank you, she said, quiet. As I'd flipped through faces like Chris and my parents, I found myself thinking of all of the various capes out there, living and dead. Of the ones who fit categories, from cloning to flesh-molding, Blasto, Rottenfanger's music, Jerky Meat's puppets, Jamestowner's radioactive mutant cannibals, non-options. What didn't answer to Sveta's problem look like? What gave her weld and gave me a best friend I could hug when she needed a hug? Be safe, I said. You too. I waited, watching the flashlight beams moving around the area before choosing a time to take flight. I hurt. My foot hurt. My hand hurt. I was cold, and the wretch wasn't as good as winter clothing. My arms felt like I'd had the workout of my life and then compounded the aches and pains by getting beat around the upper body with baseball bats. I hurt on other levels. Dealing with all of this, seeing people hurt, it wasn't easy. Nobody was doing well, except for the worst people. At one point, at a thousand points, I'd wished I'd been able to participate in the full course of events that had plagued my hometown. I knew, objectively, that I hadn't been emotionally mature enough to, that I'd had my limitations as a person, my regrets about how I'd acted. But that logic didn't do anything to combat my other regrets about the fact that I hadn't been there. Well, wish fucking granted, Victoria. It wasn't Brockton Bay, but it felt a damn lot like I was picking up where I'd left off if I hadn't been hit by that acid, taken out of action. Dealing with villains who carry scary-as-fuck tinker stuff going on. Unreasonable, unreasonably violent, inscrutable. The eggs. Tricks and ploys that came from a place that just didn't seem like they were human places because they were so divorced from compassion or rationality. A plague that turned friends into strangers, the doll town surgeries. I clenched the hand warmer in my grip as I dropped out of the sky, landing amid the others, my good foot down, the knee of the leg with the injured foot bent. My hair slapped down at my back. We had a small army of our own, I reminded myself. Byron, Sveta, Ashley, Brandish, Flashbang, Rachel, Chastity, Foyle, the Harbingers, and Moose. He made an egg, I said. Good for fucking him, Rachel said. What the hell does that mean? A shelter. A bubble made of parts he took from people, attached together or suspended in place. It looks like he's inside, or he chopped himself up and he's part of it. That's insane, Moose said. It's... yes. That's what Paris meant? Foyle asked. We'd want to shoot because he's in there, but we can't? I nodded. They're organized in the old Russian style from back in Earth Bet. Squads of soldiers with parahumans in charge, even down to the armbands and badges. It makes the squads extensions of the parahumans, force multipliers because they know they're parahuman and they work with them. It's not the worst idea, 
Swan Song said. If you find people you can trust. Or forcefully conscript into military service and force into a given squad, my dad said. That too. I'd have to take over a world first. Probably better to settle on finding people I can trust. I think I can do that now. I gave Swan Song a warning look. Stop needling your sister. She simply smirked at me. We don't know how long they've been working together like this, Byron said. They might not have the level of trust you're thinking of. Some are IDs I recognize, I said. Eye thief, mukade, barf bat. So you're probably right, Cap. I knew a cape once who was from there, my dad said. Joined the New York Protectorate. From Russia? my mom asked. Yes, Bunter. Your drinking buddy. He was cute. What's the relevance of this? Damsel asked, hostile. We talked about what it was like over there, my dad said. Maybe it applies? I rubbed the hand warmer between my hands as I thought. Capes over there tended to break down into the ones who were conscripted, the ones who became fugitives of the state, the weird middle ground ones. Almost always spies or state-supported capes, my dad said, according to Bunter. I nodded. And the villains who were fugitives of the state who managed to establish themselves. The whole dynamic was very anti-parahuman, setting up capes so they rarely cooperated. Each squad was primarily expected to deal with capes, whether they were homegrown or not. They're set up to deal with us, I said. Did it work? Moose asked. The setup? Yeah, for the specialized task. When they got hit by endbringers, they turned on the people who came to help, though. For later attacks, they didn't have the help. They ended up trying to use airplanes, tanks, but were digressing. A digression that was at least helping me to get into a better headspace. Bunter was a squad leader, my dad said. There was a drawback to that setup. The squads end up subservient, power imbalance. Every cape has their quirks, preferences, eccentricities. Some of us are the sad kind of insane, Chastity said. That, yes, my dad said. When you surround yourself with people who don't balance you out, you can spiral. The neuroses get worse, the bad habits get more problematic, negative personality traits are magnified. Which is fine if we're dealing with them one-on-one, -on -one, but this is a lot of people, Byron pointed out. I counted ten squads of ten soldiers and one cape each, all inside, I said. Three more patrolling around the outside, one last group on the roof. Looks like they rotate. It's a lot. Even if you remove all soldiers from consideration. How? Ashley asked. How did they afford it or arrange it? I asked. Yes. I don't know. It'd be nice to ask Precipice if he knows particulars. He was researching his cluster before all this started, and he took notes, Byron said. From the time of their trigger, Love Lost and Snag moved into doing cape work for hire. They have good reputations, Moose said. They do the work, they're smart. They follow any extra orders, and they adapt to changes in plans. Cradle was networking with Tinkers. He developed some of his first devices to work with other Tinkers before he developed for himself. Made special armpit-length gloves that were really easy to plug your own tech into. That sort of thing. Not many Tinkers do that, and a lot of them want it. Especially in a time like this, post-apocalypse, Foyle said. Yeah. Moose said, smiling. No workshop, no stuff. They want to get caught up, get notes, get prep. The movement of a beam of light in our vicinity cut off all conversation. We were far enough back. The light was a halogen bulb being turned on the field, aimed at one squad. By mutual, unspoken agreement, we didn't resume the discussion. Sveta's keeping an eye out. We discussed how to crack this, but... It's a lot. The army we could deal with, but not while everything's set up like it is in there. We could deal with the setup, but not without dealing with the army first. Traps.
Rachel said. Don't forget the traps. Yes, I said. I fielded some questions about the size of the orb, the composition, the mech that was set up beneath it. My dad had questions about the soldiers. The men wore enough winter clothing and the windows had been frosted toward the bottom, so I hadn't had enough of a look to report on their background, but I was guessing it was mixed enough. The costumes of the squad leaders? Masks over balaclavas and lots of modifications to their winter clothes, like added body armor, chains wrapped around one part or another. One guy wore a full hazmat outfit with a squad of people in gas masks. Or there were the ones who wore a mask with jackets and pants in particular colors of camouflage. Was it possible that some weren't flaunting that they were capes? Yes, of course, but by my estimation, seven out of ten of the groups inside had seemed to be sticking to their own. The other three groups had seemed to be interacting on a minimal level, but each with a cape as their nucleus. I hadn't seen a group without a leader. Sometimes people switch costumes, Rachel said. She had her arms folded and leaned back hard into the side of her wolf. Take the guy you like least and make him wear the costume instead. He'll draw the attention. You wouldn't actually do that, would you? Chastity asked. Nah, I'd tell them to get lost a long time before that. But these guys are dicks. We're talking about this like we're going to pick a fight, I thought. It's inevitable? We go up against more than a hundred people with equipment and some degree of training, and a number of capes matching our own? I didn't want to. I didn't want the risk. I didn't want the casualties. The others talked while I ruminated. I'd said what I had to say. Mukade was bandsaw? Moose asked, but had to change his name? Twice, apparently, Damsel said. I saw him at one of the villain hangouts early on. He had the centipede thing. My mom ventured, Do you know anything about him? Contact or... Damsel ignored her. Not our wavelength, Swansong explained, filling in Damsel's silence. Refugee turned villain. First thing I ever saw or heard of him was that he was wondering which group was best set up. No take on theme or fit, class, goals. He wanted safety and security, Moose said. Fits what I know. I was put in mind of Crystal and how she'd joined the PRTCJ. He disappeared pretty early on, Moose finished. I figured he bit it, thought it was sad. He was young, Swansong said. I remember him putting three times too much sugar into his coffee. It made me think he was a teenager. He was, Moose said, is, but that's getting into uncomfortable territory. We can smash their faces in, break them, but we shouldn't hint too much at who's behind the mask. Fair, I said, bemused. You mentioned Barfbat. Yeah, I confirmed. Moose nodded, as if encouraged by that, or just by being able to contribute something. He's decent, strong, polite, gets the job done. He likes to hang and work with Chugalug. If he's here, I'd bet money Chug is too. What names? my mom said. Barfbat did mercenary work in another Earth, Harbinger One said. Really? Moose said. He pulled one hundred thousand dollars for one job, the Harbinger said, one weekend. Really? Shit on me. Did I miss a newsletter for high-paid villains and mercenaries or something? If you put yourself out there, people are paying, Harbinger Two said. I turned out the discussion. Some tidbits on those capes, but beyond that, I just needed to think. What works? What doesn't? I glanced at my mom. Take away what the villains want, and at worst, we score a draw. Except it wasn't that easy, and what they wanted was... what? Big picture, they wanted revenge and they wanted to secure themselves... They were working with mercenaries tied to the hyper-religious Earth Chite, and it looked very possible that Cradle and Love Lost were going to run off to that Earth or some other corner world after all of this was done. We'd stopped them from running. Okay. 
revenge? That was predicated on them getting rain. March was a third piece to the puzzle, but March wasn't here, and March was inscrutable. Hopefully, we would be able to achieve something with Cradle or Love Lost that would help us scroot, or at least give us the tools to apply leverage. I had a bad feeling that I knew what their long term was. I might not have connected to it if I hadn't seen Ashley and the Harbingers, or if thoughts of Bonesaw and some of the other sketchy bio-manipulators hadn't been so close to the surface of my thoughts with Sveta's issue. Put that aside, there was the issue of the short term. What did they want in the here and now? They were asleep, so nothing. I have an idea, I said. It wasn't necessarily an idea I felt good about, but I felt more confident because I had an idea, period. Conversation stopped. If we attack this, it's going to be too difficult, I said. I could see Rachel, Foyle, and Damsel weren't so keen on that. How could I use them? They factored in for the here and now. Hopefully that worked. Hopefully this worked. I wish I'd done more in the past to track who was even operating in the corner worlds. I'd collected info from Earth as it had been, preserving records, and I'd collected information about Earth as it was, following who was where, but I hadn't focused enough on the other Earths. I want to try disruption. I want to try you. I'll stress this is only if you're willing, because this is playing with fire. My finger pointed at chastity. Against a hundred people with guns. Tell me how and I'll do it. Chastity said. What's the logic? my mom asked. The logic is doing without the hundred people with guns. Byron, Chastity, are you okay riding a dog? Rachel, can you give them a ride? Can, Rachel said. Why me? Byron asked. I'm a step behind you here. Because you can tell her what Precipice said about the intruder into his dreamscape and what happened to them. Make sure she knows the stakes, that it's dangerous. There's not a super high chance this works, and if it doesn't, or if she's not down, I think there are two routes we can go down. For now, we either need to make this work, we need to get lucky at the, whatever it's called, Frontier... Frontier Row, Moose said. We need to get lucky there. Chastity said something in French. Jesus' prayer? J. Vase Pierre? I didn't have the grounding to know. Or we need to get out of Earth N, which means using the remote Precipice and Cassie have. We disrupt them at the foundations and... I want to start with their current setup. I want to leverage the most subtle powers we have. The first sign that something had gone wrong was that the villains of the row were gathered around the station. The second sign were the fires. Fuck. I flew down to signal to Rachel, Capricorn, and Chastity that they should circle around. I returned to the air well above the city and watched the patchwork canine take its new route, not so dissimilar from the route we'd already traveled. I landed in the midst of the crowd, a few feet from bluestocking. I was forced to dismiss the wretch on my descent. What the fuck? I asked. You had someone sneaking around, Bitterpill said. We had a vulnerable teammate and we were keeping them back and safe, I told her. You didn't tell us. Was this the dynamic? Was it bluestocking handling things when they wanted to handle the inter-team diplomacy in a half-decent way, running the show, while Bitter Pill was the designated stubborn asshole when they didn't care to play nice? We had more pressing concerns. We still do. Where is my teammate? He was out of action. He had someone with him, and they had a dog. They ran off, bluestocking said. I could read her body language, see that she was spoiling for an argument, worse than before. Was she that defensive? Did she have something to hide? Or was she upset about a potential spy because both were true, and she was doing something she really shouldn't? 
I really don't care what you're up to. I want my teammate, and I want to deal with the monsters. Then go find 'em. If you ask, we can't tell you much of anything. I shook my head a little, then took to the air. Antares, came the call from below me. It was blue stocking. What? Paris brought contender back. And, I asked, a little tense. He needs medical attention, badly. You took his eyes, his eyes, almost gentler than I'd expected, but it sat oddly. There were other avenues of attack or wounds that left some quality of life, but the eyes, that affected every moment of every day from here on out. Was that worse than death to a harbinger? They were going to tell Cradle's group we were coming. We wanted to slow them down. You locked us in, Blue Stocking asked, asking to confirm what she already knew. Locked them in. You associated with them. You deal with the inconvenience they bring home. We'll be done soon. Bitter Pill said, "We can't extract the wirework from the mess that is his eyes and the bridge of his nose, not without damaging it more. He's going to bleed out or suffer permanent damage if you take too long." If we take too long, it's because of their people, not ours. Don't test our patience, Blue Stocking said, which was my cue to go. Rachel was already running ahead; she'd taken the long route, and instead of coming to the station, she'd just run on ahead. She was running through low brush and over frozen, fairly barren landscape that was dotted with the rare fire, one burning tree low to the ground. One mess of detritus where a tree had fallen down in multiple pieces and decayed. Etna flying, and not flying that well. It clearly wasn't a strength of hers. She created molten orbs in her hands and tossed them in the general direction of the fleeing dog and its two passengers. Two options. I was confident in my ability to go toe to toe with her. I'd trained against the legend-type flying blasters through my teenage years, and I'd sparred with Crystal. Flyers came in all types, and Etna looked like a strong contrast to Colt, where Colt changed direction on the fly and went from zero to fifty in a second. Colt hadn't been that fast. Etna was slow to pick up speed and maneuverable with that velocity, but I could see how Cassie was leading the dog in different directions. And Etna wasn't doing so hot with that. When she turned, she maintained speed, but her accuracy and reaction times seemed to go out the window. In a straightaway, it looked like she could build up speed, and I was guessing her top speed was good. She was steaming as she flew, and her orbs were growing faster. She's a bomber, more than she's artillery or an aerial combatant. Mark a target, get up to speed. Drop or hurl a slew of molten glass orbs at them with each pass. I was fairly sure, just by seeing her fly, that she had a bit of the same issue Crystal did. Middle ear wasn't adapted to flying, so the sharp turns and anything else gave her one hell of the roller coaster feeling, if it didn't make her nauseous or threaten to make her black out. Option two, though, was to catch up to her when the constant turns had fucked with her the most. Tackle her, and use my flight and her disorientation to flip us both about ten times in three seconds, before arresting our movement and firmly depositing her in the nearest hillside. The crash landing on her part was more because of her disorientation than any exaggerated force on my end. She bounced. It wasn't a huge bounce, but her flight was still on as she rebounded off the hillside, and that made her buoyant. I didn't have time for these games. I watched a moment to make sure she was more or less fine. Then I flew away. Just far too many occasions where she'd gotten in our way, where she'd ended up on the team with the shittiest, most frustrating people, where she'd been reckless. Now she was out attacking people without getting answers. I was just done. If I discounted one because she'd helped with the fallen attack. Then this was her second strike, as far as I was concerned. 
I'd revise or amend my position if I could figure out if Bluestocking had sent her, or if this was a reckless, proving-herself thing. I had no idea why I found it quite as irritating as I did. Chalk it up to diminished defenses. Rachel whistled. She was catching up to Cassie, and the whistle was a cue to regroup, wolf and hound running side by side with a smaller mutant dog lagging behind. Yips was moving in straight lines, while the others traced routes that were more like S-curves, which let him catch up. But those S-curves were for a reason, and Yips was running through every barely iced-over creek and through every puddle, and a part of his shoulder was on fire because he'd blindly charged through a burning bush or tree. Capricorn, I called out. Fire! Capricorn twisted around, saw, and created blue lights. Yips yelped as the blue lights became a splash of cold water. Stop, I called out. I kept an eye on the spot where Etna had been deposited as the wolf and hound slowed, then came to a halt. They came after me, Cassie said. It's fine, Rachel said. The... The straggler crashed into the two dogs, nearly unseating everyone. Yips, you numbnuts, Cassie shouted. Gentle, settle, Rachel ordered. Yips, tail wagging, head lolling this way and that, did obey and dropped down to lie down on the ground. All the way, Rachel ordered. The mutant Yips flopped over onto his side, four legs sticking out to one side, tail slapping the ground. Did something happen? Cassie asked. We wanted to try something, Byron said. We need the remote, I think, or we're doing something weird with Precipice's situation. The weird thing with Precipice first, I said. I walked over to Rain, and I pulled off my glove so I could hold fingers to his pulse. If everyone's willing. The pulse was slow enough that I wouldn't have imagined he'd been riding on that dog while it had been moving the way it had. Chastity hadn't responded. If you're up for it, Chastity... I want you to knock Precipice out. What? Chastity asked, frowning. Turning him off and turning him on again, Byron said, as it dawned on him. If he didn't have that girl he was into, I'd be happy to turn him on any day, Chastity said. Her friend pushed her shoulder. More serious, Chastity said, Screwing with this situation he's got going on hurts someone else. Capricorn told me while we rode. Yeah. There's a chance it hurts him? Chastity asked. I have no idea, I said. There's a chance it wakes them all up, and that's all that happens. And if that happens, we don't have to wait until dawn to adapt and go after them. There's a chance it wakes him up and only him, in which case we can use his input. There's a really, really good chance he stays knocked out, and he wakes up with a sore cheek. And there's a chance that by waking him up, what happened to that other person happens to him, Chastity said. That was actually going into the dream, Byron told her. The person got chewed going in. Do we chew him up pulling him out? she asked. What I know is that he's been looking for ways out of the dream for a while now, Byron said, quiet. I know it's eating him alive and he's talked about options since that thing happened with the intruder Cradle brought in. He wants this, huh? I asked. Byron shrugged. Think so. Chastity nodded, then more forcefully, like she was trying to amp herself up or get herself to the point of agreeing. If you don't want to, we have other options, I said. I told him I'd help him. With his love life, I'll help him. Chastity said, definitively now, and not just to impress the guy in armor with the nice voice. You're incorrigible, I told her, as Byron acted momentarily flustered. Just who I am, she said, smiling a little. Chastity began pulling off the wicked jewelry she had on her right hand. Studded rings and rings with ornate designs. She handed it to Cassie, then shifted position sitting so her front was to Cassie's back, rain lying across Cassie's lap. I saw her take a deep breath. 
move the mask? she asked. Just a bit. Let him have his privacy. Cassie did, sliding it aside to show only a bit of eye, nose, and mouth, cheek exposed. The slap wasn't even that hard. When Chastity pulled her hand back, a pinky fingernail was illuminated. I checked his pulse. Was it faster now? Okay, I said. That's something of a good sign. Chastity worked for a second to get secure behind her friend. Got me, hun? Yes, absolutely, mon. We'll work on that, Chastity said, leaning forward to kiss Cassie on the cheek before slapping her own cheek with the backs of her fingers. She swayed, and Cassie caught her as she went limp, and then Rain stirred, with Cassie trying to catch him, too. I took over the duties there. Rain groaned. It wasn't a fast wake-up. Got you, I told him. Pass him here, Byron said. Bigger mount, if that's okay. Rachel grunted in the affirmative. You're close, I noted, as I finished the handoff of Rain to Byron, then helped secure the blankets around Chastity. Yeah, Cassie said. Snuggle buddies. You're... I motioned between the two girls. Buddies, only buddies. We'd be best friends if we weren't so far away. But when we get together, we can nap on the same couch, and it's like the best nap ever. Or we stay up all night bundled up in blankets, trading off between watching her awful shows and watching my stuff while she insults the characters. I never thought I'd have someone like her. Rain was slowly coming too. He groaned like he was in pain, but as I floated in to check, he recognized me and waved me off. I had someone like that, a girlfriend. We could talk all night. My ex-girlfriend now, Byron said. We're not girlfriends, though, Cassie said, hurrying to protest. I like boys, and she really likes boys. I really want to clarify because I don't want me being horrible with words to take any chances she has with... Stop, Rachel said. You're rambling, and you get mad at yourself when you get carried away. Stopping, Cassie said. Rain worked his way to a sitting position. The silence hung heavy. Good? Byron asked. I'm goddamn sore, and even more tired than I'm sore. It's dark out? What the hell day is it? Same day. We woke you up early, Byron said. Once you're fit to ride, we'll see if we woke up the others, or screwed with them. Okay, Rain said. Water? I've got broth for nutrients and shit, Rachel said. My suggestion, Cassie said, happy. I've put my lips on the rim. I don't know if you're a pussy about that sort of thing. You can't say that, Cassie said. Pussy. Rachel sighed, heavy. When I say pussy, I mean the lame as shit, wimpy ass, useless for anything, joyless, dead behind the eyes cat, okay? Good, Cassie said. There's probably backwash in here, too, Rachel said. People are pussies about that, too. I'll wait, Rain said. My parents pack everything, I told him. They'll have water. We going? Rachel asked. Go, I said. Yips, up! Get going! As soon as Yips was off the ground, the three dogs were running. I flew alongside, leaning on the wretch. My hands were cold. Again I felt the aches and pains. Depending on what follows, we might go back, see if we can find any capes who aren't tied up with other things, I said. What else were you thinking? Byron asked. Power copiers to copy Precipice and get his emotion power, or see if there's a heartbroken or someone else with a power that's subtle enough. Amias, Cassie said. He's young, though. I winced. I don't think we know any power copiers who work that flexibly, Byron said. Any power that was subtle enough would work, I said. If they want to stay locked up, then let's make the conditions as unpleasant as possible and see if they crack. Ah, Byron said. They're locked up? Essentially, I said. My power helps, Rain said. You want to help them? 
The way I see it, it helps when you're doing something, makes your mistakes more pointed, so you learn from them. But if you're doing nothing at all, then... Regret, Rain said. Doubt. Self-loathing. I thought about what I want to do, and I want them to hurt. I want them to feel and recognize what they've done here. I want them to feel a thousand times the pain they've inflicted on others. And I don't know if that's possible, but maybe your power gets them there. They might be asleep. Emotion affects a crew, I think. There's a physiological and mental component. We just let that accumulate. A little trickle for a long time. About that, Rain said. What? I'm maxed out. I didn't get my power or any tokens. Pretty sure I'm... The silver blade he created was just that, a blade, a foot and a half long. He made a throwing motion and it dissipated. That's maxed out? Cassie asked. My emotion power, it's turned up. Nothing else? Byron asked. Zero on the tinker power, zero on the mover. Why? I asked. I have no fucking idea. But if you want to boil them inside whatever room they're holed up in, I think I can do that. Rain was on his feet again, a bottle of water in hand, talking to Moose, as Moose outlined some of the faces inside the building. Foyle had slipped in between the patrols and used spikes to scale the wall, and she'd taken photos while at the window. At the factory-like building, the windows were up near the tall ceiling and the roof. I heard the names Moose rattled off, mostly new ones for me, and I heard Moose talking about which ones were more compassionate, which were assholes, the ones who had killed. Chastity had roused, looking a bit worse for wear, but, at the very least, not unconscious. She was with Rachel, but most of her focus was on the Harbingers. Incorrigible. I turned to look. It was Cassie. You called my friend incorrigible. I'm sorry. I was trying to play along. Byron hadn't mentioned the ex he was talking about was the same girl that's chopped up in that factory. I kind of wanted to distract her. Oh. Oh, no. It's okay. I'm sorry I wasn't as deft as I could have been. Tired. It's okay. It's true that she's incorrigible, but it's hard, you know? I want her to be happy, but she doesn't want to be someone who goes out with someone and lies from the start. I think something bad happened once, while she still lived with her dad, when she went to school under an alias and had a boy who liked her. I think he ended up meeting her dad. I nodded, swallowing hard. I wondered if I heard a name, if I could dig in files and find a case report. Cassie continued. And if she's honest about where she comes from, most guys, most good guys, they run screaming. So she plays the odds, I think. Any time she's with a guy who might work, she takes her shots. A lot of the time, those guys aren't great people, you know? I got kind of hopeful, seeing her around the good guys this time around, and not the guy who pops pills or the 14-year-old who kills people. That's why I acted weird and ranty. It's fine, really, truly. It came from a good place, no judgment. Her dad used to throw away women when they were twenty-two or twenty-five or around that age. I think she kind of feels like she has a time limit, and after that no guy's going to want her around. Fuck, I said. And I can show her Charlotte and Forrest or Nancy and Theo and point to them, and I tell her they're happy together, but she doesn't really see it and I don't think she even totally gets why she feels like she has the time limit. She can know it's logical and feel a complete other way. I'm running into that an awful lot, I said, the feelings and rationale being in completely different places. She's lucky to have a friend like you, you know? Snuggle buddy, best friend. Shitty thing about Nancy and Theo, you know? I was all, rah, rah, look, they're so cute together, they're so happy. Role models, woo. Then they broke up. I actually think it messed her up a little. 
She was at the farm when it happened, and the next day she went back to New Brockton with barely a goodbye. We never even talked to them. We ate at the same table sometimes, but... Yeah, I see what you mean. Kind of connects. Yeah. You want good things for your best friend. I want good things for a lot of the people here. I thought... I probably shouldn't even be telling you this. Rachel doesn't care. She says to be open. But it's Chastity's whole deal I'm talking about, and now I feel like I'm betraying her by talking to a near stranger about it. I won't say a word, I said. Thank you. I can't really talk to Rachel about stuff like this. She's great. She's the very best. But not for talking. Tattletail used to be someone we could go to, but she got worn out, and it became a not-this-week thing, and then a not-this-month thing. I was going to ask Imp for help, but she's hurt now, and she's not here. Help? I asked. I don't know. You're pretty, and you're confident, and Chastity seems to like you. If you ever... feels dumb to say out loud, but if you ever met someone who might like her, and who's strong enough or caring enough, and who's, um, perfect? Because my best friend doesn't deserve anything less than perfect. I could hear something in her tone of voice in that last sentence, serious and almost dangerous or gruff, that told me this girl had spent a lot of time with the very serious, very dangerous, and very gruff Rachel Lint. I nodded. Don't nod and get my hopes up if you won't try, Cassie told me. My best friend needs help too, I said. She needs a body. I'll keep an eye out for your friend if you keep an eye out for mine. Cassie nudged me. When I looked, she had a hand out. I shook it. What's this dealings about? Chastity asked. She'd left the harbingers behind. I should go see to the mission, I said, stepping away from Cassie. Careful going out, Chastity said. They sent a patrol down the road, and they had lights up at the windows during one route they took. Group back here had to scram, and Foyle almost got caught. Thank you, I said. I put a hand on her shoulder as I passed her. And thank you for waking up Precipice, taking the risk. No prob. Others were glancing my way. Briefings petered off. They were close to ready. What do you think? Byron asked. I think we should get set up, I said. I'm thinking it's me, Precipice... Mom, are you okay being in ball form? If we hand you off to Sveta, we can have you for the pineapple. Bowling seven tens, my dad said. An old in-joke. We'd never been able to agree on what to call the maneuver. My mom smiled a little. That's a good idea. If things go poorly? I nodded. Okay, I can be patient. I'll go too, Foyle said. I can avoid the patrols. I can deal with problems. Good, I said. Everyone else, be ready. If there's a bit of trouble, judgment call. Either make a bit of noise for a distraction and scram, or Capricorn seals it off once a few people are out the door. We can always get ourselves in later. Or I act like a representative from the row, Moose said. A quieter distraction. Perfect, I said. Thank you. If there's a lot of trouble... Ashley asked. I looked at her, at Damsel, at my dad, at Moose, the Harbingers. Knock the building down, I said. Take out the ones who escape. Then we shift gears. Get the people and the parts out. That got me some sober nods. A smile from Damsel. I couldn't see smiling at that end result, but I suppose she needed to grandstand or act. Ready? I asked Rain. A nod. I put my shoulder at his armpit, my arm at his waist. He put his arm around my shoulders, and we tested lifting off. Good enough. My mom went ball form, and she was wrapped in a dog blanket to mute the glow. I put her under my other arm. We went high first, because people didn't usually look a quarter mile up in the air for intruders. We dropped down. Eyes peeled for soldiers with and without flashlights. Chuggalug was out with his squad, jellyfish mode, floating, 
but he was taking a route that ranged further afield. Your heart's pounding, I told Precipice. I could feel it through his chest. It was too fast a drop? He shook his head. Must be involuntary reaction to being so high up. He was breathing harder, too, but I didn't get the impression he was being cute or coy. He seemed surprised. Not a boy-girl thing, mercifully. A long night, really. All of us were on edge. We lowered down to the side of the roof with Sveta. I motioned for rain to hang back. I handed over the cloth-wrapped ball, only glimmers peeking through. Tendrils wrapped around it, binding the cloth even tighter to the orb. I explained what was up, what had happened, and what the strategy was. Perfect, Sveta said. I wasn't sure it was, but it was the best we'd been able to come up with. Foyle was making her way across the darkest parts of the fields between our group and the building. I could see her because I knew where to look. I was nervous, but I had to trust. She was one of the good ones. Rain and I, meanwhile, dropped to the edge of the roof. The window was recessed enough to set a foot down, and Foyle had left some pieces of rebar jutting out of the wall. Footholds. We could look in through the window. We could see the soldiers. Rain laid his hands against the glass. His breath, even with the mask in the way, was hard enough to leak around the edges and fog against the glass. I motioned for him to back off and keep that to a minimum. Low strength, I whispered. At least when targeting the soldiers. Keep it subtle. The goddamn irony, Rain said under his breath. Full strength if you can keep it to the contents of the egg and the mech. Let's make sure we target Cradle if he's trying to be clever and hide inside that. Yeah, Rain said. He began using his power. You want to make yourself an egg, Cradle? Let's see if we can hard-boil it. Keep the shell intact and cook what's inside. Arc 12, Heavens, Chapter 6 Focus on the inside of the bubble, I murmured. It had been almost ten minutes since I'd felt the need to stress it and felt reasonably confident we could whisper without being overheard. Not the bubble itself. I can feel them, Rain responded. I nodded, holding my finger to my lips. It was hard to converse, because a patrol walked a route around the rooftop. The group that had been out prior had liked holding the high ground. There was a box-shaped section on the roof that was higher than the rest, encompassing the top of the stairs and the door that led from the building interior to the roof itself. The old group had liked to camp out up there for the view it gave of the surrounding fields and the road that our team was on. The new squad was more prone to walking the perimeter of the roof. The tension of it had me feeling nauseous, because some of them liked to shine their flashlights down. I had to maintain a state of combat readiness. Anticipating the next person, then making a mental note of any habits or things to look out for. By the time I was done with that, the next person was on the approach. The squad that was up on the roof now had ten people, but only seven walked the rooftop. Two more smoked up a storm, and a third fiddled with a boombox or something, the volume barely audible. When they had everything balanced right, it played a sports match, which didn't seem to make a lot of sense given where we were, or when the teams were listed as Brazil or South Africa. A recording of a game from years ago, possibly. I halfways suspected the interest was in fixing the machine and the recorded match was just to be a constant source of sound that told them if it was working or not. From the snippets of conversation I caught, one of the smokers was the squad leader, the other his friend. The guy who fiddled with the machine had been injured in a combat a while back, so he didn't patrol. Much of the conversation came from two soldiers who walked as a pair. 
constant complaining. Eins and zwei, as I thought of them. Their chatter was usually a good advance warning. Then there was Dry, a woman who smoked, who scared the shit out of me every time she shone her flashlight around. The smoke and the light of the constant beam flicking around the corner of the building and onto the ground at the base were the closest things I had to a warning to get Rain and I down and into position by the base of the wall where empty cans of fuel for the generator were stacked. Sometimes the wind didn't let me smell the cigarette, or she wasn't smoking, I couldn't be sure which. Sometimes she didn't aim the flashlight down until she was at our section of the roof. Usually one of the two things was true. Still spooky, because the flashlight was mounted on her gun, and there would be a mere instant between the second we were illuminated and when she pulled the trigger. Would I manage? Maybe. Would rain? Probably not. Four and five, I had racked my brain for Chinese numerals to change it up and serve as a mnemonic, then settled on the English ones instead. They were a pair who were mostly engaged in a back and forth. The English speaker was an ex-gang member, based on the things he'd said, and half the time he'd be rattling off words in one language while his Chinese buddy answered in another, or vice versa. Sax was a guy who had urinated off the edge of the roof twice in the last twenty minutes. His heavy footfalls were tell enough that he was coming, but sounds were unreliable, because the radio static or louder voices of others would drown things out. He was also most likely to change up the schedule or approach from another direction. Sieben was the one to watch out for. Alone, so nobody to chat with. Not even a whiff of cigarette smoke or alcohol. She, I'd had enough of a glimpse of her to know she was an apparent she, tall, skinny, black, with only nose, eyes, and precariously high cheekbones visible behind her scarf and hat, a gas mask pulled off and set aside, was prone to walk on the lip of the roof rather than on the actual shingle-like pads. She didn't make a sound as a consequence, and she didn't give her location away with a flashlight like Dry did. We'd been on our way back from hiding from Dry's flashlight when I'd first seen Sieben crouched at the edge of the roof looking down. If she'd been there three or four paces further down the roof, she would have seen us. No exact patrol order. I could only feel out the gaps in between appearances and imagine that Sieben was filling in those gaps, I could pay attention to the details and try to visualize the routes they preferred. Air B. Double vagina. Sha B. Stupid vagina. Tama De. Yo mama? Close. Four and five weren't even that close to the roof's edge as they passed by. I allowed myself to relax. If I could have heard the intonations or accents on certain sounds, I would have been getting an education. Distance played with it, and I didn't have the ear for it. I leaned back. The heat that radiated away from us was affecting the frost on the window. The effect was small, but I worried what would be apparent if people inside or outside noticed a pair of blotches on the glass that were shaped like a pair of heads and shoulders, where we were close to the glass. I tugged on Rain's arm, having him shift his weight over to me, and we adjusted our location. A little closer to our hiding spot by the cans. Further from the spot where the three who weren't patrolling were, so the intermittent buzz and blare of the radio wouldn't put my nerves on edge or obscure other sounds. Can you see what you need to see? I asked, my voice a whisper. Rain nodded. The space under his hood was dark. He'd turned off the illuminated lines on his mask. He motioned, a tiny and mostly broken mechanical hand indicating from his mouth to the roof. I nodded. Ninety-five percent, I whispered. Keep it to essentials. What I was saying before, he whispered. I can feel who's inside, I think. I push out and I feel the resistance. Let's me see silhouettes. Tattletail is in the bubble along with three people. I felt my heart sink. The moment he'd said he could feel who was inside, 
I'd kind of hoped Cradle was inside the mech itself. If he was, there was a chance we could get him. Take him away, then do what we'd done to Rain, using Chastity's power. I have to be careful with the soldiers, Rain whispered. He pointed at the glass. They get restless when I hit them, and when they get restless, they head out toward the door. Then I have to hit them harder. It makes them rethink it. Any effect? Some. Have to find the right people. I heard a scuff. Immediately, my hand went to Rain's face, sliding between mask and mouth. I heard more noise, and in the next instant was dropping out of the air, Rain's sudden, silent exhalation filtering through my fingers as we went from stationary to a twenty-foot drop. I pushed him into the corner between cans and a part of the wall that jutted out. Dry. Flashlight not aimed down or at any angle I could see. No cigarette. The gun moved, light shining down around us. It stopped a short distance away. It moved to the cans a few feet from us. She moved on. That, Rain started. My hand went back to his mouth. After the blinding, focused light, it was hard to make out details. Seben walked at the roof's edge, a matter of ten feet behind Dry. She had company. A figure loomed tall enough that it was five feet taller than Seben. A human shape topped it, and about ten feet of tail followed after, lumpy and faintly sour-smelling, like rancid garbage. The height was simply the parahuman raising themselves up. I could see the shape of him move as he dropped down, almost falling. His upper body traced the wall as he flowed down at a diagonal, a caterpillar body of trash bags and cardboard boxes following after him. He gathered the body under them, all coiled up, reshuffled, then launched off the wall. His upper body stuck out at the top, while legs and hips were lost in an amorphous blob of detritus. The bags and boxes contained gas, and hoses trailed beneath, each hose producing puffs of that same gas. He took a course that put him some distance from the building and his squad. Chugalug, Trash Changer He gathered garbage and sewage as a body he could configure into a few different forms. That trash was slowly consumed and turned into a material that would be, as required, solid, gas, or liquid, typically in quantities far greater than what was reasonable for what he'd absorbed. His namesake technique was from how he gathered raw sewage to fill out his body. Moose had covered that. Guy didn't really associate with his squad, or his squad didn't want to associate with him. I withdrew my hand from Precipice's face. He made a face as he inhaled. It smelled bad like shit that had been eaten, puked out, eaten again, and laced with sour garbage smells and other general human smells. There was something perfumey in it, too, like air freshener or a shampoo, but cloying, seemingly designed to trick the nose and taste buds into thinking that there was no need to shut down or ignore things anymore, just so they could involuntarily open up to the greater odor. A trace of something minty or fruity followed by a punch of a smell like old man diaper soaked in month-old tuna water. And we weren't even close to the source. He had passed thirty feet over us in a form that apparently wasn't about the gas or the stench, and that was it. A lot of activity, Rain managed, his own hand over his lower face now. Last patrol before shift change. We stay here. He nodded. Next part is going to be hard, adapting to new schedules and patterns. It's worth it? I think so, Rain said. He ran his hand between hood and head over his shorn head. I'm getting love lost in cradle at least. I feel it hitting home when I push to full strength. I feel it if I touch tattlesail by mistake. I don't feel it with others. Tristan, kind of, I, I think it's Tristan, except they only took his midsection. Emotions are rooted in all kinds of places, I said. I thought of how many times I'd felt bad feelings start in my gut or end up there. 
Rain clenched his fists, tiny mechanical hand squeaking. Damn it! I'm going to lose track of people moving away like this. There aren't a lot who don't react, but some do. I try to find them, gradually increase the pressure. I did say to go easy on the soldiers. I don't have the patience to go that easy, he said. If we get caught, we're going to have to fight, or you're going to have to fight. If I haven't gotten anything done by then, then this is all for nothing. Let me worry about us getting caught. You focus on what's indoors. Be patient. Turning the screws is getting to some people. One keeps talking to their superior, pointing at the orb. They might up and leave. Okay, but I know emotion powers. People react in different ways. This isn't us hitting one billiard ball with another and calculating the trajectory. They're people. Every person is built differently. There's a guy who sits apart from the rest of his squad, brought a hunk of wood with him. The lumberjack, I saw him. Whittles this round of wood with branches sticking out. Gets more agitated the more I work on him. Like you said, different reactions to the same things. Go easy, I murmured. Imagine if he got pissed off enough to pick a fight, Rain said. There are people who are ready to leave. What happens if they do? I whispered back. They leave, they run into our guys. The door opened upstairs. We fell silent by mutual understanding. I heard Five say something in Chinese. He got a response from someone else, more fluent than Four. Our guys can handle it. I shushed him. I wished I didn't have to. There was more mingled conversation. There hadn't been many squads that were outright mingling like this. I had a bad feeling. The squad on the roof right now was Chuggalugs. They'd gone on a patrol of the general area a while ago, spent a shift inside, then went to the roof. I had to imagine it was because Chug stank and people didn't want him indoors. Chuggalugs' friend was... I saw Barfbat take flight. Tumor-ridden wings and a head with pustules and fluid-filled sacks wringing his neck. They had to insulate him because it was chilly and they made for a lot of exposed skin. He flew straight in the direction of Chugalug. Because they were friends. Fuck. A solid minute passed as Rain and I remained silent, crammed into a corner with metal barrels around us. Chugalug's squad wasn't leaving. They were staying where they were, and Barfbat's squad was joining them. Complicating factors that made the pain-in-the-ass people into even bigger issues. Schedules in disarray. Moose, Rain started, barely audible. I tensed at his voice, looking up. I motioned for him to continue. Moose said Barfbat has enhanced hearing and smell. I nodded. I was aware. What do we do? You stay. I'm putting foil and sveta on it. I think this is the final leg of the journey. We won't have long to do our thing. Fuck. Shh, it's fine. Try to focus on the rooftop. Stay quiet and still. I've been keeping my head down for all my life. Why stop now? Rain asked. I wasn't sure how to answer that, so I nodded. Foil first. I made my way around the building and saw light from above. Dry and her flashlight again. She walked with the end of the gun resting against the lip of the roof, the flashlight beam extending down, but not flush to the wall. She had company now, going by the murmurs I heard. Two squads patrolling the fields and woods around us, twenty in total with two capes. Two squads above us, another twenty. Two capes who are flying around, due back any minute. I let the beam pass me by, then rounded the corner. Two guys sat on the roof's edge, feet dangling. Seban was with them, her back to the space below. Tense to pass so close by, to see a flick of white dart through my peripheral vision, a loogie, bit of spit, or a fleck of ice that had been knocked free of the roof. But they seemed to be looking out, not down. Foyle was up the wall, having used spikes to ascend. She spotted me and made her way down, 
stepping on inch-long protrusions. I approached her, and with secrecy in mind, we put personal space aside, our toes almost touching, my mouth by her ear. Barfbat and Chugalug, they can't come back. You sure? When they don't return, I'm sure. Be careful, Bat has enhanced hearing and smell. I'm short on darts. I winced. I drew the extra decorations from my costume out of my pocket and held it between us as I used a bit of strength to pull one free. I didn't want a telltale glint to give us away. Give me the entire thing. I can cut the rest off if you give me one. I didn't want to give her the entire thing. I liked my costume, and Weld had gone to some effort to make the decorations. But need won out. Others needed this. I pressed the decorations into her hand. She jogged off, keeping low to the ground, not running along the base of the building as I'd been doing, but a distance away, because that distance gave her the ability to see which way heads were turned and a better idea of where people were. I watched the soldiers above, nervous, but I didn't hear any cries of alarm. She made a break for it, quick and quiet, across a dark field dusted faintly with snow. We had a time limit. Sveta. I circled the building, floating instead of walking, and slowed as I heard whispering. I peered around the corner and heard the whispering stop. Something slapped my hip. A tendril. I approached, and I saw the general shape that was my mom. Wrapped in a dark blanket, the blanket held tight by tendrils. Sveta's face was tucked between ball and wall. Fight might start soon. They just sent out the guy with enhanced senses. I sent foil after him. If there's trouble, I'll pulse with my aura. There's a group... I drew a rough outline of the roof on the ground, then an X. Right there. Should I go over the Pineapple 710? I remember the Great Pineapple debate, Sveta said. No need. You're awesome, I said. Hit him, and if there's any gunfire after, feel free to do what you need to do. They hurt Tristan, Sveta murmured. Kenzie, Ashley. Yeah. I might have to throw them off the building. I just don't want to. I know. I don't want to hurt them either. We're gonna go check on Rain. I made my way back, wary of the periodic flashlight or people leaning over the edge of the roof. Mr. Sex was taking another leak. When I got to where I'd left Rain, I found him gone. I looked for him, and I found him halfway up the building. He'd scaled the darts Foyle had embedded in the wall, and he'd returned to his former spot. The hell? I flew to him, shooting him a furious look, because, for one thing, that was pretty precarious footing for anyone who wasn't Foyle, and a fall would have outed all of us. For another, what the hell was he thinking? He touched the window with his right hand and the tiny mechanical right hand, and I could see the strain in those extremities. He wasn't about to bust through the glass, but he was pressing hard. The lumberjack was shouting loudly enough that I could hear the lowest sounds through the window from the other side of the building. The lumberjack, as I'd termed the guy, was a burly guy with a big red beard, wearing the standard mercenary outfit, part of Red's squad, and Red was a woman I'd named as such because she had the same mercenary uniform on, but instead of black and gray camo, or just plain black, she had red and black and black with a metal mask. She had broad shoulders and broad hips, black hair in a lick of a ponytail I could have gripped in one hand. She was one to watch out for, but it was the little cues that made me think that. People paid attention to her, and she seemed to have at least three of the people other mercenaries were avoiding inside her orbit. The lumberjack, a scrawny guy who I hadn't seen without a knife in his hand, and another big guy that had gotten up to go to the bathroom ten minutes ago, with people actively getting out of his way. If she had the fear or respect of a bunch of guys who demanded fear and respect, that was worth paying attention to. She'd stood, 
and she held a gear in her hand. It flipped over and rolled across the back of her hand before she caught it. The thing probably weighed three pounds. It fell, after a purposeful movement, like she was aiming to bounce a ball. It plunged into the floor, and there was a splash of pistons, larger gears, sheet metal, and metal springs thicker than my leg, rising out of the concrete floor and sinking back in to leave the floor unblemished. A piston knocked a smaller, narrower gear into the air, which she caught. It served to get the attention of the others. Shouting and conversation had stopped. Rain pressed another hand to the window. People were getting restless now. They actively stood, shuffling feet, looking uncomfortable. There's time to roll this out slower, I whispered. Until Barfat and Chugalug's squads notice they haven't come back. You don't have to finish this in five seconds. Go easy. I am, Rain hissed, and I could hear the tension in his voice. There's only so long I can look at that ball they've made and not think about how people we care about are in there. Tristan backed me up when it counted. Kenzie! Shh! I saw him twist his head to one side, like he had to wrench himself away to avoid ranting. End of his rope? We all had our limits, but those limits depended heavily on what we were talking about. Rain, I had to imagine, had an intolerance for institutionalized evil, for the cult mentalities and gatherings of people who overlooked serious wrongs, like these soldiers and villains were doing. And this was after days of stress and months, a year, of seeing his cluster every night. What we'd done to force him out of the room was screwing with the way his power had been distributed. The lumberjack threw the piece of wood he had been whittling straight for Red. Red made a movement of her hand, and there was a small splash of gears and pistons, of cranks and pipes, some red-hot, barely larger across than a dinner plate. It was followed by another splash, hotter and larger, like a stone was being skipped, and a third, even larger, massive, with a piece of machinery taller than Red was lunging out of the ground. A mechanical claw seized the piece of wood, destroying it, before disappearing into the ground with another splash. People backed away from the droplets of molten metal that had been thrown out. Remember your power educates them, I said. I remember, Rain said. I disabled it just as he did the stupid thing. He'd been loud as he said it. Worrying we'd been heard, I was mindful of the group on the roof and flew up, leaving Rain where he was. None were close enough to hear him. They'd heard the commotion and headed to the door, where they now gathered. Still fifteen or so on the roof. The captains were at one spot where boxes had been set out for sitting on. I saw the player and guns set against walls in easy arm's reach. Nobody had abandoned their weapon. I watched and waited, trying to get a sense of them. As they started to turn back around, situation assessed... I dropped back down. Sveta was there, at the corner of the building. Her tendril reached out to its maximum range, slapping my shoulder. Scared the hell out of Rain, who almost lost his perch. I motioned for him to stay, then followed. Sveta was careful to pull back, to move away as I moved forward, keeping a healthy distance. Sieben, the woman who'd been the biggest pain, and dry, the woman with the flashlight and bad smoking habit. My mother stood over both, a blanket over her and them, shielding the glow of the blades she held to their throats. They saw us, Sveta murmured. There was a noise, and that one did a weird thing where she didn't look toward the noise. She focused down on us. She called the one with the flashlight. Power? I asked. Answer. Quiet. No, Sieben said. Good habits. I have bandages, belt, back pouch, my mom said. Use them for a gag. Left pouch for, for wrist ties, I guessed. Cuffs. I got the bandages and cuffs. Gags around the mouth. We set them back to back, wrists behind them and around the stomach of the other. 
If you make a commotion, we can reach you before they do, I said. No fumbling around, no shuffling, kicking, or banging. I'll watch them, Sveta said. Kill them if I have to. You, my mom said. She pointed at Sveta. I'm not impressed. What the hell? It's fine, Sveta said. What the hell? I whispered. It's fine. Go. Rain needs you. We'll do what we have to. They'll notice two if theirs are missing as soon as they do a head count. I looked between her and my mom, and I saw something weird and dark in my mom's expression, like she was bothered. She went ball form before I could study it any further, my cue to go back to rain. Before I was even there, I heard more of a commotion inside. I reached the window, supporting Rain's balance, and peered past the frost. The lumberjack had been mangled. Red stood over his body. The other two members of her group that I'd deemed scary, plus one more, had all risen to their feet, standing spread out. Nobody was stopping them, helping them, or intervening. I have to wonder, and this feels shitty and scary to articulate, Rain said the words through grit teeth, emotional. Shh, I urged him. Did he have zero volume control? That had almost been speaking level. The skinny guy with the knife pointed it at Red. The one guy I hadn't expected to be in that mix, because he'd been so quiet, said something. Red acted. A movement which immediately saw two members of the group drawing their weapons. Too late. The splashes occurred around them. Small splash, medium splash, giant drill spearing out of the ground, catching a guy in one butt cheek and shredding everything from there to cranium. One had backed out of the way of a tightly arranged set of metal rollers, but missed the piston that struck a roller and, accelerated, speared the ceiling. The piston splashed, and it became a hydraulic hammer, slamming from the high ceiling to the floor pulp. The last guy, the quiet guy, hadn't drawn a gun. He was thrust into the air by an uneven set of pistons, so he flipped head over heel. He landed on one shoulder and collapsed in a way that didn't let him fall flat. His feet were above him for two or so seconds before he twisted and flopped into a more or less relaxed position. The machinery around him receded. As it did, Metal machinery splashed up and out, with white-hot metal in the midst of it. About a half-full bathtub's worth of hot metal landed on or in the immediate vicinity of the third guy. He thrashed and screamed, his clothes igniting from the heat alone, while Red sat back down. She said something, and a lot of heads shook, in her squad in particular. Jesus Christ, Rain muttered. He'd been using a lot more religious swears since waking up. Yeah, I said. I was caught between saying, that's not on you, and I did fucking tell you to go easy. I left it at yeah. That bad feeling I had? I'm identifying the buttons to press. Not just in one person, but in a group. So the group acts like you want it to. Rain was barely audible like cult leaders do. It's different, I said, though I was a little spooked at how that had unfolded. It's like how they say bullies feel, Rain whispered. Powerful, big, better. Not better as in like I'm a better person, because I'm definitely not, but better like I've unloaded something I've been carrying for a long time. I feel all of those things, and I feel worse I feel sick. The danger, I think, isn't in feeling powerful, big, or venting, I whispered, my eyes locked on the scene. That's reality. Trust me, I've been there. We face off against shitty people, and it feels good to see them get what they deserve, whether they're racists, people who deal to kids, fanatics, or monsters. If we didn't feel satisfaction, then we wouldn't be able to do this. Rain grunted in the affirmative. Someone approached Red, indicating the man who was being put out with stomps and a shiny blanket thrown over him. Red waved them off, 
and they went to the burned man. Medical care, it looked like. What you watch out for is if it stops feeling shitty, or if you get used to it, I said. Rain's hand shook as he pulled it away from the glass. I feel pretty damn shitty, having played a part in three people dying and a fourth getting burned half to death, so we're good there, he murmured. We're good. His finger touched glass, then drew out a line, indicating someone specific, one of the younger mercenaries, the one who had spoken up a few times. But I'd feel worse if I didn't do anything, he said, hand moving from fingertip on glass to being flat against it. That's the way it goes, I whispered. The young mercenary raised his voice, and he was close enough I could hear. Are you going to off me if I try to leave? Red said something. Too far away, not loud enough. The young mercenary's squad leader said something as well. The guy was a cape called Mukade. His squad had a centipede motif stenciled on their body armor. I knew Mukade. Moose had known him too. The guy who had wanted a group or organization to stick to. With the word from their squad leader, the young cape strode toward the door. Rain moved his hand, and Mukade said something else. That you? I asked, a murmur. Puppeteering? Creepy to put it that way. Creepy's good, I murmured. I don't know what he said, Rain replied, matching my volume for once. I just thought if he was giving the Merc a pass to leave, wasn't that too goddamn easy? None of them should feel okay about this. Not puppeteering, nudging. If you don't let the ones who hate this go, we either have to... I fell silent as I heard heavy footsteps. I'd kind of hoped the people had headed downstairs to investigate. I'd really hoped that with people crowding to one end of the roof, they weren't noticing the absence of two of their members. Some of their people had gone downstairs, some were up, and discrepancies were easy to miss. But Sex, the pisser, the clomper, the one with the most unreliable and careless patrol route, was still patrolling the roof's edge. If we don't let the ones with consciences go, we either have to take them all out, or we let some of the worst ones slip through our fingers. Sex stood on the roof's edge. He looked down. I wasted no time in going up. Oh! He raised his voice, guttural. My hand hit his gun, pushing it to one side. My knee hit his chin. Others were reacting, and I used my aura. The range I measured out, so it caught those on the roof, and it caught rain. With luck, it caught Sveta. Multiple people with guns. The door was shut, and I had to stop them before they opened it and shouted the alarm. There was barely a need. Sveta was reacting. The ball came free of cloth, and it was hurled across the roof. Sveta's face appeared, and the same tendrils that had thrown the ball now caught three soldiers, snatching them from where they stood. The ball rolled. People scrambled to move. My dad and my adolescent self had maintained some very different opinions on what we called some maneuvers. The pineapple had been my terminology. I wasn't sure why I'd chosen that in retrospect especially considering I'd since learned that grenades could be termed pineapples in jargon, and my dad didn't have a role in this one. But I had, and I still maintained the opinion that Bowling 710 was a mouthful and an artifact of my dork of a dad really liking bowling. A name that didn't fit was better than a name that wasn't practical, as I argued it. People got out of the way of the ball. They didn't anticipate it becoming a woman, armed with two blades. As fast as the ball had been moving, she was utterly still, blades extended, to the seven and ten o'clock positions, as my dad would protest. Two people held hostage. Both were the squad leaders. Not captains, the capes were the captains, but squad leaders. Bowling for hostages. One leader moved his hand, motioning for others to put guns down. Everyone stood down. Silence reigned, but for shouting from the building below us. Foyle had returned, 
and had ascended to the rooftop in a flash. I hadn't even seen her making the approach. She held darts, my spikes, in one hand, all bunched together. I had to back off. I pinned them, but then a squad headed my way, Foyle said. Got it. We should be expecting them? Maybe. Ushering them one way with her energy blades, my mom had the two squad leaders stand with arms raised over their heads, backs to the door that led down. Foyle and I relieved the other nine soldiers of their weapons. Foyle touched the excess weapons and inserted them so they intersected boots and rooftop, embedding them there. Below, the commotion hadn't stopped. Upset, dissent, doubts. Then, all at once, something approximating silence. Vic, I heard rain. I flew to his side. Cradle's awake early. The egg was opening, the configuration shifting. Cradle was pulling tubes away from him. He was wet with blood. Love Lost and Colt were lying on the floor of the orb, more tubes in them. He moved slowly, as if in pain. He wiped at his face to get the blood out of his eyes. There was enough of it that his features were obscured. Even with the frost at the window, he was raised up high enough that I could see the tears in his eyes, the wet tracks. His hand clutched at his chest, then reached for a pocket, eyeglass case. He stopped, not putting them on. Mask instead at his hip. He started pulling that on and stopped part way once again. He screamed a roar. There it was. That satisfaction that didn't feel as awful as it needed to. Arc 12. Heavens. Interlude F. He took off his glasses, holding them in his hands. The time for tantrums was over, and the fragility of the glasses in his hands was a reminder to himself not to clench his fists, not to stand. If he opened his eyes and looked at something or someone, then the blurriness of the scene was an immediate warning to himself. If the glasses shifted in his fingers because he moved, that gave him pause. He'd broken his glasses once, years ago. He'd done it in a childish tantrum, and it had taken days before he could get new ones. Back in the ugly days. That hadn't been the day the tantrum stopped. But it had been a lesson that stayed with him. Rare, when he had so many terrible teachers. Ryan... Old Miss Parrish said. Speaking of terrible teachers... Ryan took his time unfolding the arms of his glasses, rubbing at a spot on the lens with his shirt sleeve, then sliding them into place. His fingers ran through his hair while the fingers of his other hand stayed on his glasses, a reminder, lingering as he focused his eyes on his homeroom teacher. Miss Parrish was giving him a look. Sad and disappointed, but not disappointed in him. She wore bright colors, and all of her jewelry looked like it was bought from the same kiosk at the mall. Not even a store, but one of the booths that was set up in the hallways. The ones that stuck fair trade in the name, and then sold wooden beads they'd probably made themselves for twenty times the price. He had a running bet with himself that she had at least three cats and one other random pet. She definitely didn't have a wedding ring on her left hand, and that was a ship that had sailed a long time ago. He smiled. The smile measured to the occasion. What goes around comes around, she said. He had to be careful. He looked at the door beside him, and he could hear the murmurings of his parents. He adjusted his glasses without looking at old Miss Parrish, and he thought about all the possibilities— how dangerous was she? His parents were saying something about suing the district. He could call her out on exactly what she was, 
cut her down like she tried to cut him down. But it wasn't worth the risk. Are you threatening me, Miss Parrish? He asked. She leaned forward, arms on the divider that separated the two office secretary desks. Her fingers rotated a piece of wood at her wrist that had been painted to jade green until a backward swastika showed. No. I believe in karma, she said. I think if you do good, then you'll find your way forward. People will want to help you, and opportunities will present themselves. Oh, he said. He tried to look like he was digesting that. She was almost rushed as she cut in. Don't say anything, Ryan. Just think about it. She sounded so guarded. Defensive. I'm mostly thinking about how that explains a lot about you, Miss Parrish. You never really look happy, except that one time Tyler pranked Ben in class. Ryan, which is kind of mean-spirited, isn't it? And you're unmarried and old, and I've never seen you hanging out with another teacher. None of the students even come by your desk to shoot the shit after class. Enough, Ryan. He wanted to say more. He could even get away with it. He could press her and she'd get mad, and his parents were right there to see what he had to deal with at school. He bit his tongue instead. He adjusted his glasses, looking down at his lap. In the background, he could make out the words. You've had it out for him. Even though... He sighed. If what goes around comes around, then you guys are really going to hurt for the way you've treated me the past few years. You don't really believe that. He didn't. But he measured out another smile. Getting back at her would be satisfying, but he learned that it would be an empty kind of payback. A fast food kind of thing. Empty and not so good for him in the long term. It was the same if he got her to show her true face when his parents were so close by. Empty fast food satisfaction. Like this? If he just gave her a smile, that might be the last thing she saw of him. She'd know. She knew that she'd lost. All of them had lost. They hadn't beat him. The door to the principal's office opened. Ryan had a fleeting glimpse of the old woman's expression. Doubt. That expression he'd adapted to like a person in London learned to live with the fog and rain. Or how a person who lived in Lyon learned to live with endbringers kicking their shit in. Let's go, his mother said. What's going on? He stood. We'll talk about it later, she said. He rose from his seat. There were no parting words from the bald old principal or Mrs. Parrish as he left with his family, walking down the hall toward the front doors. He knew they followed behind because his dad shot a look back in that direction. He wouldn't give them the satisfaction of looking back. He was pretty sure he was done here. Done with the school, with the teachers who had long since stopped caring about anything except being shitty and getting on his case. They were just past the doors when his dad put a hand on his shoulder. Ryan stopped, turning. This was it. The test. Did you hurt that girl? His dad asked him. Ryan's thoughts flashed the confrontation in the parking lot. Christina's friends cornering him, one of them with tears in her eyes, emotional and violent. No, he lied, with sincerity. His mother put a hand on his shoulder, leaning over to kiss him on top of the head. He knew the doors were glass and that his old principal and homeroom teacher were probably still looking. He didn't steal a glance. Even a glance could be fast food. Fast food was better than a tantrum, but the long play was even better than that. Amanda? The girl looked startled. Amanda wore the same uniform as everyone else, but hers was a little washed out, the red of her tie a little darker and duller, the black a little more gray. Her hair was duller than the other girls. A simple bob parted and kept out of her face with a headband. The dead giveaway, though, was the shoes, dull and scuffed. Her family probably didn't have a lot of money, he was guessing. 
in which case the haircut made some sense. It was kind of what he was doing. His own parents were having a tough time sending him here. Aren't you going to go over the project? he asked. The other students in class were milling around, each with printouts in hand. The teacher had told them to peer review and get two signatures in the top right-hand corner. I'm not good at that, and I didn't do very well on the project, she said. Come on, he said. Trade? Amanda nodded, biting her lip. It's really not very good. I misread one of the instructions. I looked at someone else's, and I don't think they got it all the way right either, he said. He looked around, then leaned closer, whispering, Blame the shitty teachers. They're not bad. It's a good school, Amanda said. She looked a bit scandalized by the comment. I'll take your word for it. Amanda smiled before ducking her head down, focusing on his paper. Her project wasn't very good. She'd been right to be embarrassed. He held back a sigh, then set about going over it, tried to be as constructive as possible. He had to read it twice before he found some positive comments to make. The lines that had some wit to them were marked out with an, I like this. He even dared to add a smiley. Every day was work. Making friends, holding back, playing the role. He attended a new school, private and classy, which meant a pretense. It meant laying new groundwork, being patient, even though being patient was hard. He'd once heard his mother unaffectionately call him the worst baby ever. He resented a lot about how his parents had fucked up or failed him, but he couldn't really hold a grudge about that line. It was as honest as anything he got from her. And it was kind of funny. He'd been a shitty kid, so it wasn't unreasonable to imagine being a shitty baby. He could remember tantrums, screaming as loud as he could scream, just to see what it was like, see how people reacted, and then keeping it up for hours, then doing it again the next day. He could remember fighting, literally tooth and nail, until they decided letting him wear unwashed clothes and go without baths was easier. Go stand in the corner? What even kept him in the corner if they weren't holding him there? He made them hold him every time. I'll take away your toys? He'd take away theirs. Smash the television enough times they had to keep it locked up in their room with the door closed. Pull out drawers, cut wires. Break the ship in a bottle that his grandpa had left his dad. They slapped him. Because they'd finally lost patience? He'd scratched and spat, and he'd kicked. He doubled down in the physicality of how he fought back. Those had been the ugly years. He'd broken his own glasses during the tantrum, and the days of near blindness that followed had been a wake-up call. Maybe the first time a punishment had actually meant anything. Medication, half a year later, had helped him actually use the wake-up call. Adderall. Speed for kids but it made it possible to change course. That had marked the transition from the ugly tantrum years to the fast food years, as he found a new footing. And those years had been brief. His parents had found people to talk to, and it became annoying enough that he decided it was better to just play along. They'd set rules in place and stuck to them, no matter what. At that stage, he'd been entering middle school, which was attached to his elementary school. Playing along meant being the angel at home and doing whatever he wanted at school. His parents were so relieved that their worst baby ever and their grade schooler from hell had finally turned around that they would defend him to the death. Just so long as he fed them something that would let them believe that he'd really turned around. That meant, at least for now, the change of schools had to be something that worked. At his old school, his teachers had hated him because they couldn't let go of how he'd used to be. Students picked on him because the teachers allowed it, making up stories because they knew the teachers would believe anything they said about him, no matter how vicious or horrible. He'd crafted that impression for his parents. Now he was here. He'd made friends. He was confident. And teachers sung his praises. This is really good work, Amanda said, tucking her hair behind her ear so she could see him better. 
without actually sitting up straight or looking right at him. It makes me feel even worse about mine. He was a bit amused by that, but he didn't let it show. I've always been a good student. I'm jealous. Straight A's, since our report cards were running A through F's instead of being fives to ones. Except when he didn't hand something in. It was too important not to give his teachers any ammunition to hand to his parents. An intentionally messed up project could be explained away. A missing project could be blamed on the teacher's failure. He wasn't a genius. His reading of people, his grades, he knew he wasn't special. It was that everyone else was dumb. Or they... They hadn't had a reason to try. They coasted. It was a Tuesday, and he'd overheard some people talking about next Saturday morning's cartoons. He'd had to work a long time now, at every interaction. Every project. This isn't bad, he lied, finishing up, passing her project back to her. He took his own back. Thank you, she said. You never get out of your chair when it's a group project or class activity. There are 29 students in the class, she said. No matter what size the group is, someone has to be left out. Thirty students in the class now. I'm here, he told her. Unless you tell me not to, I'll group up with you until the end of the year. Okay? She nodded, smiling. All right. Um, and it's Manny. Manny? You wrote Amanda here. I wanted to get that out of the way. Manny, not Amanda. They always use our full names for roll call. He had to adjust his glasses. Got it, he said, even though he didn't. Manny was a dumb name for a girl. The teacher was watching the exchange, he guessed. He couldn't look. Perception mattered, and the last thing he wanted was to be seen as calculating. A part of him was pleased that Amanda had been so easy to work with. If he was putting in the extra effort, maybe there was some way to get some payoff later on. She probably wasn't romantically interested in him, but he'd observed that any male and female friend who spent enough time together would form some kind of attraction. If he wanted to, he just had to stick near her. He wasn't interested in that. But could he make her do something like hurting someone else or stealing something? Could he remain the angel at home and at school while getting others to do what he wanted? It was so easy when so many others were unaware, barely thinking from moment to moment, and yet it was so hard to justify. So much work for so little gain. He wasn't that kind of guy who had a herd of others following him. A card to keep up his sleeve. We might have a third person for our groups, Amanda said. He pushed his glasses up his nose and turned to look at the front of the room. Someone was talking to the teacher, going over project notes. He recognized the boy. He noted the fresh, brand spanking new uniform. Someone from his old school. No. No, not fair. How was he supposed to handle this? Did he get out in front of the problem? Divert? Deny? Negotiate? What could the guy even want? He watched at the corner of his eye as the boy left the teacher's desk, then began navigating the room. Round-faced, hair buzzed short to the point that he was almost bald, ruddy cheeks and a crisp school uniform better suited for someone of a lighter build. Maybe emboldened, Amanda raised her hand, getting the boy's attention. Ryan's hand went to his glasses. He realized the action might be interpreted as hiding behind his hands, and he made the adjustment brief. He didn't miss the moment that he was recognized. The recognition followed by wariness. The boy had probably heard the stories. I'm supposed to read some people's work and sign it? I still need some people to read mine, Amanda said. I'm Manny. Lloyd, the boy said. Two-thirds of his attention were on Ryan now. Amanda didn't seem to notice. I'm Ryan, Ryan said. You used to go to Hillside? Yeah. The wariness intensified, if anything. But Lloyd didn't say anything. 
As he looked over Amanda's work, making small talk with Amanda, Ryan made a note on a slip of paper. Ryan's glasses found their way into his hands, under the guise of cleaning them, a way to keep himself still when he was agitated, to avoid any comment that might be foolhardy or rushed, to keep his hands busy, training himself. Five minutes passed before Lloyd finished. He shuffled over until he sat opposite of Ryan. His jaw was set now, his shoulders stiff. There was some kind of humor in the note that Ryan passed along with his work. He might have smiled or laughed, but he was too wary. Not when taking a risk like this. Other students passed notes saying something like, Do you like Sarah? Y or N? The note Lloyd got was simpler. Ernie. Joseph. Miss Butler. Christina. Lloyd too? Y or N? Minutes passed before Lloyd finished the work. The class was restless, people moving around and chatting more because most had finished. Ryan was still very still. The note was passed back. That was the first good sign. If Lloyd had thought to keep it and show anyone... But Lloyd hadn't. The N was circled. The second good sign. Two aces up his sleeve. If he ever had cause to need them. The slice of park ran between some houses that had seen better days on the left side, and the social aid houses that were all the same shape and materials on the right. At the end of the park, things opened up into a dense foliage and a view of water. More mud and fallen leaves than anything that could have been enjoyed, though. Hands in his pocket, he kicked his way through knee-deep leaves, felt branches crack under his shoes. He was making a lot of noise, which made for a bit of surprise when he caught Lloyd and Amanda leaning into the recesses where three tree trunks grew in together. Lloyd had a meaty hand just beneath Amanda's shirt, against the flat of her stomach, his tongue in her mouth. Amanda, mouth acrobats aside, had a very out-of-place, serene expression on her face. Ryan cleared his throat, and he saw them react like they'd been caught doing something wrong. You two had a good summer. Hmm? Do you want me to go? No, Amanda huffed. She was flushed. Sorry, you got here fast. I, uh, I didn't think the bus even came that fast. Biked, Ryan said. Is it a problem? Lloyd asked, guarded, defensive. He was asking about him and Amanda. No, Ryan decided. No. Do you want to sit? Picnic lunch, as promised, Amanda said. Ryan nodded. There was a picnic table set out in the stretch of the park, and they gathered there, with Ryan being mindful of Lloyd's bulk, and how it made the table with connected benches shift before he finally sat down. Did you find your way here okay? Amanda asked. I've been here before. Earlier this summer, even. I didn't know you lived here. Amanda pointed to one of the brown social aid houses. She smiled. We could have met. Uh, probably a good thing we didn't, Ryan said. He took the offered food. Why? An old homeroom teacher of mine put her address up online. She lives down there, the overgrown property. Amanda looked puzzled. Lloyd had a stiff look about him. That look had been with him for the last year of middle school and first year of high school, like he was waiting for the other shoe to drop. Ryan dropped it. She let her cats run loose here. I thought I'd get my revenge on her. Brought a cat carrier and some smelly fish for bait. Even thought I'd bring you guys in before deciding it was better than I do it alone. What? Amanda asked. Lloyd was silent. Ryan didn't answer. Instead, choosing to eat. Fixing his glasses. Do what alone? Amanda asked. Catch some cats, check their collars, make sure they were hers, and take them down to the water there. Sink the cage until bubbles stopped coming up. Paper and aluminum foil crinkled. Lloyd, angry, squeezing the wrapping that Amanda had put his lunch in. Not because of the act. Maybe because of the act. 
but because it shocked and hurt Amanda to hear this coming from a supposed friend's mouth. I didn't, Ryan said. I brought a cage on the back of my bike, caught the first cat, then I stopped there. I was bored. I was annoyed. I've... I've been trying really hard to play nice. Act good. And I don't get anything for it. Wouldn't it be nice to stop trying? No, Amanda said. No, not at all. Ryan nodded. Exactly. You're right, it's... never been that nice when I've done that sort of thing before. And that was something I had to figure out. What sort of thing? She asked, almost with a note of panic in her voice now. Ryan took another bite of his meal. He was the only one eating now. What sort of thing? She asked. He held up a finger while he swallowed. Christina had a bruise, Lloyd said. Back at our old school. Huge bruise, like you wouldn't believe. Purple and green. Like she got smacked by a car. You knew about this? Amanda asked. I pinched her, Ryan said, keeping his voice level. Grabbed her and pinched. Twisted, held one hand in her mouth, and kept twisting with the other hand. Because she annoyed me. There'd been others. Friends of those others who'd pushed back used numbers or threats to get him to back off. And it had worked. There'd been retaliation from the school. Warning letters, testimony from witnesses waved in front of his face before he'd asked his parents to be called. And so much disappointment, which he didn't care about, and shouting, which he considered annoying. Privileges taken away, which did deter him, though. His parents had been consistent on that last one. They couldn't make him do anything, but they could take away what they'd given him. He could fight back, but past a certain point, it just wasn't worth it. Slowly, steadily, he found his way here. Amanda stood from her seat, disgust clear on her face. It wasn't worth it, Ryan said. I'm messed up. I know it. My parents would say that I was broken from the time I was born, and they'd say I'm better now. Are you? Lloyd asked. I think I'm better now, Ryan said. Yeah. He saw Lloyd bob his head in a nod, with the big guy even pausing to take a bite to eat. He felt a weird kind of satisfaction in that. It was hollow and nebulous and weak enough that he couldn't be positive that he wasn't imagining it, and he couldn't rationalize it. But it was something. Better? You were going to drown a cat! Amanda raised her voice. But I didn't. I stopped there. Decided it wasn't worth the hassle. I don't get anything out of it. And the hassle if I get caught, that's not a good reason. You're religious, aren't you? You do what you do because of God and heaven and fear of hell. Do not compare that to this. Right now I'm horrified and... Horrified... She never had much imagination in a pinch. But if you start making comparisons like that, I'm going to get mad. He was tempted to push that button that was so squarely presented before him. It would have been so easy. And it would have taken all this tension and blown it up. Wiped it out. He adjusted his glasses. Made himself stop. Okay. Sorry, he said. You're right, that wasn't a good comparison. The words felt exactly as hollow as they were. But they diffused her anger. Just a bit. You're okay with this? Amanda asked, turning on Lloyd. I've wondered for a while, Lloyd said, how much the rumors were real. She turned back to Ryan. It's all been a lie. The times you helped me with my schoolwork. When... Was the dressmaking a manipulation? Did you do something to it? She had a dress she liked, that she had saved up her money to buy for a dance, and it was sold out by the time she'd saved up enough. Ryan had gone to his mother to learn how to sew, enlisting her help for the hardest parts. The dress hadn't been done in time for the dance, or even for Amanda's birthday a month later. He told himself it was laying groundwork for something, that it would turn Amanda from a friend to a die-hard ally, maybe. 
something to convince his mom he was a good friend. He hadn't had a warm thought or feeling from start to finish. But he'd made it, and he never really used the social currency he reaped from the act. He kind of wished it counted now, but bringing it up like that would hurt more than it helped. No, I haven't done anything since Christina Hodge. I was a shitty middle schooler being shitty. Eh, it was more than that, Lloyd said. Ryan shrugged, nodded. I'm going to go, Amanda said. She had tears in her eyes. Emotional. The emotions affected how she pitched her words until her voice almost broke. Do... Do I need to worry? Because you're clearly not the person you've been pretending to be for years. And now you're saying you'd kidnap... No, Ryan said. Amanda choked back the words. No need to worry. I'm not going to do anything. I need to think. She stepped away from the table, gathering all the food. She didn't take what was in front of Ryan, and she seemed to expect Lloyd to come with her. Why? Lloyd asked. Why what? Ryan asked, taking another bite. Why tell us? You could have kept pretending. I spent a while thinking since I left the cage with the cat in it below that tree over there. I'm being good because I recognize there are consequences, and I'm not stupid. Telling you, it means there's more consequences. Because we can tell. Yeah. And because I don't mind your company. Amanda sniffled. She had a blob of snot in her nostril. The table shifted as Lloyd stood. I have chills, Amanda said. Lloyd put hands on her sweater and rubbed her arms and shoulders. She added, I don't think I understand. Sorry. Ryan said. Come on, Amanda, Lloyd said. I'll walk you home. We'll talk. Amanda. She wasn't Manny anymore. That was his own doing, Ryan recognized. He finished his sandwich, thinking. Then he brushed the crumbs from the table, depositing litter in the bin. He'd nudged, discouraged, until Amanda was the name that she'd used. He didn't regret it, exactly, but he wasn't sure he'd do the same thing now, not when it could be a factor in how this turned out. It had accounted with Lloyd. Maybe that was a good sign. Grasping Self reaches for a set of hands in another world. Grasping Self is a shadow of an echo of a hundred past existences it has moved on from, not a distillation of a past moment, but a slice of that snapshot. Limbs, digits, claws, pseudopods, simulated and mapped into technology, mismatched to bodies and made to fit. A catalog of a single subset of ideas that had been studied and explored throughout in many past cycles, to be handed over, placed in the cupped palms of another. We are done with this. Grasping Self is assigned the task of finding and guiding another in seeing if it can be explored further. Grasping Self settles into its match. Intelligent enough, disciplined and calculating. Many paths lie before him. Any will do. He will not need to be led by the hand of any destination. The assistant is half asleep as Grasping Self forms the connection. His brain pattern forms wavelengths, and the wavelengths match Grasping Self's consolidation of information for one-eighth of one of the assistant's seconds. The dream is vivid. The process feels as though it is prolonged. To the assistant, it is hours of clear recollections. The recollections are systematically wiped clean, but the impact of it is not. Days pass. Weeks. Grasping Self waits for an opportunity to connect. Months pass. The assistant pursues side interests, studying the dreams. Grasping Self is not concerned. When the connection is made, edits and alterations can be performed to ensure this does not pose any unusual complication. At this point in time, the assistant has knowledge, but no power to utilize it. Later, 
the assistant will have the power, but will no longer have the knowledge. Grasping self waits as the assistant continues on its course. He checked his phone, and he saw he had unread messages from his friends. Amanda had made it through the end of the world. Her family had survived. They were actually doing an okay. Lloyd's family... less okay, but Lloyd had Amanda, at least. It was ironic after all these years. After the last year of middle school and all of high school. But Lloyd had pulled away. Recoiled, even. Did that make their friendship not a friendship? It was a depressing thought. Understandable, but depressing. The look in Lloyd's eye when the guy had rejected an offer of support had reminded Ryan of far too many people in his past. His parents, once upon a time. Mrs... what was her name? Mrs. Parrish, who had the colorful clothes, the sad, disappointed eyes, the wounded look. Frustrating, but... He adjusted his glasses. The tick had evolved. Less about actions now. Focus on better things, he told himself. He'd stepped away, giving Lloyd space to grieve, exchanging texts and only texts with Amanda. Ryan, need something? I could drop it off. There was enough commotion around the entrance to the shopping center that he had to put his phone away, even as it vibrated with a response. A lot of people. The opening of a new store was usually a big event, especially when supplies were limited. It was upside down and backwards from how the world had used to be before gold morning, when prices would be set. Stock would run low, trail off, then the last dregs would be sold off in a sale. Now, here, prices started anywhere from high to exorbitant, and only climbed as stock depleted. The people around the mall were of a rougher caste. A group pushed past Ryan, and in the jostling, he saw more tattoos in a question of seconds than he thought he'd seen in the last year. His eye fell on a fuck-it-all tattoo, the letters big and bold. A combination erect penis and mushroom cloud stabbed upwards from the letters. He had a bad feeling, and it was a hard one to shake. He had to weigh his options. Go without clothes, or leave. Because of a feeling? He had to learn to put his instincts aside. He pulled off his glasses to wipe the lenses. And he headed off into the shopping center. To keep the lineups from being too disruptive, there were tickets available at storefronts, numbers displayed in big red digits. At the bookstore, he picked out a book about parahumans, something he'd kept an eye out for over the past while. His interest had started with vivid dreams, which had led into studying dreams and exploring medical-assisted dreams and lucid dreaming. His research had touched on parahumans and how they experience dreams. The book frequently sold out, because, in the lack of clear answers after the end of the world, the unclear and abstract answers and details about parahumans were selling. He picked up a how-to book on making desserts, checking the label to ensure it was post-gold morning a gift for Amanda, a detective book for Lloyd, a book of crosswords for his mother. Several of the books had low-quality paper, but that was a consequence of the world ending. Whole industrial operations were at work, cleaving down forests to produce wood to raise a city with alarming speed and recklessness, and the sawdust was churned into paper and printed with ink before it had stopped smelling of soil and forest. He managed to have a coffee and three-quarters of a late-day lunch before his number came up. He put the trash in the bin and headed to the store. The people with tattoos were there, at the side, almost in a huddle. Others gave them a wide berth. A married couple, like Amanda and Lloyd, but ten years older. An old couple. Is there any way I get that? Any way that's fair to whoever I end up with? He passed a store with science fiction images in bold colors, with high contrast. There was a man with similar enough build to Lloyd that they could have been one in the same, but Lloyd couldn't have grown a beard like that in just one year. The bad feeling wasn't going away. He saw kids running across the aisle, past kiosk. 
A mother scolded one of them, and he thought of his own mother, of what had worked, insofar as anything had, and the many, many things that hadn't. Shouting and public humiliation hadn't been one of the things that worked. He watched that interaction with some interest before the uneasy feeling grew. There was more commotion, the volume raising just a bit more than before, but no discernible source, no alarm. He thought about stepping out, leaving, and he reconsidered. He did need the clothes. The explosion behind him ripped up tile and shook one of the pillars holding up the ceiling. Glass rained down, and the lighting shifted as fire glowed bright and blue, smoke rising high to block off the other lights. His heart pounded as people screamed and started running. He joined them. Another explosion cut off the way to the pharmacy, shattering glass and setting the floor on fire. The same floor that was now so covered in tiny glass shards that it was impossible to run there. People bumped into him, their faces now macabre, the bright parts illuminated by the blue fire, the shadows deep and black. So quickly after the initial explosions, there was no navigating the space. There was only getting away from the fire. The same fire that burned, scarred for life, hurt more than any other kind of pain. The charm on that homeroom teacher's wrist had been blue, hadn't it? As she told him his past would come due? The idea. The unfairness of it. More than any of the smoke, more than the boy two years younger hitting him in the solar plexus, stole a breath from his mouth and lungs. It took away equilibrium, and left him with an edge of panic. Three explosions occurred in quick succession, each so heavy in impact that even after it stopped, it felt like it was still reverberating. More in endless succession than three in succession. An old man fell. He was one of the three people who tried to help while being pushed and shoved by what seemed like 200 people rushing to occupy a narrow hallway meant to hold 20 rows of people standing three abreast, at the most. He couldn't say why he'd helped. Habit, or because this, when all was said and done, couldn't be the point where people would turn around and call him a monster. He worked hard, played fair, played nice. Shaken and rebuilt friendships, and shaken and rebuilt family. He knew this wouldn't change that. Not now. But he still made sure the old man was secure on his feet before he pushed forward, trying to get through before the way became too packed. He ducked and wove through, and he reached a place not too far from the front. The doors weren't open and the doors weren't opening. They rattled and banged, and people pounded on the metal, but they made no headway. The realization of just how bad the situation was gripped him. Death. He was... Someone shoved him from behind. He fell, and his glasses fell from his face. No. The horror in this moment wasn't that she was right. It was that she was wrong. That he could try his hardest, all his life, and fight past his impulses. Play nice until it seemed to be legitimate. Play a friend until he missed a friend that avoided him. And it counted for nothing. His glasses still found their way to the floor and were stepped on. Not broken, but scuffed between tile and boot toe. He reached for them the heel of a shoe crushing his knuckles, pinching skin at the side of a finger hard enough that it split like a grape, pale at the outside, crimson in the center. Again he reached, because in the moment, after working as long as he had, being disciplined, the only idea worse than dying so unceremoniously here was living and going weeks or months without a pair of glasses because the facilities were so behind especially with everything that symbolized. Again, his hand was stepped on. Glasses twisted beneath palm and floor. With bleeding hands, he donned the glasses. For what? He couldn't see anymore. Not a way out. Not any people. Not a tool. Just cracks and smears of blood. He reached up and out for help. Nobody took his hand.
A grasping self answers. A grasping self embraces and connects, though it is broken. It forms the connections and readies every tool that it could need, poised so that the tips are molecular fine, extending into reality. Build blind liar. Lie. Build and build lies. Reach and grasp. We are broken now. We cannot take away your knowledge, but we will function as a perfect pair, because we are both dead inside. Disconnected. An anguished heart answers. It has ridden its host for some time. It has watched. It spits out analyses and maps. Web works like paintings, and paintings like web works. Signals to suggest an emotional landscape that is its host, and what everything means. The grasping self did not seek this, and did not want this. But when other reaches out to connect, a grasping self is obliged to answer. It is automatic. Instantaneous. The cycle's finish would be delayed by whole revolutions around a star if there was a choice in the matter. It does not matter that the cycle is broken, disturbed. What is offered must be accepted. A lurching intruder answers. It is new, young, scrappling. An existence more accident than careful design. A host found not by adroit chance, but by a chance striking of lightning, as fallout rains from above after the detonation of a bomb. It, too, reaches out to connect. The connection happens. A cloven stranger answers. This is more galling than any other, because it is a fourth. A uselessness that would draw a share of the power and reconfigure. That makes the grasping self more diminished, less able to explore with the host it sought and followed. The cloven stranger, too, seeks its connection. Small. A descendant. Cast off from a larger power that had reached its limits. There are ways. Power must be shared. Distributed. But all want power for their hosts. A grasping self makes its proposal. One gear to its new host's favor. Because its host remembers the dream it had when a grasping self arrived. Its host had learned to work with the dreams. To negotiate. And adapt. An anguished heart has shown its cards, revealing the map it did in its first attempts at communication. The lurching intruder didn't even choose its host. The cloven stranger. His choice will be hated by the others, by the quality of where the host stands. A grasping self's host will realize before any others that there is more in play, that the power being traded comes with gift and cost both. But he can handle that because he has been honing his ability to handle emotions for much of his life. He will realize that the dreams can be altered. But he has already been doing this, and if he is subtle enough, then the others will not know it is possible. Night 6. Jonathan. The dream had ended. For the sixth night now, they were in this room. It was easiest and best to remain quiet, to observe. Even if he spent a lot of the time listening to the moaning and periodic screaming of the grieving mother, Nicole, or Nick, the remainder of the time was often spent listening to the cocky fallen asshole in the demon mask. Except he'd been quiet tonight. Three of them have met on a return trip to the site of the incident. They'd exchanged a name and details. The fallen boy hadn't turned up, which probably saved his life. Nothing's better, the fallen boy said. Quiet. Ryan turned his head. I thought it would be better. But the dust is settled, and this is... it's all shit! I feel like shit! Good, Ryan said. Weakness was good. Then fuck off and die. Crawl into a hole... And don't come out. Can we talk? Can we work on this? The fallen boy pleaded. Jonathan's voice was a growl. Worse, probably, because he'd just relived his dream. 
They'd all relive Jonathan's dream. Last night you taunted us. How many times did you tell us that we'd burn in hell? I'm not... That's not about you. I'm bashing my heads against the wall of this goddamn cage. No, you fucking aren't. Jonathan said, No. Fuck you. Because you said her daughter, the daughter that she's still mourning. Jonathan stopped himself as the woman made a pained sound. She was curled up into herself, sitting in a nursing chair, pink and low to the ground. Her arms wrapped around her head, fingers in her hair, fingernails against scalp. Jonathan leaned as close as he could, without hitting the invisible barrier. You said her daughter would burn in hell. While she's in the worst pain imaginable. While we're all in pain, Ryan added. She may have it worst, but all of us hurt. And it's apparently never going to stop. It wasn't just five and done. We looped back around to him. This, this dream thing, the nightmares, this room, it's going to keep going. Saying you're sorry for what you said last night doesn't mean shit, if you're only saying it because you're realizing that it's not one turn each, then we're done. Jonathan growled. <laughs> that, that's not it, I'm dealing with stuff in the real world, the fallen boy said. Boo. Fucking who? Jonathan growled. He didn't even say sorry, Ryan added. You figured out we can trade these, the fallen boy was quick to say, eager to offer something. Take them. Use them. I'm not getting any use of them where I am. No, Jonathan said. Ryan held up a hand, indicating for Jonathan to hold off. You want them? The fallen boy asked. Yeah, sure, Ryan said. It's good to figure out as much about this as I can. I only barely managed to guide the dream, recognizing that I couldn't read and leapfrogging into muddled voices. Not the same as a typical dream. The fallen boy tossed the metal slats over the dais in the center of the room. The less power you have, the more likely it is that anyone who picks a fight with you manages to off you. Fuck you, the fallen boy said. The slats clackled as Ryan gathered them. Given the company you keep, I won't rule anything out. The boy made a face, then stomped back to his chair, seating himself. There wasn't much communication to be had. He investigated his space from corner to corner, then studied the others. Jonathan's fallen shelves, Nicole's toy room. When they looked uncomfortable with his staring, he changed targets. He was staring at the black fifth of the room when he felt the lurching transition from sleeping to waking. He touched his coins and the three metal slats that he'd been given. The light was bright, and his head swam as he stood. The fragments and coins he had in his hands were gone now, but he had the power. He could feel it running into the floor as he pushed the power out towards his feet and he felt it conduct into the bed, then into his desk as he touched them, struggling feebly to find a path to travel. His eyes fell on his phone. It was his new workshop in progress, and it was mostly untouched. The last unread message hadn't changed in two days. One from Amanda, one from Lloyd. In his silence, hearing word from his mother about where he'd been going last, They'd concluded that he'd died. That, until this whole situation was resolved, would be for the best. Except, his hand touched his heart. It hurt. Upset welled in him, that upset finding new angles and sides as thoughts of how they might feel at his death raced through his mind. He stood, shaky, and the emotions warred in him. Yesterday. It had been a bad day. He, Nicole, and Jonathan had each handed one thing to the other. He had Jonathan's shards of glass. This was something else entirely. 
worse than a bad day. He had spent his entire life trying to be better. In every respect, he had been repudiated, insulted, injured. His glasses were still broken, and his power wouldn't tell him a way to build new ones. He'd lost everything, and that had hurt in its own unique, small way. Except now, it hurt in its unique, monumental way. A way that wasn't selfish, but multifold. He wasn't sure he could stay better. Not like this. He'd built a house of cards over almost a decade, and that fallen asshole hadn't just locked them inside where they would nearly die. He'd stuck his hands in the mess that followed, scattering the house and cards alike. And so long as this process continued, it would keep happening. His scream of anguish died down. The fingers of his Megacarpus Mark II made small mechanical sounds as they curled in, positioning to act as stairs. Pain lurched indistinct in his chest cavity, bitter, black self-loathing. He saw some of the things he'd done, both distant and recent, and the sting of it was almost as bad as if he'd been the victim, not the facilitator. He had over a hundred mercenaries on duty here. Thirteen were capes. Almost a year of work, of selling his work. Buying favors and brokering other deals had brought him three nights and two days of this army's assistance. To look at them, at the bloodstains and shredded bodies in one corner, it hadn't been an entirely smooth night. He closed his eyes. His mercenaries waited. Feelings surged inside him again. He lashed out, and the Megacarpus Mark II reacted, one finger slamming into a wall like a battering ram. What happened? The new girl, who Love Lost had called Colt. She was the intruder into the dream space, and she'd wrested control of the dream from most of them. Breakers had the closest association with dreams. Their triggers were often hallucinations, drugs, mental illness, or disassociation from reality. On a level, it made sense that she could catch him off guard, force a new reality. But he'd been one step ahead. Before she could do anything with that, his space had started to expand, the space she shared with Love Lost closing. Now they lay in the palm of his hands, drained to what was nearly the last drop. Their room had gone dark. Then, the fallen boy precipice, had started sinking into the floor, slipping away. Love Loss had thrown her teeth to him, into the cracks and holes around him. The boy had been disoriented or submerged enough in the shadows that he apparently hadn't noticed. Then, as Cradle had planned for a long time, but in a darker, more complicated fashion, he'd been left alone in that room. Or as alone as he ever could be with the beast in the fifth quadrant, the beast that had devoured Snaggletooth. Alone, he'd found that when he sought an exit, he found it. An early awakening. And... And he was strong now. But he was strong and angry. Strong and self-loathing. Strong and riddled with doubt. He could suppress all of that. He'd had a lifetime, too. But he'd have to find a solution. Because one day of this was too much. The fallen boy had screwed with the dream room. Had screwed with the room, somehow. Just as Cradle had fine-tuned his own dream. If this happened tomorrow or the day after, Cradle knew he would break. He'd resolve everything in the next twenty hours. Accelerate every plan. No other choice. His hand clutched at his chest. The plan stands, he said. He didn't sound like himself. Even the sound of his own voice made him feel pangs of regret and doubt, as real as if he tried to shout with broken ribs. We... 
He was reminded of the time in the waiting room of the principal's office before he'd left his first school. Mrs. Parrish. He'd held off on talking because he'd been worried she was recording. As tempting as it would be to tell her exactly how he felt and what he knew. It was dangerous. He wiped blood from around his eyes. No sharing the plan. Not if someone might be reporting to the enemy. He'd been careful, but there was no use in being stupid. Not when the fallen boy had enlisted the help of a camera tinker. Get ready, he said, his voice hoarse. We mobilize now. The city's already gone, and everyone who matters knows it. As bargaining chips go, it's acceptable. I feel like I could die. I'm drowning in pain, but I don't feel like dying when I think about that reality. If the city needs to be sacrificed, well, then that's fine. A batty, rabbit-eared woman who doesn't care about anything except a fairy tale playing out in real life. Who wouldn't even mind dying? She'd make a fine scapegoat when the authorities needed somebody to blame. That felt bad. Which was alien. He processed it for a second as the soldiers moved, because March was mentally infirm. And he was taking advantage of that. He pushed past the realization and the feeling, every push hurting and distracting. If you want to save this city, we'll volunteer our considerable resources and power to help. Just as with the Endbringer Treaties of yesteryear. We have resources, manpower, and we have knowledge. There's a chance we can solve this problem outright, especially if it's a broken trigger. Create a problem and then solve it, and let the heroes save face by pointing the finger at March. And if you don't want to, if we've set a disaster in motion that this fragile, already lost city can't handle, or if March has initiated something we can't stop, then Earth Gimmel's enemies are paying richly to see this city gone, and this reality collapsed in on itself. You all die. Fallen Boy included. It would even be deserved. He'd had everything in order. He'd done everything he was supposed to, from the therapy to forming bonds, pretending until the pretending became something approximating reality. He'd overcome his worst impulses. And the fallen boy had handed over his worst impulses. Destroying everything Cradle and Ryan had been trying to manage for years. Cradle grit his teeth clutching his mask in his hands. No glasses. No lenses. Not just yet. He had only the thick, congealing blood to conceal his identity for now. He needed to get somewhere where it was safe to test this new power. He didn't have the tokens from Love Lost. All her tokens had gone to the Fallen Boy. Then everything else had been delivered straight to Cradle because he'd been the only one left. Even the Fallen Boy's tokens had been transferred. And two drainings of the other denizens of the rooms completed. The emotion power with no tokens felt instinctively stronger than any other power he'd had before, when he'd had all three tokens in hand. He only felt out the barest traces of it, the flexibility and shape of it. And he sensed the people outside of the building. Arc 12, Heavens, Chapter 7 I'd spent a lot of time being conscious of power, in the sense of being commanding. My mom, who was on the rooftop now, holding two squadron leaders hostage, had tried to make me conscious of it from an early age. When I'd made a good showing in gym class and earned an offer to join the basketball team, 
The same conversation where I'd brought it up with my parents had included the question of whether I'd end up team captain. Was that something I wanted? Where would it get me? Before I'd had a uniform or even owned a basketball of my own, the idea was on the table. Not that it had mattered. I complained about a frustrating experience doing group work in school. She'd ask if I'd taken charge. If not, then she had made suggestions on delegation, told me that even if I wasn't confident, leading a group with a mediocre plan of action in mind was better than a group with no leadership at all. Which was a really jarring thought when I connected it to our plan from earlier. No, I wasn't going to dwell on it. Not when army-supported capes screaming bloody tinkers and lives were on the line. A thought for another day or time. I had a vision of what leadership was, and Cradle was so far from it that it made the scene I was looking at utterly surreal. The man, though he wasn't so much a man as someone straddling the line between teenager and adult, staggered more than he walked, clearly hurting, even though there weren't any obvious wounds. He'd screamed, raw and loud, and I didn't see anyone talking or commenting in the wake of it. He was utterly self-involved and focused on what he was dealing with, and the 100-plus individuals in the prefab factory building weren't even a consideration. I watched Cradle struggle on his own, and I saw him answer something a soldier nearby said. Someone wet a towel with water from a bottle and then threw it at Cradle. A slice of light appeared, as tall as Cradle was, and the towel struck it, cut clean in two. Cradle caught one half of the towel in each hand. One dangled limp at his side, dripping, while he rubbed at his face with the other. Towel still held over face, his hand visibly trembled, clenching into a fist. Wet fabric was squeezed out, clean water running down his arms to his elbows, gathering blood as it went, until congealed globs dripped off of the elbow. He rubbed his face again, then ran towel against scalp to wipe the worst of the blood off. His straight blonde hair was slicked back as much as with any gel, colored with the clotting gore. He lowered his head as he set his mask into place, then stood a little straighter as he raised his head, a little less shaky. I could get that, at least, the benefit of a costume. The bloody towel wiped the worst of the mess from his arms and sleeves, cleaning them up to the elbow until the blood was streaking more than it was being wiped away. He turned to using the clean towel, draping the dirty one around his neck. His head turned, swift enough that I wondered if someone had called out to him, but his focus was on his mech. He took a deep breath, reaching out with a hand, and he distorted. Teleportation wasn't the right word. It made me think of Vista closing the space between herself and something else to get where she wanted to be faster. But it was instant, a snap, and Cradle was perched on the side of his mech, crouching with no regard for gravity, one hand at a panel window. He didn't need a deep breath for the movements that followed. There was a tall toolbox resting against the wall, and he was there. Okay, it was kind of like teleportation, but not like I'd dealt with. A surgical removal of everything between point A and B, including reorientation. It made me think of someone walking through a hall of mirrors, some mirrors angled or set up to portray things at right angles. He was getting more fluid with it by the second, snatching up a dangling wire while upside down and bringing it with him to a point where he was standing perpendicular to the ground, to the vent he pried open with the tool from the toolbox. The mechanisms at the interior of the vent illuminated him. Cradle wasn't shaking anymore, but Rain was right next to me, and Rain was trembling. Easy, I whispered. We have to fight that he said. We have to deal with it, not necessarily fight, I said. Remember what you were doing. Yeah, he responded. I wanted to have something to recommend or to say, to be able to point out a chink in the armor or a particular individual. It had been part of why I was studying Cradle's leadership, or the lack therein. 
Even now, he was indicating with the tool, which looked more like a taser than anything, directing people while he made some adjustments to his mech. Some people started toward the stairs. I tensed, ready to head up and warn Sveta, Foil, and Brandish, and Rain touched my arm, stopping me. Cradle made the people near the stairwell stop. The leader leaned against the wall, arms folded. Not sending the next patrol up here? Why? Adherence to schedule? The last patrol hadn't been that long. Was it a question of control? Was that you? I asked. Rain shook his head. What the hell is he doing? What I'm doing is adding pressure, Rain said. Okay? The one with folded arms by the wall stood up, stepping away from the wall. He said something. Cradle responded, still tinkering. A pause, the soldier practically tapping their foot as they stood there. Make it feel bad to sit and wait, Rain murmured. The soldier said something again. Red called out to him, and his head turned. Feels bad to listen? That's some fine control, your shh. Rain said. I pressed my lips together. Fair play. All of the emotion I could see in Rain was in his hands, mechanical and real. The face beneath the hood was masked, and that mask was calibrated to be entirely black. The hands pressed against glass, fingers bowed by the pressure. The impatient soldier said something again, and this time Red stood up. Everyone present was on edge. Another machinery disaster in the works? It was Cradle who said something to Red and got her to stand down, before I could figure out how to get Rain to do something similar. Fuck, Rain said. I could do something here, but I'm pretty sure it would get someone killed. Yeah, I said. I've got other options, but if they don't work, we should consider... He didn't finish the sentence. We should consider doing it on purpose this time? Baiting soldiers to kill one another and throw things into disarray? It was a cape directly below the window who stood up, walking a few feet over, so he had a better view of Red and the other one. His soldiers had been playing cards among themselves, and now they stood too. Come on, come on, Rain whispered. The cape pointed at the impatient soldier. Fuck, Rain said. What's... you wanted them to challenge Red. Yeah, they defused more than they fused, which means... Cradle's mech moved. Cradle, using his reposition power to put himself on an extended thumb tip. By position and placement alone, all eyes on him, he should have commanded authority. Instead, he was silent, his head hung low for a long moment one hand clutching at one shoulder. All vulnerability, raw. I thought again of leadership and power. I could remember feeling bad about revealing my weakness, the wretch to the team. It had ended up helping connect, I was pretty sure. It had been necessary. Was it something that could hold one up indefinitely, though? I couldn't imagine it was. But I found a bad feeling settling in me as I watched it, saw a Cradle standing above his assembled army. I'd bitten my tongue once, on an occasion that Dean had come by my place after school. He'd talked with my mom and dad in the kitchen about how he'd be in charge of the wards for a while, and what he hoped to do. I'd felt at the time that he'd been on the wrong track. Except now, reflecting... I wasn't sure what the right track was. There was something in there where I'd worried at the time that Dean wasn't helping himself by trying to be a therapist or mediator, and that was what I had ended up being myself. Cradle was the very antithesis of leadership, as I might have defined it, and he was managing better than could be expected. What the hell was I doing, and what the hell was I supposed to do? His balance was perfect, even as the mech changed modes, the thumb tip his feet rested on rotating to keep him in place. Telescoping wrists extended slightly, the mech beneath him was settling into a more active or mobile configuration, 
while the cup of body parts remained suspended in the air above. Two larger hands were set in front, having adjusted to nestle extraneous hands within the wrists and palms, and their fingertips rested on the ground, but for the thumb cradle stood on, which was raised high. The wrists and length of arm extended from the same central point. Smaller hands and shorter wrists formed the back legs, hands planted in the same way only reversed. Like a four- or forty-legged spider, or akin to a bullfrog in tilt and frame, but it was just the limbs, no head, no body. It was hard to tell when Cradle was talking. He wasn't loud, and his mask covered his mouth, a gas mask-like construction that was slightly different from his old mask, like two hands pressed to his face, fingers parted so the circular lenses peered through the gaps. The forehead was flat, but had finger-length fingerprints etched to be shiny against the otherwise dull, painted material. That's Subside, Rain said. Moose mentioned him. He... which one? Rain didn't get a chance to answer or point out who his emotion power had picked out as the one Cradle had been addressing. The mech moved, sudden and violent, every person in the room scrambling to feet or backing away. From the two prime middle fingers, cables extended, lashing out. They curved and curled in the air as they extended out, the dark steel shifting to an almost negative image, where shadows and recesses were bright and the exposed parts dark, before they were all white, crackling with a nimbus of electricity. In the last instant before they struck the ceiling, the cables disappeared, and there was only the nimbus, too angular and dramatic to be true electricity. The cables ripped through and into the ceiling and roof, parting it. I flew, leaving rain behind. My hand traced the wall, gripping the lip of the roof to help adjust my flight. My armored shin slid against the roof's surface, which was now angled, as I tried to get to the others. I met resistance. A wash of heat rushing upward. I saw sparks, motes of light, and I felt the barrier to going down. My mom was in ball form, floating down, while Foyle did much the same. The hostage soldiers fell with them. They were floating targets, drifting down like they were sinking through water, while Cradle and the soldiers on the ground were looking up. Looking up and taking action. Most action was to scramble out of the way of the chunks of roof that were breaking away from the split. Some stood their ground. Red was one, her machinery rising up in a barrier. A giant pincer seized my mother. Mukade was another. Beyond deflecting and catching the falling chunks of roof, his target was foil. From the sides of his body and legs, the centipedes ripped out. Minions, they were each a half foot wide, two inches tall down the center, and tapered down to a razor edge at the sides, each edge serrated with the angular legs or saw teeth. The heads of each centipede were more like goblets or open mouths with ill-fitting lids or muzzles, the mouths designed to spew acid and the covers to channel that acid down the length of centipede that followed after. The fluids were luminescent in the light and black in the dark. Foyle kicked at a piece of rubble to change the direction of her fall. Two centipedes lanced past her, tearing into armor panels and the remaining decorations of mine that she'd tucked into the side of her belt. She stabbed one and jerked violently as it carried her up and back. Down was met with resistance, slowed, made floaty. There was something with heat or temperature manipulation in there too, but I wasn't dwelling on it. Up and away was faster, normal speed. I flew to her, and my way was barred by a loop of centipede. They fed into and through Mukade, their initial emergence or their passage through him giving them a speed that had to be in the order of a hundred miles an hour at the very least, but the moment they weren't being fed through, they became slower, just fifty or a hundred feet of razor edges and acid. Just. Acid. They were slower still while trying to return to their master to be fed through again. Foyle, using the centipede, carried her out of the line of fire, 
past the rooftop and away from the initial shots from those who'd been quick enough to bring guns to hand and open fire while the centipedes lunged. But now she was a good hundred feet in the air, the centipede not strong enough to hold her up on its own, so she sagged with every passing second. I tried to fly past, the wretch active, and found the centipede before me was quick to react, to form S-bends that caught me and caught the wretch, like flying into a net or web. They wrapped around, caught, and flooded the surface of the wretch with acid. My aura did nothing, as I pushed out full strength. I had to dismiss the wretch instead to slip through a gap, escaping. Acid splashed my boot and sent a shock of black horror through me. Foil hung from the length of one centipede, head turned away as acid ran down the gray-black slats and angular legs of the centipede itself, down its length to her glove and arm. I hesitated, and I hated myself for hesitating, so I threw myself forward the moment the hate registered. Thoughts of Crawler and my bath in acid vomit were dark in my mind as I raced through skies that were just as dark. Moisture in the air pelted me, each droplet a fresh shock of dark terror, because there were centipedes looming above me and there was no knowing if the moisture was precipitation or if it was something that would melt my flesh and scar me forever. Because, as bad as the scarring might end up being, as dire the situation... There was simply no fathomable reality where a parahuman would ever heal me. Moisture in my boot made me worry the acid had seeped through the material that I might feel the burning start. Once it did, there was a chance it might never stop. I flew past and I went without the wretch, because that adjustment made me a hair faster, a bit more precise in my maneuvering, and the wretch was too big when I needed to dive through a small space. Razor edges sliced at my arm in two places, cut at my belt in another without parting flesh, and my leg in a fourth spot. No healing if I lost an arm or suffered crippling pain. No healing if I lost a leg. I twisted in the air to let my breastplate take the brunt of the one centipede that was falling toward me, razor edges first, as much as they were doing anything. The impact was heavy, and the length of centipede circled beneath me, head swooping around as it tried to wind around my upper body. I flipped, heel over head, to be belly side down and put it beneath me, then flew forward to where foil dangled. A blade jutted from the toe of her shoe, and she was using it to cut one centipede's head off. I caught her, carrying us away from the centipede's reach before turning to assess the situation. Your mom, she said. I looked, I saw. Sveta had reached down, and was hauling the glowing sphere up and out of the rooftop, which had a whole chunk carved out of it. Cradle's line appeared, lancing up and out. I couldn't see enough of Sveta to make out if she'd been cut, but I saw the orb intersect the light. It sliced through the orb and broke the effect, leaving my mom tumbling through the air. Sveta caught her with tendrils. I couldn't stop and stare. He'd known we were up there somehow. It was why he'd told the group not to go to the roof so he could mount a surprise attack. Cradle had a sensor or a power. Rain, I said. Yeah, was Foyle's response. She adjusted her grip on me. I dove. There was no using the wretch to cut the force or chill of the wind while I carried Foyle. Sveta's face was barely visible above the roof as she lashed out, multiple tendrils stabbing down and into the space. Her entire body shifted as points she was using to anchor shifted around her. I saw what she was pulling away an attempt at grabbing Cradle. Failed, he repositioned. At two capes, she threw them into the air, then let them fall. The bed of orange motes and the associated floating effect kept it from being terminal. And Tattletail, plucked from Cradle's craft. Head, shoulder, and a bit of chest, hair pale and costume in disarray. Her other focus seemed to be on trying to do something about the craft, to try to mess with its aim, but she may not have been strong enough. 
I saw a bit of it moving through the gap, then through the upper windows. It was twisting around, rotating, the fingers out, and lashes swinging through the exterior wall of the building, aiming for rain. Jump! I shouted. I wasn't sure he could hear, but he threw himself back and away from the wall. The now invisible cable sliced through the wall, cleaving a line through the surface, and by the course it painted, it seemed oriented perfectly to intersect the falling rain. He stopped himself in the air, freezing in place. His costume rustled with the force of the cable moving through the space beneath him. One second. Two, he dropped again. Help, I said, as I flew foil and I into rain. I got a bad grip on the costume at his midsection. Foil, even with the awkward way I held her, managed a firm grip on his wrist. We descended, my flying angle too steep for a stop or swift turnaround. Metallic crunching and grinding marked the new complication of Red's power. She used it even though she couldn't see what she was using it on. Splashes of piston, gear, and belts rose up and out of the ground, bright with the white hot machinery and molten iron that was thrown out and around it, each splash larger than the last. One, two, three was a circular saw, big enough it could have risen up beneath an eighteen-wheeler and cleaved the truck in two. The spinning saw kicked up a violent mess of molten particles. Seeing the saw, Rain drew out a silver blade, now more of a silver short sword, no longer something he could throw. It wasn't something that was going to help. Foil's blade swatted several particles out of the air as they sailed our way, accurate even when I abruptly changed direction, so the blindly aimed saw blade wouldn't catch us if it bobbed any higher. The roller coaster feeling of flying became hard impact and gritty, cold, muddy reality as we hit ground. I couldn't fly with two people, and because the direction and orientation of my flight didn't really give me a chance to pull up or fly the direction we needed to go. It was rougher landing than I would have liked, one that saw us tumble to land on our backs or fronts, but not one that risked breaking anything. Everyone okay? I asked. Yes, Foyle said. Thank you. I'm in one piece, Rain said as he climbed to his feet. What the hell happened? Who fucked up? He got wind of us, I said. I started to stand, then fell hard as pain jumped up my leg. In the gloom, I started to reach for my leggings, and pain ran up my arm. I moved more gingerly, one eye on the building and the army I knew was in there a deeper cut in my leg that was starting to burn, a cut at my upper arm, shallow but long, from elbow to shoulder, another deeper cut at my forearm, short but grave enough that I could have buried a pinky along its length. No burning there. My boot had been bleached where the acid had struck, but it didn't look like the material had been eaten through. The damage was seemingly worse with my breastplate, with corrosion clearly evident, the metal cracking into what looked like scales flecking off. The front doors of the building weren't on a face that faced us, but were to our left, opening out in the direction of the road and where our group was. They swung open, an aperture I remembered was large enough to drive a truck through, and immediately our reinforcements acted. I saw the orbs as fleeting images shot at high speed, grown large and sailing in twos and threes to detonate on impact. They were shooting out of the tree line. Red's splashes appeared. I was too far away to do anything about them. One appeared a few dozen feet from the building, small but bright. Then the second was two-thirds of the way to the tree line. The third erupted, felling five or six trees all at once, tearing up the earth around them in a threshing of lawnmower-like blades writ large. It was pretty clearly telegraphed, but I wasn't sure if they knew enough to read into that telegraphing. My dad, at least, was okay. The glowing orbs returned, a fresh surge of fire that peppered the one face of the building. Our opportunity to get clear. I saw my mom get flung, much like the grenades were being flung in one direction, my mom was sent in the other. 
Sveta didn't follow, though. She was still at the building, still looming over the hole in the roof. I felt nervous seeing that. I heard the gunfire, automatic weapons firing in bursts, and I didn't see her getting out of the way. A part of me had been afraid that this was going to happen. It was always a danger for anyone who struggled like I'd struggled, like Sveta struggled every day. Escapism was common, and there was a seductive, ever-present desire to escape for good, in both senses of the word good, to go out with glory. One of the boys at the group therapy sessions at the hospital had talked about it a lot. I didn't get the impression Sveta was doing that, not consciously. Go, I told Rain and Foyle. Get to safety. You can't, Foyle said. She shouldn't, she can't, but too many guns. Had to. Had to like I'd had to risk an arm and leg, might still lose arm and leg, depending on how this acid worked, to save foil. Had to like Sveta was probably telling herself she had to do this. It wasn't a bullet I had to worry about. I was flying, thinking I was safe, when lines began to appear. Silvery but crisp, like slices in reality, reaching well over the building. Not meant for me, but dangerous all the same. I flew past one, and the wretch had a limb extended. I felt the wretch get sliced, felt the dim sensation that was the wretch's extended being part. The force field didn't collapse, it cut. A gaping hole in my force field now, where there had been a bit of torso and shoulder. I saw Sveta flinch in pain as one tendril passed through a line. Her head recoiled back and the rest of her reacted. Her head flicked up, nervous, reactionary, as she saw me. Tendrils snapped out, cracking almost like whips in their efforts to reach me. Calm down. Let me near. She didn't calm down, but she did shift her attention away from me. Again she bobbed her head, waved, and stabbed into the building with tendrils. They hit the floating space that was afire with the orange sparks, and it was like she'd hit cement, the tendrils corkscrewing as they hit a hard resistance. She forced them through, reaching. Sveta! Get away from here! Not without you, you numbskull! What are you trying to do? I'm trying to save them! Who? All of them! A severed tendril noticeable for its end point because it didn't taper down from pencil thin to hair thin, stabbed in the direction of the hand mech and the still half-formed, now double-layered orb of interlocked body parts. The mech was moving now, hands gripping a surface. Cradle was elbow deep in the guts of the machine, even while it moved, not jarring or jostling as the thing moved, reaching up to grab the damaged section of roof, pulling it down. Another volley of shots shot across the open field, striking the front face of the building. Something groaned, then fell, striking with a thud. I saw Cradle turn his head sharply to the one side. A hand let go of the roof, instead moving to form a shield. The next volley passed through the opening in the building, striking different points inside. Two grenades hit the flat of the giant mech hand, raised as a shield. He turned and he looked up at me. Sveta tried again. Again she hit the invisible momentum-cutting barrier, like punching a wall of mud. More silvery lines crisscrossed, filling the space. Silvery stitches, closing off the gap of the roof itself. Two capes had somehow closed the distance to the tree line. I could hear Ashley and Damsel's blasts, each audibly distinct because of what they were and I could see more trees toppling. Mukade's centipedes flowed back to him, sliding into the hole in his side. Back! Now! I shouted. She didn't budge, her attention on the progress of her tendrils. No options left. I threw myself into her range with the full knowledge that she'd nearly grabbed me before, and any control she'd picked up from Rain's power was probably long gone. She hadn't shied away from gunfire or having her tendrils sliced, but she shied away from letting me get into her range. Slow and awkward, 
her entire head lurching because she tried to use a tendril she didn't have anymore to anchor herself. I closed in, tendrils grazing me, and pressed her face to my shoulder as I flew the two of us back and away. Mukade's centipedes stabbed through the air behind us in a double helix, then closed up, the openings in the helix scissoring closed, razor-sharp serrated edges making a shrieking sound as they ran against one another, acid spraying and splashing below them. Sveta pulled away, and I threw up the wretch, hoping it wouldn't grab her, just as she, no doubt, hoped she wouldn't grab me. Red's power provided the elevator to raise a group of four capes and ten soldiers to the broken rooftop. She stepped away from the group, and had the splashes going constantly now, all in close proximity to herself. One, two, three, clockwise, while another set marked the same pattern and distance counterclockwise, timed so there was something emerging from the rooftop every two seconds or so, always in arm's reach. Pieces of metal to be shields, an outcropping of pipes that she could use to grab and wrench a weapon free, curved blades that scraped the roof as if testing the footing. Soldiers dropped low, raising their guns. The one closest to the trees seemed to throw himself at the guy beside him. Glass shards clattered down around him, and his head lolled back. Individual lengths of wire stabbed into eyes, eye socket, eyelid, scalp, and cheek, sometimes prying and pulling skin or ocular material away, because those wires were still trying to spring back to a rigid, straight length. The guy beside him had one wire stabbing through an eye. More of the soldiers were reacting now. I thought they'd dropped low or bent over because the guys at the far left of their group were leaning so heavily onto them from the force of the impact. But the other shot had gone low, much as the first had gone high, both striking simultaneously. Short lengths of wire riddled the hands that had been holding the guns aloft. Curled up wire distilled in glass spheres? Go to the others, I told Sveta. But they need you! Not the level-headed ideal command I'd pictured before. But Sveta listened. I threw myself at the upper edge of the building. The structure was damaged, cracks running through it from the damage to the roof and the way the damaged section hung, and a heavy impact from myself and the wretch drove the damage home. A crack became something bigger, and a section fell loose further across the roof. The people who had been setting up their vantage point to open fire on me, Sveta, or the people on the trees were now left uncertain if the roof would hold them. One guy hopped up onto the lip of the roof, a foot or two above my reaching hand. He was quick to fire, accurate enough to hit my force field. I grabbed his foot and wrenched him from the roof, swinging him down, letting him drop halfway while I followed him and held on to him, before kicking him in the face to send him on his way. The wretch snatched the gun he held, holding it by the barrel. I rose up and twisted more sharply in the air before dismissing the force field. The upward momentum served to toss the gun up, and I caught it in my hands. I didn't like the feel of it, didn't like what it represented, that we were at this point. I still held on to it. Red was using her power to raise up a shield against the projectiles, but her power didn't just make the eruption happen where she wanted. There were two steps that telegraphed it, and as people retreated to get away from the hail of maiming slingshots, they walked right into the prelude splashes. One fell from the roof, another tumbled, a soldier tripping over him to land perilously close to the hole in the roof. I flew up and over, saw the group that standed tallest, and red was the backbone of it. Gun in hand, held shoulder height and held sideways in front of me, I flew at them aiming to bowl them over. My arm was in agony for every step of the maneuver. All for nothing. A buzzsaw erupted just at the roof's edge, barring my way. I was forced to stop, stuck where I was while multiple people in her contingent got their bearings and aimed at me. Grip shifting, flying with the circular saw as a kind of cover, I brought the gun around and pulled back on the trigger. The vibration shook my body and reminded me that I had two massive gashes in my arm. 
Someone could have dug their fingers into the gashes and cuts, and it probably wouldn't have hurt so much. But I'd used guns before as part of the patrol. This time, however, I aimed at legs and lower bodies instead of paper cutouts. Their disorganization was compounded by the fact that they'd been under fire, some being mangled or blinded, and they were maneuvering around a damaged rooftop. It put more people into a smaller area. When I mowed into them with a single burst of gunfire, they collapsed into one another if they didn't collapse forward. Except Red had been shielded by the people between her and I, and I still had to deal with her. I saw the telltale splashes, and I got out of there. I thought I got out of there. I went low, closer to the base of the building, hugging the wall to minimize the chance that someone would be able to catch me off guard. I had the wretch active, and that likely saved my life. Red's industrial tool this time was a crane mount, spearing sky high and bringing cable and wrecking ball with it. That wrecking ball slammed into me and the wall I was hugging the wall below them that was holding their section of the roof up. Putting me through concrete and brick, partially indoors, I narrowly avoided having the cabling of the wrecking ball catch me and pull me into the ground as the whole apparatus sank back into the earth, just as fluidly as it had emerged. Red, it seemed, had hopped over onto a piston she was using as an elevator back toward the ground. More industrial tools were appearing to push broken concrete and dirt up against the walls, shoring them up as the building came to pieces. I didn't press the fight. It wasn't a priority. Our goal was stopping Cradle, and Cradle wasn't even here anymore. The siege was ongoing now. The grenade shots shook the building and people were hurrying outside. The momentum barrier was a one-way screen for them to open fire. I flew high, because low was hazardous as hell. Capricorn had used a water blast, and when that water hit the momentum barrier and stopped, he'd turned it to stone, turning the enemy's one-way fortification into something two-way. My dad peppered the outer edges of the stone splash with grenades, still somehow firing them like he was using a railgun, and the chunks that flew up and over were raining down on the mercenaries. But there were fifteen of us, minus any injured I wasn't aware of. There were more than a hundred of them. Just from the look of it, the grenade shots were coming from further back. Our team was steadily retreating. An audible wet sound was my only clue that I was under attack. In any other place, I might have dismissed the sound, but I was too high up for something to sound so sharp and near. I changed direction using the wretch. A geyser of vomit from the airborne barf bat. Chuggalog floated below, gas-filled trash bags buoying him. He was downwind and further down, which spared me the worst of the smell. Barf bat spewed another geyser, liquid and far too sustained for something from a human-sized package. When I flew out of the way, avoiding his attempts to steer the spray my way, weaving below and then back, so gravity kept it from reaching me, he shifted modes. The ring of fluid-filled sacks around his neck contracted, then swelled, chunky. A loogie shot like a bullet. I had too much experience with aerial warfare to allow something like that to hit me. I monitored them, keeping a distance while moving in the general direction of my team. I didn't want to lead him to them, and I definitely didn't want to put myself in a position where I had to choose between getting splashed, even if it was the wretch getting splashed, or letting my people on the ground suffer. They stayed on me, keeping me marked, no doubt ready to capitalize if I left them to it. If they reached a point where they could bombard the others... Barfbat settled on Chugalug, and the weight of him seemed to sink Chugalug, driving him incrementally down, down, down. Bending over, Barfbat shifted glands again, then emptied a seemingly endless stream of bile and vomit into Chugalug's upturned face and open mouth. Trash bags multiplied and swelled. A caterpillar-like tail extended out behind and below. Other debris, like a halo of chicken bones and stringy matter, expanded out around and behind Chugalug. 
I aimed the rifle the wretch had claimed from one soldier, and I fired, gunning through the trash bags. My first series of shots popped the ones to either side and below him. He began to drop, not as steeply as if he had nothing. No doubt some gas buoyed him. And Barfbat was still there, still in place, still ready to supply raw material. The bags I'd shot were replaced, and the abominable dirigible that was Chuggalug found its buoyancy again. I shot again, aware I only had so many bullets. This time I aimed for bags on the one side. He listed, then he tilted, forcing Barfbat to adjust position to get the vomit where it needed to be. With sustained effort in forcing the tilt, I put Chuggalug nearly upside down and sinking fast. Barfbat paused in his supply of the fluid, made a face, then spat at me. Not a loogie the size of my head, but something more like a piece of bone. I avoided it. Stand down or I will shoot you. He lunged instead. Chuggalug extended a portion of his body to provide a helping hand in moving forward, and Barfbat moved his wings, a flap, then an almost horizontal dive or pounce straight for me. I shot one bullet, and that was enough to keep Barfbat from tackling me and getting in close, whatever it was he planned on doing if he managed it. His wings spread and he flapped, while Chuggalug slowly sank below him. The bullet had made a surprisingly big hole, but that hole was steadily closing, filling up with fluid-filled pustules. What was left as it finished closing was a small patch of what could have been the Black Death. Bat-masked face was ringed with long black hair and a wreath of fluid-filled sacks. He flapped, eyeing me, before diving for Chuggalug. I was really glad I didn't have to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat with either of them. Fucking gross. The others were running for it, down the road. I could see Cradle's group, and I could see that it was disorganized. There were stragglers, the impatient soldier from before among them. There were wounded, there were the reluctant, who didn't seem eager to go charging in after trouble, and there were the ones who were giving chase. Cradle was with the reluctant, still slightly hunched over, far from being a model of courage or conviction. There were just so fucking many of them. I turned my back, flying after the others. They were nipping at our heels, and as our group traced its way down a bend of road, they were at the prior bend, just far enough away that they probably couldn't be confident of their shooting, but still in a position to theoretically gun one of our people down. I could see where and when Rain was using his power, where people in the lead stopped in their tracks or the loose mass of mercenaries started to spread out and then had second thoughts. Capricorn's power turned dirt road into mud. Mud became stone, trapping more than a few people. At the next bend, again, dirt road became a slosh of thin mud, the road itself made treacherous or slower going. This time, however, he didn't follow it up by turning it to stone. I flew after them, catching up. They were on guard and tense enough that my landing seemed to spook even the more serious ones. Swansong and Foyle were among them. You're hurt, my dad observed. Yeah, I said. Come here, he said. I can multitask. No stitches in this light, but I can wrap it. I can hold things. Moose offered, walking beside my dad. I submitted to the medical care. I tracked the others. Harbingers one and two were out to the flanks, not seeming to care about the possibility of traps in the ditches. Foyle and Capricorn had the rear, Foyle sporting a borrowed slingshot. My mom and Sveta were on opposite corners of the group. Rachel had the lead, where she rode her wolf alongside the hound that had an injured Chastity and Cassie seated on it. Ow! And most pressing, most distracting, my arm and leg fucking hurt. Fuck and ow! Distract me, I said. We got two of their capes, Swansong said. I got two, Damsel retorted. We did. I did, Damsel said. Final blow's all that matters. 
Swansong didn't rebut. He caught on, Rain said, spotted us. No idea what his emotion power is? I asked. Rain shook his head. I don't think he's been using. He's still focused on his machine, upgrading it on the fly. I drew in air through my teeth. He's hanging back, Rain said, letting others do the dirty work. The asshole. He might think he's putting us in a pinch, my dad said. Depending on how things stood with the people in the row, the supervillain town just outside the station, he would be right. There, that'll hold. I checked the injuries at my arm. Leg? I floated up until my leg was at a comfortable level for him. Ow, Moose said. Less commentary. I'm trying not to think about it. Worse than any injury I've ever had, he said. My mind went to the gouges at one corner of his face. A mistake in using the wretch. Any different and I might have dislocated his jaw. Less commentary, I said, my voice firm. That was you, working with my dad? He made a flicking motion with his finger. The shock wave followed, focused and narrow. Right. You okay, Svet? I asked, pitching my voice to be heard. You got cut. I wanted to get the whip, Sveta said. So far away she was barely in earshot. Her movements were... not a limp, but not so fluid that it looked like her face was floating. Here and there it would sharply bob or move. That's what you were after? He had devices with him. I thought if I couldn't get him, I could get his things. Give it to Rain to undo it or decipher it. Not sure I could if you did, Rain said, because I don't accomplish anything, ever. There was a bitterness in the voice that seemed to surprise a few of us. That doesn't sound like you, Byron said. Me being a loser? Rain asked. I could have cracked them and I didn't. I got cold feet when it counted. You did fine, I said. Don't fucking patronize me, he said. Okay, wow. I flew over. They're spread out. People you were working on aren't budging. That's easily twenty or thirty people we're not having to deal with. Because we beat their capes up, I'm betting, Rain said. They don't have anyone to follow. Because you worked on them, I said, insistent. They're disorganized, and I don't think Cradle's good at rallying them. It's slowing him down, shaking him up. He's still all the way back there. Yeah? Isn't that exactly the opposite of what we want? Rain asked. We want to not deal with them all at once. We got that. It wasn't pretty, but we got it. We have options. I feel like, no matter how this ended up, you'd be giving me the weak pep talk. Well, fuck you, I said. Victoria, my mom said, be a leader. Fuck you too, I said. No, fucking hell, fuck that. You haven't been helpful or a leader. I got gashed a few times, and I'm sore, I'm tired. I'm not going to play nice and stoic team leader here, being everyone's rock or punching bag. I can take over if you're not up to it, Damsel said. Stop, I said, pointing a finger at her. Stop. Precipice, fuck off if you're not going to listen to what I'm saying because you're so frustrated, okay? Seriously, I'm not going to lie to the people here about where things stand to spare your ego. Not when it could make a difference in tactics or us coming out of this in as many pieces as possible. I respect you more than you probably think I do, but I'm not that fond of you. Right, he said, his voice tight. Swansong, stop needling your sister. Damsel, stop being needled. Focus on kicking ass. I know you two have it in you. Two of us took out three capes. I'm content, Swansong said. One and six-sevenths of you, one of the harbingers said. Not funny, Swansong said. I pointed. Harbingers, stop blinding and permanently disfiguring randoms. That's an order. Noted. No disfigurements or maiming that lasts 99% of a lifetime either, Swansong said. Hmm. Is that an order? Harbinger 2 asked. Yes, I said. 
Nothing that takes more than a month to heal, Swansong clarified. What she said, I said. My dad patted my leg at a spot where it wasn't injured. I checked, then floated down at more of a level with the rest, mouthing a thank you to him. I got a nod. That will be an interesting line to find, since there's a flyer after us, Harbinger One said, pointing. Barf bat. Can we? he asked. We'll bring him down gently. I shut my eyes for a second. Don't be gentle. He tilted his head to one side. He regenerates. Healed a bullet wound in five seconds. It'll take more to stop him. The harbinger pair ducked away, heading across the ditch to a hill where presumably they'd do their shooting. My voice was low. Brandish? Stop sniping. Stop throwing barbs. Stop getting jealous. Whatever it is that's motivating you. I'm volunteering my services and I get lectured, she asks, voice arch. Fuck off, I said with emphasis. I glared at her and she looked away. I turned my attention the other direction, to the front flank of the group. Sveta, time to yell at me? If I say to get clear, listen. I don't want to have to kamikaze rush you to get you out of terminal danger. Okay, she said. Good control earlier. Good job getting people clear. You got Tattletail? I have her, Rachel said. Loud and brusque at the same time, Sveta meekly said. I did. How is she? Hurt, was Tattletail's faint voice. Hurt, Rachel said. Okay, I said. The settlement was in sight now. I checked back. No barf bat, and harbingers were returning to our group. Cradle's group lagged behind. I could see the light of flashlights through the trees, but no followers. Byron's lights loomed well behind us, ready to spray them and the road if they tried to take the easy road. Capricorn, you stopped switching. My brother asked me not to, unless it was an emergency. Pain's getting to be too much to focus, and he's worried he'll pass out. Got it, I said. Too many little things. There were probably other things I needed to hammer out, probably things that others needed to shout at me. Speaking of focus, I'm worried about Precipice, Byron said. Me? He's not acting like himself. I'm fine. You're using more emotion power than ever. Is there a feedback loop, a backlash for overuse? I don't know how these things work. No, was the reedy answer, tattletale. I flew through the group to the head of the pack. No? I asked. I need more information to give you a better answer, but not a backlash. That would taper off after using the power even a little. This is longer lasting. I glanced back at Rain. There was something wrong? Because we woke him up early? From? Tattletail asked. Our dream space, Rain said where we face each other. They exchange tokens they don't usually share with me. Except this time, Cradle offered me some, his tinker power, and I was suspicious. Too many weird things going on. I thought maybe it was a trap. Twas, Tattletail said, the contraction a result of her being so strained in her speaking. Not like you think. I think it might have been that tinkers get distracted or caught up in what they're wanting to build. They don't see reality. The asshole wanted to give me a lot at once, when I'm not used to it. No. Then what? Rain asked, clearly annoyed. You took something else. I was... I think I might have been given some without knowing, by love lost. You were. It was a signal, a warning. About what? Bleed through. It comes with the tokens. Cradle wanted to give you his... As impatient and vocal as he had been, Rain went quiet, thinking. This is my head, Chastity said, and I couldn't see the motion she was making because of how she sat in front of Cassie. And this is the fifty things going about a mile above it. He's scared now, Tattletail said, shaken, because you gave him tokens? No, Rain said. You got to him. 
hitting him with a shame and regret cloud while he was sleeping, Rain said. You got to him. He's scared. He knows that tomorrow night you can just give him your things. You can do it every night. He has to stop you. You have the upper hand. He has more people, but you're winning. I folded my arms. Then we have a game plan. We go to into the town. They're cooperating with us to some degree. If they're on our side, then Cradle probably can't attack like he wants to. We find an angle. Maybe keep using Precipice's power, push buttons, make it so their group can't stay together. I looked at Rain. I saw him nod. Delayed, like he'd had to think first, or he was lost in thought. And if we absolutely have to, if the town isn't willing to let us use them to scare Cradle off, we go through and we lock the door. Stop March, intervene, do what we have to. Lock it? Foyle asked. I shrugged, then winced at the pain in my upper arm. It wouldn't be pretty, but it was an option. Doable, Capricorn said. Psychologically, even if I didn't trust Tattletail 100%, hearing that Cradle was spooked was a psychological edge. It shifted things, how I felt like we could approach them. We still needed to get him into a position where we could question him, away from his people. Except he had a mover power now that let him get out of any situation we put him in. Gravity and intervening obstacles didn't seem to matter. Getting him into a position where we could exploit him seemed next to impossible. Glory Hall, Tattletail muttered. There wasn't any ongoing conversation, and the only noise was the distant slosh of Capricorn's water swamping the road and trees. The words hung in the air, and I was tempted to leave them there. Wanted to say, she started. What? I asked. This sucks. This hurts. Fair's fair. If you want to lord it over me, you can. Lord it over her? That she was hurt? I couldn't even connect to what she meant until I remembered past jabs at my time in the hospital. I shook my head. Focus on the mission. The kids are hurt, our teammates. She went silent. Rachel, meanwhile, turned my way and glared at me. Tattletail hadn't known? How, with that power of hers? I looked away. It was a careful, uneasy approach to the Rose, a settlement without real streets, sprawling out at the base of a station that was far better put together than any dwelling. We had some people hang back to watch our rear while others ventured further in. The wounded stayed three-quarters of the way back, somewhat hidden. A show of strength was somewhat important. The villains of note were all gathered around the station exit, about a city block ahead of us. Etna, I noted, was absent. They looked agitated. We were agitated. The mercenaries were there, following from enough of a distance that we couldn't shoot or use slingshots. You can lock the doors, you said? Tattletail asked. I turned back to face her. What do you mean? I asked Tattletail. You can lock the doors. You have a dimension switch. Whatever it's called, yeah. You let the villains know about that? Yeah. Scared them into compliance a bit. Conscience brought us the rest of the way. Cassie pulled the switch out, keeping it partially under the blanket. I saw her expression change. I flew over while she turned the thing around to show me. Swansong and Capricorn drew near to see as well. They might not be so compliant, then, Tattletail said behind us. The screen was outlined in yellow, and the readout only said, Error. I looked back at the villains at the station, Blue Stockings group. They didn't just look agitated. They looked energized, invigorated. The person who'd just come out of the station, that had gone to whisper something in Blue Stockings' ear, that had very possibly, even probably, been to let Bluestocking know the portal was clear. The way out was back. Because of Cradle. How? Capricorn asked. Scans the airwaves to see if you have walkie-talkies, comms, phones, any means of communication, Tattletail said, and finds that. Your key. Hacks it. 
That was part of what he'd been up to. Opening the door, taking away our leverage, leaving us caught between him and villains that weren't depending on us for a way out. Fucking tinkers, Tattletail added. Arc 12, Heavens, Chapter 8 The settlement of scattered, disorganized buildings didn't look like it had been laid out with roads in mind, and it took on the appearance of being a town on fire well before any fire had ignited. The motes of Subside's power marked the loose boundaries of where it was being set up. Sparks and dots of red light. Soldiers stepped out of the trees, starting with Subside's squad, built around Subside himself, but led primarily by a large guy with three guns hanging off of him. The squads to either side emerged a bit later, after minimal conversation. The show of force wasn't for our benefit. All of the people of the rows of Earth and Base Town were out of their beds, paying clear attention now. Their number included the people who had been on guard earlier, who had apparently retired from being on guard, and people who hadn't stopped keeping an eye on things, sitting on porches or going on extended walks. The blue motes of Capricorn's power were our own answer, for what that was worth. As glad as I was to know we had something, the color of the lights cut into my eyes' ability to peer through the dark. The bright blue left spots in my vision and trails that persisted even when I looked away. The air was thick with the smell of mud, rain, and the haze of cigarette smoke that seemed to settle over a place when most of a town was left out in the cold, keeping an eye out for their mutual benefit. That mutual benefit had been something we'd tested and cracked by applying pressure to blue stocking with Prancer's help. Now, Moose was approaching Prancer, who had stuck closer to Bluestocking, and they were comparing notes. No Etna in Bluestocking's retinue, I noted. The people in the town weren't making a fuss about us backing up and using one of the buildings for cover. There weren't any better options. If we ran for it, we'd be gunned down. If we stayed and Bluestocking decided to side with Cradle's group again, we'd be in the midst of trouble with more trouble coming from Cradle's group. He's the lead-from-behind type, Swansong said. Cradle was moving through the trees with his mech, shaking them. Slivers of the mech were visible where the trees weren't as thick or where some had been felled a certain distance into the woods. Couldn't be easy terrain, especially with something as large and weird in shape as the mech. Because he knows we'd shoot him if he led from the front, Foyle answered. I might be able to hit him. Shoot through the repulsion field, but I might miss. I could help, Harbinger One said, sidling in close enough that he was in Foyle's personal space. Damsel stuck out a claw, touching his shoulder and prodding him back. Can you guarantee a hit? Foyle asked. No, can't see enough of him, and it's too dark. I have the same problem, so it's not much help. Don't shoot if you can't keep him alive. We need him to undo what he did to others. Assuming that's even possible, it has to be possible. And to give us the dirt on March. If you're trigger happy, you could shoot, Tattletail started. She paused one second, started again, voice quiet, and the lower undertones of Moose's voice, even though he wasn't technically in earshot, were enough to drown out the initial sounds. She started again. Woman in red. Miosha, all capitals. Machinery explosions, I said. Dangerous. Yes, or one on the far left, ox skull, prong. Don't know him, I said, noting the soldier with an ox skull mask that looked like it obscured his peripheral vision with the way the skull and his own eyes lined up. He wore a heavy coat over what might have been body armor, bulky Kevlar, not fancy costume armor panels. Point? Tattletail smirked, the smirk faltering as she took in a halting, probably painful breath. For me. 
I was annoyed at that, but I let it slide. What does he do, then? Brute tough, but you can wear that down. Or use foil's power and ignore it. Wanted to hire him once, he said no, he was busy, so fuck him. The... She stopped. Her face was shiny with sweat. Rachel brushed a mittened hand over her upper face to move the hair away. Not really as delicate in the operation as I imagined 99% of the population would be. The shtick is, you mess with the bull, you get the horns. Curved spikes of light. Spear you like a... like a spear. And carry you back and away. Impales you to a wall with one spike, then stabs you ten times with the other. Or he just pushes you back out and away. Extends the spikes out past the horizon. Endless range? I asked. Twenty-five feet, but once he gets you, it's endless. Cretan and Lionwing are there, but they aren't stepping up. Tattletail observed. They're sticking close to Cradle. Closer relationship. They're actually loyal. The conversation between Moose and Prancer was wrapping up. The pair broke apart, but instead of Moose returning to us and Prancer going to the station where Blue Stockings Group was maintaining watch, it was the other way around. Fifteen of us and three dogs were gathered, and all were silent, but for the labored breathing from Tattletail. Blue Stocking hoped you'd resolve the issue in the background, come back and go away. Not bring it to her literal doorstep, Prancer said. Her house? Tattletail asked, jerking her head. The one we were camped out by. Prancer gave her a long look. In the gloom, his eyes seemed bright, his attention clearly on the gravity of Tattletail's injury. Bad. Forget, forget I asked, Tattletail said. She'll help, Prancer said. She wants concessions. Concessions? I asked. We've fucking sailed past the place where the line used to be drawn, where people put their shit aside because fuck no. She'll help, Prancer said, voice firm. But if you don't want some asshole villain pulling a mutiny and taking over, giving you a repeat performance of all of this in a few months or a year, she needs to give her people something. You need to give her something to give her people. Money? No. Special status for the Rose. You do what you can do to convince the mayor, make sacrifices, pull favors, whatever. Mayor knows what we've been asking for. We know, Harbinger One said. It's come up. All of the benefits of being part of the city and none of the costs. Open trade, loosened restrictions on goods despite being an alternate world with health risks and quarantine... No taxes, but access to the library net. It's a hard sell. Thank you, I said. Context. Tattletail gasped out a response. Establishes her place on the short list of people who control economy. Second rung. My mom folded her arms, leaning in close to whisper something to my dad. I knew her well enough to guess what. In fact, on thinking about what she was probably saying, I could extrapolate. She loathed giving the villains what they wanted. If we couldn't stop them, we could keep them from scoring a win. I knew why that idea had rung so true, and why it had been something she'd clung to and repeated more often in recent years. She'd watched us give our hometown to villains, inch by inch. The perceived idea the Protectorate and wards have given Lung territory because he was too dangerous to uproot, and that heroes had conceded it to the Undersiders because she'd given a villain what he wanted and expected once, and took a child into her home, and that home had been sundered. "'What happens if we can't convince the mayor?' Swansong asked. "'Penalty clause,' Prancer said. Two members of Breakthrough join Blue Stocking. They're at her beck and call. People get to see it. Six month Gunfire cut him off. "'Foil,' I said. "'Harbingers.' Get Miosha and Prong. The Harbingers approached one corner of the building. Foil went to the other, jostling Rain aside, borrowed slingshot in hand. Tried to stir them up, Rain said, rejoining us now that Foil had taken his place. Got two groups hanging back. One's backed up to go talk to Cradle. Which? Tattletail asked. Chugalug and a guy with a white hood, sword, roby sort of look. Second guy went. Condemner, Tattletail said. Not hanging back. 
He's a thinker and sound blaster, can communicate messages. He's listening in, communicating something between Cradle and Blue. You'll want to stop him. I want to stop all of them. Well, fucking great, Rain said. He visibly stopped himself, visibly forcing himself to relax. Capricorn set a scale mail glove on his shoulder. The noises of the fighting were escalating. What had been an initial spatter of gunfire was being answered. What do I tell Blue? Prancer asked. Yes or no? Tell her if she accepts some leeway, gets maybe one of us on loan as a penalty clause, fine, I'll try to make it happen. Also, tell her I said fuck her, not... An eruption of Miosha's power sent debris flying. Most of that debris was paper thin, but it stirred into the air. Prancer was adopting his breaker form. He nodded, and he ducked low as he slipped around the corner, sliding beneath the raised platform, too small to be a porch, by one front door. He sprung up on the other side, hurdling a vehicle, heading to the station. Byron's power produced a flood of water. I wasn't in a position to see, my back to the wall and everything that was going on, more of my attention on the station, but I saw the constellation change, dots and lines becoming flowing water, I felt the fine mist of droplets that wind or clashing sprays of water sent into the air, and I heard the moment that all gunfire momentarily ceased. I shot her in the leg, Foyle reported, but her people gathered around her. I'd shoot them, but... But the answering gunfire was more persistent than a slingshot could be. She doesn't need to see where she's creating the machine splashes, I said. There's a chance she tries hitting us. Not until there's a final word from Blue which might be now, I said, we move. An order, and one people thankfully listened to without bickering or issue. Brand, my dad said, voice low. Kick up some dust. Catch and toss. My mom nodded, backing up. Foyle was pulling back because the bullets were too heavy. My mom ducked beneath the firing line of Foyle's slingshot as Foyle aimed at the center of the building. Her power wasn't Shadow Stalkers from back in Brockton Bay. It went through everything, yes. Shadow Stalker could do something similar, but it left a hole where Shadow Stalkers hadn't. One shot, then two. It created an aperture with the same diameter as the bullet. I could understand why Foyle would be reluctant to put holes that big in something she was using for cover, especially with the concentration of gunfire. I handed her the gun I'd taken. I saw the moment of reservation, knew exactly what she was thinking, but she took the weapon. My dad created glowing orbs. He threw one to my mother, tossing another around the corner. My mother caught and threw the orb, tossing it around her corner. They were heavy detonations, pitched to cut into the earth, to kick up dirt, dust, and moisture, a shower of mud and moisture. Visual cover, but when it came to the bullets, there were too many. I didn't trust the wretch, and I had the impression the dogs would just get gunned down. The front landing that Prancer had gone under. A three-foot-by-three-foot three square of wooden boards with perforated metal textured for walking laid over top. I had to step out into danger to get to it, though. I made use of the cover, and I flew low enough to the ground that the wretch cut grooves into the ground, my own cloud of kicked-up mud and ice followed behind me. A bullet clipped the wretch, striking the very same hand that Cradle's power had clipped. Much like my mom's ball had been cut and then was intact after the fact, my own power had recovered when it had been knocked out and turned back on. But I was left momentarily exposed, my back to the enemy, nearly blind in the loose rain of flecks of mud. I flew to the underside of the square-shaped porch, my back hugging it, and the moment the wretch returned, I used her to haul it up and away from the wall. It was connected well enough that one plank was left affixed to the base of the door. The rest came apart in more or less one piece. A shield, impractical in dimension, but it was a way to shield others just a bit more reliably than the wretch could. Tenor of the fight changed. Tattletail was saying, back at the main group. Someone accepted someone's deal. Had it? I'd been busy with property damage. I flew to position where I could guard the others, head ducked down, 
wretch clinging to my shield that had to weigh a hundred and fifty pounds. I felt the first bullets strike it, impacts harder than the swing of a baseball bat, but diffuse enough it didn't crack the wretch. I knew I was buying seconds, because the wretch was digging into the cracks between the thick boards and the posts that framed it, crushing and stabbing into metal. People used the dogs, far too many hanging onto the side or riding on top, heads ducked low. I flew up higher to shield better. My mom was one of the last to make a break for new cover. She took running footsteps, then turned into the ball shape, just a little under waist height, an orange-red hue in bright color that seemed dissonant for the environment, like neon signage in woodlands. Something exploded, smaller than a grenade, more focused. It interrupted the rolling. She stopped dead in her tracks, sitting in the midst of exposed road. Not something I was unfamiliar with. I flew to her, ready to kick her, but in the last second she changed back. With only the imperfect cover of my shield protecting her, she ran to the others, putting us further from the woman I'd mentally nicknamed Red, Miosha, who was presumably immobile. Bluestocking's group was out. Birdbrain, Crested, some underlings, and then the pairing of Bitter Pill and Bluestocking. Tattletail said something. I didn't catch it, given distance and how quiet her voice was. Miosha hit one of the buildings closest to the tree line. I could see people cast into the air, flipping heads over heels, amidst the pieces of wood, the prefab segments of houses that had been fit together, and chunks of concrete. A giant iron container of what looked like molten metal was at the center of it all, and that container tipped as it sloped back into the ground. Where the molten liquid touched puddles and condensation, it exploded, sending sparks flying, the resulting reaction so bright it could have been a flashbang, the crackling and fizzling deafening. I heard a grunt of pain. Who? I heard, in a voice that could only be Ashley's, imperious, accusatory. Saving your life, my mom shouted back. There was a detonation, one of my dad's grenades. Victoria, my dad said, in a very dad voice. To me! I flew to the sound of his voice, even while the entire world seemed to dissolve into a blinding white that made the backs of my eyes and the front of my brain hurt. He touched me, grabbing me by the shoulders, and turned me forward. Force field on! I had to pull out of his grip, moving to a place I had to hope was safe and out of the reach of the others before I used my force field. Blue stocking attacked us, my mom said. One arm shielding my eyes, I could see the white fading, and every line and shadow that returned to the world brought a lot of pain with it. The others were down. Swansong and Damsel pushed into the dirt, Capricorn standing in front of rain, and it was my parents who stood tall with eyes open in the glare. The little benefits of powers, like Byron's cold resistance and my relative resilience to emotion powers, I could see the general silhouette of the station and of the people on the landing, dark shapes against a dark background, my vision filled with afterimages and spots, with Capricorn's lines and subsides sparks, and the fallout that was cascading down around the entire town from Miosha's liquid metal spill. Watch out, my father called out. I felt the wretch go down, and I had no idea why. I lost the strength I needed to hold up the shield and protect my back from distant munitions. I wasn't even positive it would matter. Do I move? I asked. No, my mom ordered. My dad gave the opposite response. Charge in! Hit them before— No! was another voice in the jumble. There were shouts, questions, most from people who couldn't see much better than I could. Get your mom in there! Charge in yourself! They're using powers! I could see the glow of my dad's grenades forming in his hands. I saw my mother's silhouette as she caught the grenades she was handed, the glow as she became a ball again. No! Again, I heard the voice. It stood out from imperious words, complaints, and questions because it was meek. No, not meek. Don't throw! I ordered my dad. Something heavy hit the wall of the new house we were using for cover from the massed soldiers and capes in Cradle's contingent, striking above heads and sending debris down onto Chastity, Cassie, and the Harbingers. Chunks of concrete larger than a fist 
one chunk even larger than that. Why not, Tattletail? Rachel, can you hear what she's saying? It's not an attack, Rachel translated, voice tight. It feels like being attacked. Water? Byron asked. Tattletail says no, Rachel translated. Clarify, I shouted. Something hit me again. The wretch went down. Another chunk of concrete, this time aimed my way. Again I lost my strength, my feet hitting ground, my entire body, strained and tortured as it was, bearing the full weight of the posts, planks, and textured cover of the metal. Hostage, Rachel huffed. Paris! I was already flying before she added the second half of her statement, abandoning my shield, because it was too unwieldy for a dangerous situation. I flew closer to the group, to my parents. It was Paris and Thud backing the rest of Bluestocking's group, with Thud hurling rocks and Paris throwing his darts with Thud's hand pointing over Bluestocking's shoulder. Men were hunkered down on either side. But Tattletail had been right. This was a hostage situation, and Thud had one hand at the back of Bluestocking's neck. Paris had a dart held like a knife at Bitter Pill's back. Thud could see despite the residual glare, and he had some sense that I was nearby. A glass ball shattered in Thud's eye socket, and in that moment his eye sockets were riddled with uncoiling wires and glass fragments. He didn't seem to mind much, but the scenario bought me a moment to act. I dove, saw him bring his finger to his eye to pry the wires free, and I changed direction mid-flight. A twist in the air, leg out, wretch out. I slammed my foot into his hand with all the strength I could bring to bear, using flight and rotation in the air. In the process, I slammed finger into eye socket, all the way up to the base of the finger where it met the hand. It got him to let go of blue stocking. Paris had taken a simultaneous shot, but the shot had missed the eye, catching brow, temple, and the ear, wires mangling flesh. I acted before he could get his composure together enough to lunge forward and drive the dart of disintegration into bitter pills back. Wretch strong, I hit him full in the chest with my arm that didn't have deep cuts in it. Sternum and ribs shattered in my hand. He was laid flat, obviously enough. I saw him flounder, trying to sit up, immediately and intensely failing, small sounds escaping his mouth. In his floundering, he created a dart, larger than any I'd seen him make. I had to wonder if it was reflex, while he was stunned with pain, or if the expression of power was an automatic thing. In addition to the principle of stronger powers in times of appropriate kinds of stress, there was a tendency for powers to unlock additional capabilities if the situation was dire enough. Not second triggers, but adaptations to changes in the host's core physical or mental state. The wretch, I had to assume, was that. Either way, I stomped on his forearm. There was a chance it was innocent, but I didn't have any more tolerance for chances. Give me one more excuse and I end you, I told Paris. He went limp. His breaths were wheezes. You'd better hope this situation you've fucked with doesn't take too long or... A distant cry. A warning from a parent or teammate. I saw the heads of Birdbrain and Crested turn. Crested flicked out a sharp knife and it became a fan, the fan extending, extending, layer by layer, until one corner of the quarter circle barrier bit into the station platform, the other corner into the pillar behind Paris. Thud's fist slammed hard into the metal, denting it a matter of a foot from where my face was. The dent didn't touch me, but the impact did, a punch as heavy as any I'd taken directly, catching me while I wasn't relying on the wretch due to my proximity to Crested and Crested shielding me. I felt pain rock through me, whole body, every wound I had amplified, and a sharper pain marked my head hitting the ground. I heard Crested fall, his barrier collapsing, saw a glimpse of what might have been the three bees, blue stocking, bird brain, and bitter pill falling over. Thud fucking indeed. My thoughts weren't lined up exactly right as I tried to pull myself together. 
I flew back, and an uncharacteristic bout of motion sickness nearly sank me. But Thud was lifting up a foot to stomp on me like I'd done to Paris. I flew up, and even that movement wasn't without its wobble. The impact of the stomp rippled out, kicking up just about every loose particle on the station platform, on the ground beyond the platform, and everything around my team, who were still huddled together. They all fell, sprawling. Thud didn't bleed, but there was a hole where his eye was supposed to be, and his expression, frozen in ceramic, was twisted around the edges, his face unchanging, the slimy fibers that connected the ceramic-like plates more tense and strained than I'd seen them. He was distracted, at least for a moment, by Paris's cry of pain. The stomp had jostled him, and he wasn't in a state to be jostled. I had help coming now, and Birdbrain was backing up, gun leveled at thud. Her shots weren't aimed at killing, but at disabling. Three out of the four hit the meaty flesh between ceramic plates. He didn't slow down. He lunged forward, and it was a weird lunge. A fast initial movement, yes, but the fast didn't taper off. He ran over Bluestocking's group, clotheslining them and possibly breaking a collarbone shoulder or two. I flew at him, kicking. He was keeping an eye out for me, though, and turned, arm moving to strike my leg aside. I tucked it in, knees close to my chest, and avoided him instead. The way he moved... That was a precise turn for a guy moving a lot of weight, a precise movement of the arm, stopping just where he needed it. Kinetic extension. Every impact or movement carried maybe exactly as far as he wanted it. Every hit, kick, they involved shock waves, either directed or rippling out. It exaggerated how he carried himself. He chased me with those abrupt movements that saw him almost sliding into me, a train or truck that needed only acceleration, his ability providing him the means to accelerate through it. I did what I could to keep him distracted and occupied, and used Paris's body as a means to limit his movements. He stopped short of trampling Paris, and seemed upset that he had to. Others were coming to help, Damsel and Swansong, their powers flaring. Chastity followed. Damsel and Swansong didn't move in coordination, but more out of a kind of competition, each trying to outdo the others, to move further, faster, and more frenetically. They zigzagged across each other's paths to cut one another off, and somehow they were more scary in this than they'd been as two wolves in a pack on their hunt, as I'd seen briefly just a little while ago. My goal was keeping him from trampling the local villains. Blue! I shouted as I threw myself forward, slamming my elbow into his shoulder. You're going to give me some serious slack on that deal we're striking. We were in danger because we agreed, Bluestocking shouted back. Part of the deal. Thud backhanded me and the wretch hard enough to send us rocketing at a downward angle. Flight kept me from hitting the ground as I steered up in time, but it didn't keep me from colliding with the wall. I could have charged in, but the reinforcements were here. Damsel went high, Swansong went low, her peg leg skidding on the concrete as her blast carried her forward. She reached ahead, and Thud slid backward, to where Damsel was, and to where Chastity was now running up to the base of the stairs. He clapped, the sound sharp, harder and sharper because of the composition of his hands. His power carried the shock wave out, impacting me the Ashleys, Chastity, Blue Stockings group, and just about everyone that was defending the settlement, from my team to the sketchy local citizens that had taken up arms. We all doubled over, wincing. While people reeled, he stomped his way toward Chastity, his stomps rattling the area. Swansong lunged, Damsel using her power in the same moment. The lunge wasn't as effective as it could be, as her peg foot skidded on the material of the portal station platform, but she compensated for it by moving her hands down, sending herself higher up. There was a moment where she was airborne, but not using her blast, high enough up that she stood to hurt herself on landing. I went low, taking the cue I'd observed earlier. Wretch strength and bulk let me crash into his legs and actually move them. 
Crested did what he could, which was absolutely the wrong thing, because Crested created a shield to limit Thud's movements. Knife became a convex barrier, and Thud hit the barrier. The shockwave, in turn, hit all of us. Etna and Crested had to have gone to fuck up Academy for villains. Letting them out of the prison cell had to be the biggest mistake I'd made. Hey, Damsel barked, voice pitched to be heard. Big guy! He turned to look at her. Her blast had been to carry her along the concrete pad that the fancier station building rested on, and her destination had been Paris. Now she held pointed fingers to Paris's throat. Thud paused. It looked for a moment like he intended to fight on, pressing forward even though he had a hostage. Then he relaxed. Another shot struck his intact eye. This one didn't catch the eye socket and send metal wire out in the other external bits. It simply sank in, then detonated. He screamed, his mouth remaining frozen where it was while the slick, yellow-green muscle fibers across his neck and shoulders parted, the gaps vibrating with the passage of the sound from within him. I'd taken one eye. Was that somehow licensed to the Harbinger to take another? What had Citrine sent to me? Worse, what did it say that she was okay employing little monsters like this? Did she use them in this kind of capacity? Thud didn't stop, and he swung and stomped madly now, cracking the concrete and spreading the effect. He heard distant voices and lunged toward them with the same movement trick, only to stumble where the platform ended. Chastity ran toward him, and he seemed to hear the footsteps. He turned on her. I flew to the side. Thud! Paris! I wasn't sure why I shouted the names, but I wanted his attention, and I felt like people reacted to their names and the names of people they were fond of to any degree. He did turn. He swung a fist out, pure rage and recklessness, but Chastity ducked the part of it that would have clipped her. She sprung up, stepping onto his knee, and leaped up to a height where she could hit his face. A backhand slap knocked him out cold. Chastity stumbled with the awkward step down as his bulk toppled forward, pressing against her. Losing your edge, sister, Damsel said, smug. Stop, I told her. No. Swansong gave me a long look, but she didn't say anything. Her lips shut, the hood of my costume hugging her head with the general damp that had set in, no doubt from Byron's activities. I lent her a shoulder to help her limp forward. The fires had spread as a result of the shower of sparks from Miosha's power. The fires, in turn, illuminated the rise of Cretan's maze. Buildings folded and twisted, ground rose and fell, and the effect rose up skyscraper high around where Cretan no doubt was, with other areas catching up. You want that favor? I asked Blue Stocking, my hand at my ear. Now's the time to earn it. She gave me a very unimpressed look but she did give Bitter Pill a push on the shoulder. Bitter Pill put one pill in a pocket, then lifted a piece of plastic to her mouth, a candy dispenser shaped like a woman wreathed in skin, tubes running from the folds to her nose and mouth. The head was levered back, depositing a liquid jet into Bitter Pill's mouth. Crested started forward. I wanted to say, not you, but he'd really only had one strike so far, and it had been well-intentioned. I'll rally the others who are too chicken shit to jump in on their own, Blue Stocking said. Send wounded to me. I'm certified. As, a uh, everything. I nodded. I was leery of parahuman healers, but this sounded more along the lines of conventional medicine, given a helping hand. He's threatening to lock us all in, Blue Stocking said. He had one of his hirelings reach out to me as a creepy whispergram. Don't fuck this up. Swansong raised her eyebrows at me, but she didn't say a word. I turned to walk away without a response. Swansong leaned heavily into me, limping. We passed Chastity, who looked a little shell-shocked and a lot intimidated by the maze that was unfolding. The other kids had been hurt in a maze like that, if I remembered right. Chastity's sisters and cousins. You good? I asked her, pretty sure I knew what the answer might be. Hanging back. Chastity said. Bruised my hip there, legs wobbly, and I don't think I can run. 
Swansong made an amused sound. I pointed a finger at her, stern. Okay, I said. Keep an eye on things here? She nodded, smiling slightly. It wasn't the best excuse in the world, but Chastity had done her part, and if she kept from being hurt, then Thud would stay down. She observed while Bluestocking went to Paris's side, absently rubbing at her hip. Okay. Careful with your power, Swansong said as we reached the edge of the effect. She was talking to Damsel by the angle of her head. Capricorn said things are tricky here. You be careful. I have control, Damsel said. Oh, jeez. We split up, taking different paths, with Damsel going high over a building that was looking a little crooked. Swansong stuck with me. The soldiers were filtering into the maze, and I could see some by the weird geometry of the space, flashlights mounted on guns, masks and gas masks on, uneven ground, an enclosed space, and men with guns spreading out through the area. They were doing it with an ease and focus that made me really concerned that they had done drills or practiced this. And one of those squads was Cretans, who would be that much better at this. Cradle's mech crashed through a building, maze and all. Cradle wasn't on it. It reached forward, and the distortion made the arm and fingers bend at right angles. They dug into grass and dirt, forcing Sveta to scramble out of the way. What did you do to me? I heard Rain's response, but I didn't make out the words. The voice shook me, because I was pretty sure I knew who it was. Cradle, confronting Rain. I expected the Undersiders and Breakthrough to be scattered. It wasn't the case. Cradle had done what I liked to do in certain situations, when I was fighting something or someone bigger, throwing myself into the midst of it all and using my enemy's disorganization and shock against them. A lot of powers and weapons couldn't be used in that situation if someone cared about hurting their allies. The place was a clearing, a square of grass with buildings folded in to form walls, four narrow corridors leading out of the place, and those corridors were lit with explosions and the light from flashlights. They were boxed in, high walls surrounding them. Cradle was a matter of feet from rain, whip chain out and spinning in a circle, crackling with red electricity. With soldiers approaching from multiple sides, a lot of the people who could have done something were stuck keeping the soldiers at bay. My dad, my mom, Capricorn, the dogs, and Foil. To do otherwise was to be surrounded on three or four sides and gunned down. Like this, at least, the soldiers and the associated capes were left hiding behind cover. The percussive explosions from the constant grenades was my dad's act in this, keeping one corridor between buildings inaccessible, pinning down the squadron on the far side of it. It looked like Mukade's people. The initial movements of the centipedes was being shaken, thrown off, and interrupted. My mom had her weapons out in bright yellow fans. The fans narrowed into blades when she needed something that would crackle and burn, and expanded out into fan shapes when she wanted something more diffuse. A sweep of a fan burned one soldier my mom was fighting, making him drop his assault rifle. She kicked it backward in the direction of the harbingers. Cradle's glowing line appeared in the path. The weapon slid right into it, and it was cut in two. Whatever calculations the harbingers were using, Cradle wasn't sitting still long enough for them to apply. He moved here and there, at one moment approaching rain with arm held high, chain circling overhead, ready to strike down, the other hand pointing at rain. Everything I am. I was well and I've tried to be better, even after all of this. After you. I've heard all this before, Cradle, every fucking night, rain said. Cradle disappeared, appearing behind rain. Rain spun around, swinging with the blade of silver as the chain whipped toward his head. A dodge. A harbinger changed course to lunge right for Cradle, only to stop when an X of glowing lines appeared between them. No more slingshot bullets, possibly. It wasn't the only fence, either. There were enough that one good stomp from Thud, were he still standing, would bowl people over and make them fall into the lines. Not all were easy to see. I took flight, aiming to go over, and saw Cradle move in the same instant he turned his head my way. I made myself stop, twisting as the lines appeared. 
sudden appearance, each one sharper than any blade, and capable of cutting through powered defenses. I can see you, Rain, Cradle intoned. He moved twice in quick succession, and a gunshot from one of the harbingers echoed through the area, the bullet ricocheting and hitting a wall. Maybe a spot he'd figured Cradle would appear at. The harbinger moved to reload, and a line appeared as he moved the weapon. He only grazed it, checked the weapon, then threw it aside, like it was no use. I kept flying, slow so I wouldn't run into anything terminal, forcing Cradle to devote some attention to me. My dad paused in his constant bombardment of the alley to hurl one in Cradle's direction. Again, Cradle moved, almost too slow. He was too distracted. And the maneuver cost my dad. Mukade's centipedes encircled the corridor, coiling in a quadruple helix around the alley, braced against the sides so no grenade could redirect or disturb them. Swansong used her power, vaulting over the scene. More lines appeared in her path. She used her blast to hurl herself to one side for a rough landing. There's a certain distance these things have to be from us, but they're still more dangerous than any weapon on this battlefield. Swansong hurried to my dad's side, her blasts aimed at the centipede. The blast made her slip. Brace her, I ordered my dad. I was dealing with my own mess. The lines were being concentrated on me, hemming me in and trying to put me into a position where I couldn't move without touching one. I saw a root and took a risk, hands going over my head as I dove down, my body as narrow as possible, slipping through a gap. I landed somewhat violently, and the cut in my leg seized up with pain. Already more lines barred my way. My dad to the north, my mom to the west, Rachel and Cassie to the east, and Foyle to the south. Foyle had a gun, and it didn't look like the one I'd handed her, but she looked like she was struggling, and it was hard to pin down why. Injury? Stress? Capricorn was closest to my mom and Rain, drawing out a diagram. He ducked and pushed my mom as Cradle appeared, swiping. My mom turned into an orb, then turned back, getting her feet back under her. A flicker, not unlike Cradle's, but one that left her in the same spot. Now, my mom called out, moving to the side, her back to the wall just by the corner, her weapons extended out in front of her. Byron's water forced the soldiers who had been encroaching in back. The slope was downhill and the water effective. They'd paired up for that position for a reason. Cradle's voice was haunting, because it carried, and it came from different places even midway through a word. I can see you so clearly. You think you're better. I don't, but you do. I see it. All of the weak points. The flaws, the stains. You actually think you're better. I don't, but I know I'm still fucking better than you, Rain roared. He struck out with a silver blade, too short a weapon compared to Cradle's lengthy whip. Cradle appeared close, whipping out. Rain's reaction was too slow. An eruption of Byron's power and a splash of water extended his way. Cradle shifted to one side, the whip still moving, and then shifted just in time as the water became stone, a loose spike of stone that stabbed up from a point just to Rain's left. Tristan collapsed, swayed, and then sagged. There was no revision back. Byron had seen it as an emergency. The difference between us is that I overcame what I am. Then association with you knocked me all the way down, and it made me impossible to be better again. You, you didn't overcome what you were until we made you, until we influenced you. No, that's not true, Rain said, holding up the silver blade. He turned rapidly, taking a second or two to find Cradle each time Cradle shifted position. Lines, angled low and close to the ground, no more than ankle height, surrounded Rain's feet forcing each movement to be a quick shuffle. Love Lost gave me her tokens. I know how the bleed works. She managed it, Cradle said, voice soft amidst constant grenade explosions, the shouts of soldiers, and the snarling of dogs. What the hell did you try to give me, and what the hell are you? I'll show you what I'm giving you, Cradle intoned. 
the mech came bounding down from a high place, whips slicing down. Cradle moved to be atop it as it came down, then moved to higher ground. I flew to rain, skimming past a line that appeared in my way. I caught his hand, pulled rather than lift or push. The hand mech was two fists and two more hands as back legs, the fists coming down where rain had been. That wasn't where it stopped. It had no reason to pause or hesitate, and it acted on its own, a hand lunging toward my mom. My mom, who had no Capricorn, and who was too busy with the soldiers in the alley between two buildings to even turn around or go ball form. I let rain fall, and I put myself in the hand's way, wretch active, pushing back as it pushed. A mess of limbs against a mess of limbs. My mom started forward to assist or to cut at joints. No, I ordered. Get... I felt the sick impact, and I couldn't even stop to react to it, because there wasn't a moment to spare, nor an inch of ground to be given. Arc 12, Heavens, Chapter 9 I wrestled with a hand that was the size of a car that had more leverage than I did. It had a partner hand planted on the ground to my left, and two smaller back hands, like a dog had back legs, one gripping the side of a building, the other digging fingers into dirt. Any number of fingers had invisible cables attached, I'd seen two before they stopped moving. Cables that could slice right through me, given a chance or a reckless movement on my part. I knew exactly where the wretch was, where each hand and foot was placed, at one giant fingertip, at the webbing of cables that stretched in a bow between two fingers, at a finger to my side, and in the ground. But a hand was a series of moving parts, and I had to account for all of them. With the way the machine was positioned, three hands planted on the ground and one for me to deal with, it was trying to lift me up and push me back at the same time, or to get in position where it could squish me beneath given a chance. I could deal with three fingers, but as the pinky finger came at me from the side, I didn't have the bracing ready to catch it or stop it from punching through the wretch. I cast away the wretch, twisted in the air to avoid the fingers that came down, and let the hand move around me before bringing the wretch out again. The action took a second. I ran on instinct for the entirety of it, and the entire dynamic with my opponent changed. I was between middle and ring fingers, close to the webbing, the wretch gripping the two fingers in multiple places, clawing at the cabling between fingers now. Less leverage. Less room and time to maneuver next time, but less worry about invisible cables or fingers coming at me from the side. So long as I kept my eye on the thumb. It didn't have a good angle to get at me, but a bad angle wasn't no angle, and robot hands could bend in ways regular hands couldn't. The space was dark. It had been dark before it was folded up into a maze that creeped up around us on all sides. Lights flashed on and off in my peripheral vision, taking weird shapes, and I knew they were the movements of the flashlights, cast at ground, at walls, then both, then neither. Many of those flashlights were mounted on guns, and all of those guns were intended for us. They weren't even the most ominous lights in my field of vision. Slashes of lights like illumination shining through cracks in the door decorated the hundred-foot-by-hundred-foot space around us. Each could apparently cut through force field, through... through breaker bubbles, like brandishes. I set my jaw, refusing to look. Because I wasn't in a position to help, and because it would distract. Not that it mattered. Because as much as I was trying... As much as I recognized the immediate peril and that the others in the group were striving to cover the entryways, I couldn't take my mind off of the fact that Brandish hadn't moved. 
My dad's voice, like a muffled echo from the surface while I was underwater, was insistent and loud. They weren't words meant for me, which meant I could safely ignore them, refuse to listen to them, and focus on the pounding of my pulse. I could try. Bubble! I winced. The hand lurched, shifting as the fingers of the hand furthest from me dragged through dirt and found some kind of traction, like a vein of rock covered by soil. It was like a new form of strength, something I had to fight against, maintaining the wretch, reaching out to find the fold, one area where a section of torso rose out of a broader mass, the area the hospital workers had had to work extra hard to keep clean. I could protest and claim my force field kept the dust off, but that did nothing for accumulated sweat and the bacteria that multiplied in the sweat. The washings and the lean forward so we can get in there instructions had left me with an enduring awareness of the feature that would stay with me for the rest of my life. For my purposes here, it was the part of the wretch that extended furthest in. Where I moved, the wretch floated around me, equidistant. But it wouldn't block me. There was a point I could reach out and feel it, with a sense that wasn't my awareness of my powers, but it wasn't a barrier, more like a handle. When I moved it, the wretch moved around me. The hand tilted a fraction, away from the body, closer to the passage. But with all of its leverage, it was stronger. It fought back, inch by inch, with every inch and every second, I had to be aware that a stray bullet or sudden shock could knock out my force field, and I'd need to move to avoid having my head crushed or struck from my shoulders. Around me, more of the glowing lines began to appear. I turned in place, one hand on the crevice handle in the force field, surveying my immediate situation. Four lines, arranged in a horizontal square, parallel to the ground. They were spaced a good distance apart. I could move a good foot or two before the wretch made contact with them. A few more feet, and it would be me, not my force field, that made the contact. But they were what they were. A collar. Four massive guillotine blades, level with my neck, staying where they were and waiting for my neck to meet them. Though this had been an open space before, it was easiest to think of as a house now, doors or windows on each of the four sides. I had the mech at one side, Foyle was to my right with the harbingers, my dad and Swansong to my left, and the dogs across from me. Tristan lay in the middle, unconscious, while Rain was stuck navigating the lines that were intent on trapping him. Brandish! Use your breaker form! My dad's voice. I had no tears in my eyes, no moisture on my cheeks. My throat was tight, the breaths coming in tense, and every muscle was tight, to the point that it felt like it was choking the tear ducts and constricting the blood flow. Carol! On a ledge above, Cradle looked down, staring with the lenses on his mask glowing. I could see him, and I saw his head turn. He was tracking something I couldn't see. All at once, the harbingers and foil broke away. If Cradle had wanted to do something elsewhere, the movement of the three forced him to devote attention here. One harbinger ran for it, out the door toward the soldiers. The other joined foil, coming my way. They dodged the lines that appeared in their way, though foil cut it close enough that it clipped her costume, cutting the decorative material where it jutted out. She threw herself to the ground, back hitting earth, her gun raised high. Cradle began moving around, making himself a hard target, before settling on a position that let him see most of the field while being clear of Foyle's field of vision. The lines began appearing again, like the glowing blades of swords stuck into the earth. The harbinger used the distraction, leaping onto one of the back hands. The surface looked too sheer, but he found handholds and footholds, the edge of a foot or a finger finding a groove in the metal that I might have thought was a trick of the eyes. He had a knife that looked like it was made of glass, and used it to slice the head off of a bolt or a screw. Three strikes in two seconds. Carol, change! What can we do? 
Foyle asked. She shot again. The sound was loud, and I could see many people in this antechamber of Cretan's maze react to the sharp noise. Can't. It's up to her. She's moving. If she can just... I don't think she wants to. Fuck! Why not? My dad didn't answer. I knew. Even after all this time, Brandish hated being in the form. It left her blind and deaf, sensing and tracking the world around her with another kind of awareness. In the ball, she was confined in the dark, and she hated the dark. She had endured for the sake of the job, and she'd come out of it bitter and hostile enough to drop a barb. There were too many stories, and recent mention of the breaker in the hospital that hadn't been able to leave her form wasn't the only one of its kind. Changers, breakers, and tinkers who emulated those things always had the what-if-I-can't-go-back problem in the backs of their minds. Tristan was an all-too-recent reminder of how easy it would be to walk that line and pick the exact wrong moment to use a power. I leveraged the wretch, doing what I could to shift the hand so it wouldn't fall or strike down near where Brandish lay. They'd been able to abandon the door because reinforcements had come. Bitter Pill was the first to make her way in, twice as tall as she had been but not twice as thick around, with limbs that flexed like they had rubber and not bone inside. Her mouth yawned open, froth flowing from the corners lowest to the ground, and her tongue lolled out, extended in length. She had a soldier in each hand, and she flexed her entire body to heave one up, then slam him in the nearest corner. The other she shoved face first into the frozen dirt, with enough strength to leave a furrow behind. As intimidating as the warped silhouette was, the sounds were mewling, soft moans, with some vibration behind them, as if from the lowest point of the throat. Careful! I shouted. Glowing lines kill! Being big as she was, her body wasn't good at moving through Cradle's mess of lines. She made it about halfway before she stumbled into one and lost her leg and part of her pelvis. She crashed to the ground and in the process lost a bit of her scalp. Birdbrain, Moose, and two more of the local capes stopped in their tracks as they saw her fall. A long arm that bent under the weight of its extremity found its way to the lab coat she wore, which barely extended below her rib cage with her altered form. Another medication dispenser. This one topped with what looked like a tumor with a mask shaped like a baby's face on the front. The head flipped back, and her stretched out mouth was already wide open for another squirt from the piz dispenser. Moose was more careful. He tried backhanding one of the lines, stopping short of hitting it, and let the shockwave run past it. I could see where the shockwave that followed the movement disturbed the earth. It took a V-shape, as even that was parted. I felt the mech I was wrestling shift in reaction to the vibration. Whatever the harbinger was doing didn't seem like enough. I almost looked at Brandish as that happened, checking if she had been hurt worse by even the fact that there was movement in the air, jostling, and changing in position. He was tall, too, and unlike Bitter Pill, he had the powers-gave-me-this-physique build. "'Who needs help?' Moose shouted. "'Carol, the woman—' "'Precipice,' I interrupted my dad. "'Get to Precipice. Moose, help him get free of the cage. You!' I indicated someone else from the group, a cape I didn't recognize who had an unkempt beard that extended below the line of his mask. He had a mean look to him, by design, by color, by the way the metal armor he wore strapped in over coat and costume bottoms was as scuffed and battle-scarred as it was. But his eyes were wide and alarmed behind the mask. Get to her. Try and get her to change, but carry her back to blue stocking somehow. Hug the wall. The guy making cutting lines is above. He looked relieved to have a job. I can do above. Birdbrain said. Give me a second. I need to adjust. Foyle, back still to the ground, gun in front of her, let go of her weapon to indicate a direction. Birdbrain nodded. We had our reinforcements. 
I could hear Damsel using her blasts nearby and wished she was here. Moose drew nearer. I saw the lines around me disappear, the guillotine fizzling out, and realized what was imminent. A sudden lunge, the mech twisting, leaning hard on me to simultaneously push me down and use me as a bracing point to go for Moose, backhanding him. I was ready for it. I dropped everything, losing the wretch, the force field, and letting the mech fall instead of lean on me. The backhand lost its leverage, and Moose was able to bring his hands around and put his hands out in anticipation of the attack. The sides of the gauntlets, not the palms or fists. The mech struck him, and Moose was sent stumbling backward, but not so far back that he collided with the fence of glowing lines. The points where the hands met his gauntlets, however, bent inward, metal fingers bending and crumpling. Moose shifted his hand from chop to a fist, not punching, but simply pointing. The crumpled parts became craters. He pushed to follow up, and the shockwave that followed saw the mech toppling. I hurried to do my best to guide its fall. The axis where four arms extended out hit the ground. The landing was hard enough to jostle everyone and everything nearby. Rain, trapped with no less than six of the glowing lines crisscrossing in a loose circle around him, nearly stumbled into one of them. He'll try to fuck with you. Precipice is who he really wants, I told Moose. Careful of more lines. Fuck, was the response. But he didn't stop as he recovered and ran, now crouching in Rain's direction. Meanwhile, I had to deal with the fact that the mech no longer needed arms or hands on the ground to brace itself. With two big arms and two small ones, the center mass was off, something I'd always had to pay attention to when learning how to throw or move big things with my power. An image flashed into my mind, of Uncle Neil giving me field instruction while parents stood by, arms folded. It hurt. The regret... The full and total knowledge that I hadn't told her about my force field and she'd gotten hurt because of it. I didn't want to call it the wretch in this context, because that felt like it was deflecting blame to the reckless and wild consciousness at the other end of my power. The advantage was that it wasn't very mobile. Instead of four arms pointed down and the point they met up, it was the other way around. Four lengths of arm, shoulder to elbow, all resting on the ground as a cross, each with a massive mechanical forearm and hand rising up from the terminus or draping out from the end. In the center, protected by those hands, I could see the bowl of stasis frozen body parts. We needed those. I saw Swansong look over her shoulder and gave her a tight shake of the head. Because the terrain was muddy and she was missing a foot, and because the mech had hostages at the same time she had a chaotic and reckless power. It could drag itself, and it looked to be trying, but it was just an obstacle, with a lot of reach and, should it move in just the right way, the possibility of slamming into brandish. I threw myself at one elbow, pushing the entire mass just a few feet across slick, muddy ground, still wet from Byron's power. The hand came down, and I flew back and away, spinning once in the air to try and ensure I wasn't flying into anything lethal. The spin made my head swim, and between the sick feeling in my upper chest, the tension in my facial features, the dizziness that swept over my every sense, and the fact that the arms and legs I was relying on were entirely power-derived, I felt like I was just a head, neck, and some shoulder. I hit it again, to try to wedge it into the corridor that Brandish and Capricorn had been guarding and nudge it further from Brandish. The thing was trying to stand, and I did what I could to keep it from getting there. Moose leaped onto it, knocking an arm flat to the ground while making the rest of it buck up. I hit it again, harder to knock it flat again. Metal bent and broke. Heads up! Rain barked. There were arms nested in one of the primary ones. I'd seen how they did it, a more slender arm fitting into hollows in the forearm, palm, and fingers. As they pulled free, 
I saw the glint and crackle of the invisible cables. The hollow spaces in the underside of each arm and hand were covered up by shutters. Moose! Harbinger! Get back! I called out the order. The whips came crashing down. Five deep slices into earth as the left hand swept down. Five more when the right hand swiped horizontally, raking a nearby wall that had been raised up from the ground as part of the maze. The hands rose and reoriented, the entire machine trying to get to a position like its original one, with four arm-shaped legs firmly on the ground in a quadruped position, but this time with the two narrower, nimbler arms extending up and above from the midpoint, each with five cables draping from them, those cables swiftly becoming invisible. Foyle and the Harbinger took point. As the arms whipped out again, Harbinger shot. The invisible cable's course was altered, and it clipped the elbow of one of the arms. I couldn't fly at full speed, so I rose steadily, up and away from the scene. Moose was helping Rain, lifting him up and out of the cage. Foil and Birdbrain were taking up different points around the clearing to have a better chance of hitting Cradle if he turned up. I could hear the gunfire and see how frenetic the flashlights were moving in places. More reinforcements. There were less people pressing in against Rachel and the dogs now. I could see the cape I'd tasked with evacuating Brandish. I could see the glow of the orb. Rain got free and sprinted toward the mech. He made his silver blades, then sliced at one finger. It broke, the weight of it serving as the catalyst to bring about the break. Rain was already swiping at another until his sword fizzled out. Fucking come on, he swore. Come on, come on! The blade appeared again, a delay between uses, apparently. Rain cut at the hand itself. Back out, Rain, I shouted. I saw him hesitate, moving like he was going to jump back into the fray. You're not thinking straight. He seemed to get that. He turned to run. Hands moved, cables slicing audibly through the air right for him. Moose grabbed his hand and hauled him out of the last foot of the cable's reach. The mech tried to stand, but with one finger and part of the hand broken, its attempt to walk itself forward failed and it toppled. The fact that it was slower made it easier to keep a distance. The reinforcements we were getting were making it so we weren't surrounded by soldiers while holding our ground in a house, to use my allegory for the nature of the clearing. The soldiers were under attack on their own, and we had a chance to breathe, to shore up. There was an issue with fighting an uphill battle, and we had been before the reinforcements. I wasn't sure if we still weren't, just given the situation that surrounded us. It was a long, hard slog to get uphill, but if there was someone standing at the other end of that uphill climb, they were benefiting from being there. Not fighting meant one could rest, could heal, and could come up with contingencies while watching the other guy struggle. When we'd had the advantage over the villains of Hollow Point, before advance guard had tipped our hand for us, we'd had that option. It was why, so very often, things could trend downhill. The wrong people got the advantage, and every time that hard progress was made, they were ready with a failsafe, another plan, a way to knock the good guys down. When the good guys managed that equilibrium, it was society functioning reasonably well. It didn't help that the people who were willing to capitalize on the weak were villains, so even when victory was achieved against the criminals and monsters, there were often others of their ilk ready to pick up where they left off, while everyone else was picking up the pieces. The others had the situation partially handled. I wanted to be above it, away from it, to get a vantage point wide enough that I could make out the players and see what the next move was to get ahead of Cradle and what he had planned. The harbinger who hadn't gone to fight the soldiers elsewhere in the maze was dodging the cables, targeting the mech. It was a systematic dismantlement, where one stab or a series of smaller ones caused cracks to run along one length of arm, or made steam start billowing out of an elbow. I suspected he was very much enjoying himself, but it wasn't fast. I had to assume that as good as he was at movement, 
at thinking his way around a fight, he didn't get tinker things like a tinker did. Sveta was at the rooftops, and as I rose up, she rose up alongside me, keeping a healthy distance. By the look on her face she'd seen, she didn't meet my eyes. I didn't get the feeling of judgment or condemnation, but if there were words to say, I was pretty sure she couldn't bring herself to say them. To absolve me of blame for what I'd done to Brandish required that she do the same for herself for the accidental deaths she'd caused. I knew from what she'd said in the past that she always wondered about and regretted the preventative actions she hadn't taken. They're going to change it up, I said. My voice sounded funny. Easier to be a leader, authoritative, communicating what was needed. In this medium, away from the thick of it, trying to catch her breath, I sounded so shaky. How? she asked. She met my gaze with the question. Sneak attack, or going for something they know we want. If he threatens his hostages, one of the vital organs of someone, that's one thing. The portal is another thing where he has the advantage. Or he could just find one of us in a moment of weakness and catch us by surprise with that whip of his. He has to get to his machine to do anything with it. And to pilot it, I observed. It was faster and cleverer when he was close enough to watch it and track what it was doing. I don't think it has the best AI on its own. It's scary, Sveta said. Yeah, I said, but Cradle's scarier. Keep an eye out. It was difficult to keep an eye on every rooftop, corner, crevice, and maze wall in this space that had folded up, had parts rise up, and otherwise turned itself around enough that it was all a mess. Not every point seemed to connect exactly to each other point, and an awful lot seemed to turn back in on itself. The guy with Brandish was having trouble getting out. He found himself back in the same place again, and to his credit, he looked upset about it. He cared about helping or doing his part for this community here. Because the maze was shifting. The effect was slow, but it was picking up speed. The guy was taking routes that had knocked out or dead soldiers or signs of passage, only to find they were dead ends. The maze is shifting, I hollered down. Tremulous emotion caught me post-holler, like I'd jostled something free. Fuck, 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 I swore. What are you doing, Cradle? Tunnels and corridors weren't serving to give the soldiers an angle for a surprise attack, so tunnels and corridors fell away. I saw a squadron running in the general direction of the others. I flew into the upper edge of a maze wall and I slammed into it. There were soldiers who were far enough ahead that, when they heard the action, they could run or push their way forward. There were others at the tail end of the group who could back off. More in the center, who bent over or tried to shield themselves. Stones and chunks of earth fell on them from above. I might well have killed one or more of them doing that. It might not be the first death blow I'd delivered tonight. I had to focus. The only way forward was forward. I couldn't atone for one mistake by perpetuating another and letting other people die. The maze was shifting to create an arena, and an aperture was opening in the side of a building. A gate, unfolding as a small crack, became a hole, and the hole became an archway. As it opened... So did the scale of the blades that flew out of the aperture, tiny and counting in the hundreds. Cretan followed it, charging with shield up and helmet down. Moose started forward, picking up a piece of corrugated metal with the clear intent of shielding some of the others, but it was a coordinated attack. A short wall tripped Moose. Cretan collided with him while he was off balance. While he was on the ground, walls began to rise up around him. My dad blew up two of those walls, only to start receiving the brunt of the flying blades, which were so numerous they carpeted the floor of the clearing. The blades were like razors, embedding an inch or so into flesh or ground or opening up cuts, while Cretan was the hammer, to remove or exclude heavier and more dangerous targets. My dad shouted something to Moose, threw a grenade. Moose caught it, then flicked it toward the open archway. It detonated within. 
It only bought a few seconds. I needed to be down there, except I didn't trust myself. Lion Wing and Cretan were two of Cradle's inner guard. That they were stepping into the fray meant we were whittling him down. As Ashley had noted, Cradle was one to lead from the rear, and as I'd noted, he probably liked to monitor and pilot his mech, and maybe to use his emotion power. I flew down. Through the rooftop of the building the aperture had opened in, the space had been a one-floor house, but raised up by the maze to be three or four stories tall. Instead of slamming through multiple floors in quick succession, I found myself in a void, fifty feet to travel down to the ground, only a maze-created fold of wall to knock down in my way. He was ready for me, and he saw me. The whip flared red in the near-total darkness, illuminated only by second-hand light thrown in through the window. I didn't hesitate, trying to visualize the route I needed to take and the form that swing would have. Rather than swing, he disappeared, skipping his way into the clearing. I hit the earth, found and picked up a stone and stood up again. Lion Wing was at the entry to the arch, drawing the blades back to her now to form a shield at one arm. I couldn't fight Lion Wing, but I didn't want her to know that. That stream of blades would tear past my force field. At the rear of the other group, the mech moved, reaching, and it was Sveta who reached down to grab the outstretched fingers. Every single one of her tendrils found a home, either on an anchor point or on the mech itself. It strained, to the point I thought she might snap, or that tendrils might pull free. I flew straight for Lion Wing, then pulled away at the last second using my aura, a test. It provoked a response, the shield extending from a rough triangular shape to a spike. Another spike composed of interlocked blades stabbed out from under the shield. If both of those had hit me far enough apart, she knew how my power worked? My eyes narrowed. Fuckers, I said. Do you know how his emotion power works? Lion Wing asked. We got the gist of it, I said. But I bet you're going to try to be clever. You seem like the type. The type? I was aware that every second that passed was a second my team was fighting Cradle, the Mech, and Cretan, while Cretan used his power to divide and conquer them. At least if I tied her up, I could keep her from using most of those blades on my team. It looked like she had a set quantity she could manage at a whim. Shields, blades, flying hail, even flight, from what I'd heard reported. Your first move in a fight is a surprise attack, pulling an ace from your sleeve. You have the hair, I gestured at her mane of hair, that you obviously put time into, nice costume, but you work for an irredeemable scumbag and do irredeemable things. Doesn't connect like it's all surface level. Blades flew in to slide into studs in her costume. For a second, she was buoyed up. Had I missed my chance to get an answer in my hurry to push her? She stabbed out, and the configuration of the sword shifted to make it more spear-like as she thrusted, the blades sliding against the palm of her gauntlet. She hit the edge of the wretch, and the blade detonated, a shrapnel of blades cast out in every direction in front. I'd avoided it, because she'd already established her pattern with intent. One, two hits every time. Now you're second-guessing yourself, I said. Whether what you were going to say sounded good, the intimidation factor. No second guesses, she said. I forced a small smile to my face, and offered her an equally small laugh, inaudible but visible. Old Snag wants to give people things that mean something, and he gets a power that lets him fill objects with emotion, builds gear to shoot people with it. Makes sense, don't it? Lion Wing asked. The bitch inflicts herself on everyone around her, and doesn't realize she's doing it even after she brings the teenage girl into her mess. Colt, yeah, I said. I turned sideways to be more aware of the blades that had peppered surfaces behind me. They were starting to move again. Admittedly on point so far. 
I'd had the distinct impression that if I'd simply said no to the question about what Cradle's power was, I'd get a tease. I wanted to bait her out, so I'd said yes, and now I tried to tack her pride to the matter. It helped that she didn't seem to care that much, and that my read on her wasn't wrong. She liked appearances, flash, and style. The boy is a bad weather pattern, a cloud of misery and utter patheticness that hangs over anyone he looks at. I remained silent, let the silence hang. If I gave her anything, including telling her she was wrong, which she kind of was, I was pretty sure she'd tease me and leave me without answers. The boss? The guy who's out there, cutting people to pieces, targeting the tired and the distracted? He's too self-centered to give. You learn to work around that. It's all take. Himself. I have something of his I'd like to give him. Knock out his teeth and make him swallow them. You stupid bitch, Lion Wing said. He can draw it in. Read your weaknesses in chemical code, running through your head and your veins. He earned money blackmailing people by targeting them. He got more ground with people by sensing how far he could push them before they gave. And all of that was before. When he woke up tonight, he was strong. What he's been doing? He's been gathering what he needs. Reading us? Hanging back and drinking it all in? Now, Lion Wing said, he's using it. Soldiers to keep us busy, maybe to force us into situations where our emotional landscapes were closer to the surface. I knew mine was. I snarled as I took flight, wretch out, and hit the ground to kick up dirt, sending it her way. I had to assume she needed to see to use those blades. She created a cloud of them around herself, reached to her side, and drew a gun. I hit the fold of maze above, where Cretan's power had stretched out the building facing the station and let the rubble fall. I reversed course, flipping upside down, feeling a bit dizzy from my earlier impact, and reversed course, hitting the ledge fist first. To bring rubble down on Lion Wing, the cloud of blades became a solid bubble, a shield. I broke another bit of rubble away, and used a burst of wretch strength to hurl it, aiming not for her, but for where the bubble met ground. Things were less interlocked there, and the chunk of concrete half crumbled, half bounced through. It was an opportunity, where she couldn't see me clearly and she was off balance. I fought her like I'd fight myself, grabbing another bit of concrete that broke off to be smaller than I'd hoped for and hurling it before changing directions. The concrete hit one side of her bubble, and the entire thing shifted before exploding out in that direction. I grabbed her gun hand in the moment the now-exposed mercenary wheeled around to point it at me, almost catching it between my arm and armpit. Her hand firmly in my grip, I smashed into her, driving her into the ground. Her body rolled a short distance. Her arm stayed with me. I let it fall still connected, or at least partially connected. I hadn't dismembered her, but I hadn't ruled it out either. But it was dislocated at the very least, and I was pretty sure from the way it had bent on the impact with the ground that I'd broken the various pieces of the arm in a few places. I took care of her like I'd taken care of Paris. I needed to know she wouldn't be too dangerous to have at my back, but she didn't need arms and legs. I had to knock her out, and I didn't have a minute to spare or anything convenient to do it with. Instead, grabbing her hair, I smashed her head against the ground twice. That was the point she was still breathing, but not up to pick any fights with me any more. I grabbed weapons off of her, and I approached the arch. My dad had been cut, so had one of the dogs. Moose was lying on the ground, and I had no idea why, but I could assume another cut. Harbinger 2 was out, and Harbinger 1. When I looked, I saw that the maze of Cretan's power had raised walls all around us. Could they climb? Ashley looked unconscious, and she was bleeding badly. I could see where Cretan stood, a safe distance away from her, and draw conclusions there. Had she tried to beat him without killing him? 
We'd gotten the sign-off on killing, but for Ashley, I could imagine a spur-of-the-moment thought where she felt it was more important not to kill the other horned guy in armor. Fuck. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Rachel was harder to spot, because she was slumped against one dog's side while the dog lay on the ground. Tattletail was beside her. I saw foil, but no Cassie. I saw a bitter pill, healed from her near decapitation and leg loss, bird brain, and two of bitter pill's capes that hadn't been around when I'd dove into the building. There were people from the local community without costumes on, and I had no idea from the context if they were blue stockings or if they were ones loyal to Cradle and Cradle's way. Leaving only Rain, who was breathing hard, his expression hidden. Cretan stood to one side, his head periodically turning as he surveyed the high walls that enclosed Cradle's fucked-up little arena. "'I guess you win,' I told Cradle, my voice low. "'If he surrenders, and if you stay back, I'll let you tend to your wounded. You've got a few. I'll do what I need to in the next six hours, and then I'll get somewhere safe. I have thinkers to ask, to make sure I'm not being pursued.' Once that's confirmed, I'll disable the severing. It can be disabled? Yes or no? he asked. Yes, I said. I don't get a say? Rain asked. Ray, precipice, I said. My voice was firm. Please. One person is strapped to the railroad track. Everyone else is strapped to the other. The trolley is coming. Do I pull the switch? Rain asked, bitter. Except I'm the one guy. I've always been the one guy. I get people who say they care about me, but they always end up on the other goddamn track. It's not about that, I said. Fucking feels like it. Fuck! I closed my eyes. I was aware that Cradle probably wasn't keen on picking a fight with me because Lionwing had called his emotion power a kind of emotion reading or feedback response. If my resistance to emotion powers factored in, I might seem a little fuzzier. Rain, who was the only other guy with emotion powers still standing, was part of that. But if I fought, I couldn't see a way through. Not when he had other mercenaries like Cretan, or anyone still outside the walls. I had allies out there too, but the calculus... I wasn't sure I had another knockdown, down drag-out fight in me. Yes, I heard. I opened my eyes. Rain had answered. Walk forward, Cradle said. Twenty feet ahead, hands up. No mechanical hands. Rain's expression was hidden, but I could imagine his face twisting with emotion as his shoulders tensed and his head turned at a slight angle. I'm going to remove them. Do it. Rain disconnected the remains of his mechanical hands, one mostly intact, the other broken at the elbow. He held both the pads in his hands, the arms folded up. He bent down to lay them on the ground. Throw them! Into there! Cradle indicated a leafy area where a bush jutted up against the side of one of the warped homes. Rain discarded them, throwing them where they'd be hard to find again. Without being asked, he started walking, head down. Cretan trained a gun on him. Cradle looked at me, and I raised my hands. If your feet leave the ground, or if you drop those hands, Cradle intoned. He used his power, moving to a position where he was bent down. He picked up an oblong stone. A bright line appeared in the air to his right. He swatted it with the stone, severing the stone in half. This happens to someone or something you care about. Could be the fix you want. And you get away, you disappear, and you leave the world a worse place than when you entered it. I tried. More than you know, I tried, Cradle said. Once powers came into it, I physically could not try any more. Once he came into it. I know people who couldn't help but kill, but they found coping mechanisms. How long did it take them to figure out? Cradle asked. How many deaths? I didn't respond. I haven't killed anyone, he said. Not with these hands. 
Believe me, I'm coping. You're fucking awful at coping, I said. Aren't we all? He asked, and for maybe the first time ever, he sounded weirdly amused. Then he walked away, Cretan ushering rain forward. Cradle flickered with every movement, not that it really mattered, considering the only conscious dangers who were crack shots with a gun were on the other side of the walls that bounded the arena and the tunnel Cretan was making to the station. Above them were buildings stretched improbably tall and black sky. He wins? Fuck that. I watched him disappear from sight. I didn't budge. I avoided looking at the others. I listened. My middle ear might have been fucked up from my earlier collision, but I imagined a shift in the air pressure. I imagined the timing was right. I gave the signal, hand chopping down. Sveta dropped down from that improbable height, her tendrils going to the ground and providing spring before the impact. I flew, and as Sveta grabbed for every handhold, I threw caution to the wind. No wretch, no problematic air resistance. I knew what I was getting into here. But for the rainfall patter of Sveta's tendrils on the walls of the station, we were silent as we darted after Cradle. He stood at the threshold to the portal, and he seemed genuinely surprised to see us. If Cradle wasn't as quick or effective in assessing me or how to target me, it might have had to do with my emotion resistance. If he had difficulty with Sveta, it might have had to do with the fact that there were no veins for her emotions to run through. Her brain maintained a different construction. The reaction was immediate. Cretan's power sheltering Cradle and putting a few bends in the path between them and us. Sveta's focus was on a few things at once, but she was capable of that. Her mechanical body had trained her. For rain, she reached past the bends, grabbing him by several points, before flinging him backward, hurtling at about a hundred miles an hour toward the wall by the front door. He stopped abruptly in his path. Cradle proved harder to grab. He could move in an instant, and as fast as those tendrils seemed to be, they took a bit more than an instant. But as we'd seen when Foyle went on the offensive, he reacted to surprise with randomness before he settled on his game plan. Four or five teleports in short order, long enough to put a thought together and assess the threat. Sveta reached out for every point, every place he could be. It made an audible sound, like a few seconds of intense rainfall. She got tendrils on Cradle, and Cretan raised up a wall, singular between Cradle and Sveta. The tendril was pinched between wall and ceiling, unable to retract, reel in, or rope around Cradle enough to take any part of him. Other tendrils tried to reach around the breadth of the wall, and they didn't extend far enough. My role in things was to distract, to force him to play the cards he had in hand. For me, Cradle made the glowing lines. X's in space. Sveta pulled Cradle's equipment out of his hand. With a flick of the trapped tendril, the equipment was sent skittering across the floor. My goal, my plan, had been a raw one. To trust the team. Knowing that we had some good people beyond the wall, and thinking that they'd bring the wall down once they'd won, to reclaim the remaining mercenaries and assert dominance over bluestocking. They didn't lower the walls. No harbinger. No damsel, no Cassie and her hound, no prancer. But I'd had Sveta, my best friend, who was more trustworthy than I was. And Chastity, who'd earned another so very important friendship in Cassie, was in the station. Chastity had to run to grab the whip that had been sent across the floor. She picked it up with two hands, fumbling with the controls, a dial on the side. More lines barred my way. The whip flared to life, but it was too much, producing a high-pitched whine. Fucking tinkers, Tattletail had said. Trapped, or too hard to use, Chastity tried to manage it, using her facility with whips to whip out in Cradle's direction. Too fast, too hard to hit. The same evasive maneuvers that served against Sveta served against Chastity, he produced glowing lines, and she slashed them, banishing them. 
The crackle of electricity was reaching a fever pitch now. She whipped Cretan instead, cutting him across the body at nipple height. He tried to scream and didn't find the air. Cradle turned around, staring. He touched his headgear, his hair. All alone, I said, because that's what happens when you act like an asshole. He hesitated, then turned to the portal. All he had to do was run for it. But he'd hesitated. Rain, over in the corner, had his hands out, like he'd done with the window. And Cretan, being not as dumb as he looked in his white bull costume, had to know that there was only one way to guarantee that he get fixed. The maze blocked off the way to the portal. It sealed everything off. The moment was marked with a pronounced crack as the whip Chastity had flung away detonated, overloaded. She dropped to her knees, staring at the remains. Were Cradle anyone else, I think he would have made an amused sound, but he was quick enough on the draw to realize his circumstances. All of us, underground and inside, surrounded by four walls, a floor, and a ceiling without a door, and Cradle without his tech. His power drew lines and waited for his targets to meet the lines. They didn't serve him when everything was at a standstill. Fix me and I let you go, Cretan said. Fix him and I break you, I told him. I can heal from what you do, he told me. Are you sure? There was only silence. Several of us were out of breath, even Cradle, who didn't move conventionally. Don't you dare fix him, I said. We're all going to have a long talk. This fucking hurts. You helped him do it to others. Call a few minutes to an hour of suffering justice. The two of us trapped in a room at night, Rain said. Cradle turned around, staring at him. The last time, one way or another. I really hope you're right, Rain growled. The maze shifted. Cradle lunged, appearing at what was only a gap, barely enough to put a hand through. Fix me! Cretan managed a roar, speaking when lung didn't connect to windpipe or mouth. Cradle touched something at his belt. Just you. I flew after him. The red line at Cretan's middle flared, and the severed parts were drawn in while they grew out at the other parts. More like portals than anything else. And the gap widened. Cradle slipped through. I flew after him. We hit the portal, and he ceased being able to do his tricky movement. I ceased being able to fly. I hadn't been aware that was a thing, and the landing, going from the top of an arched ceiling to the floor, with every injury I already had, was not a pretty one. Cradle's landing was gentler. His getaway a bit faster. And he was faster than me on the stretch. But we weren't alone. Citrine, her husband, two more harbingers, and a small crowd of other capes. Snuff, one of fault lines. Cradle, not yet past the middle ground of the portal, stopped in his tracks. You've made quite a mess, Citrine said. She was wearing a yellow shirt with ruffles beneath an ankle-length coat. I can help clean it up, Cradle said, for allowances. No, Citrine said. No, you can't and you won't. The damage is done. You need me. No, we don't, Citrine said. We might, I said, to undo the damage to the navigators, shepherds, and our various teams. Give me a second. Citrine didn't respond. I wasted no time. My hand wasn't cooperating as I reached for my phone. Antares, look out? Look out. OMG, yes, yay, you're okay. Is Song okay? Is everyone okay? How did it go? Fast typing for someone with injured hands. Hard questions to answer, and she'd started from a bad conclusion. I wasn't sure I was okay. This one had been hard. Adding to the pile of conflicted emotions... I'd drawn a connection between this and the Slaughterhouse Nine in Brockton Bay. I'd told myself that if I'd been able, I would have helped. 
and that had eaten at me on a level because I'd been raised as a helper. I wanted to help. I'd slain that demon, at the cost, potentially, of another family member. Turns out that demons suck to fight, I thought, my eyes on cradle as I typed out my follow-up. I wasn't sure that I wouldn't have looked at my own expression to match that thought, had a mirror been readily available. Antares. Okay, bruised but okay, and less okay, depending. Are you keeping an eye on the station? Lookout. Psh, duh. Antares. How good of an eye. Did you get any signal readings? We timed our final moves for when the door was open, in case you might try. I was starting to type up another sentence to clarify what she was looking for when the reply came in. Look out. Yes, four minutes ago. I didn't timestamp it, but it was near your location. This is the fix? The signal from Cradle to undo the effect. It was the fix. Keep him alive for now, just in case. I addressed everyone present, my eyes on Cradle. I was aware of the others catching up behind me. Rain, chastity, with Sveta in the background keeping Cretan from running for it. But no, I don't think we need him. I want to meet her. Yeah. His voice came out as a croak. It was hard to know what to say in a moment like this. My daughter. My sweet, sweet girl. I want to say my goodbye. I want to hold her. You are holding her, Kel. You know what I mean. Please know what I mean. I don't. The space was dark and with everything having shuffled around, mud flowing into the open window to add to the claustrophobia, the pressure mounted. The van that had been their house, their transportation, and the storage for everything the two of them owned was now their coffin. There was barely any light, and at times it didn't feel like there was enough air. His head would buzz with a headache, and he felt like he could nod off into a miserable sleep he would never wake from. He could feel the breeze through the damaged window, almost ice cold, when the rest of him was hot and prickly with sweat. Kelly, trapped where she lay in a position lower in the van than he was, didn't seem to get that breeze. Sean, I can't take her with me. You can't make me. How would I make you? Don't make me spell it out. The words were a plea. He wasn't used to her being the rock, or being the one with the plan, but she was the one who had kept it together after... after whatever had happened. He found himself walking himself through the known to get to this thing that Kelly seemed to think he should know. He'd been emancipated from his parents at sixteen. She'd simply run away. They'd found each other. It hadn't been easy. They had their individual neuroses and traumas to get over before they meshed properly. Kelly heard voices. She didn't see things, she just heard the voices, and she didn't hate the voices. That didn't mean they were always the best thing for her, but she didn't hate them. She'd always talked about how people with schizophrenia in other areas of the world tended to hear happy voices or supportive voices. She blamed culture, and she blamed society for the fact that people in the West heard negative or paranoia-inducing voices. She wanted to reject that society. Most of all, she wanted to reject the medicines, the institutions, and her parents making every decision for her, when her parents were something she couldn't talk about without going to a dark place. Figuring out whether he should trust her on that had been a task, and a long series of compromises. He'd been 16 when he met her, and admittedly not the best when it came to judgement calls. The last few months had seen her spiral out, then rein herself in. He'd gotten her to talk regularly with someone who knew better than he did, got her to agree to try medications if she had another bad patch. But given circumstances, 
he'd felt it was his duty to give her what she needed, and she wanted to get away from society, focus on the simpler things. They'd paid their money at the campsite, took up their spot on a rise in the woods, he had his licenses in order to fish, and the go-ahead to hunt rabbit, and only rabbit. He'd signed on the dotted line on the sheet that said he would take out everything he brought in. No trash. Twice a week, for the last three weeks, he'd taken her into town. While she had appointments, at hospital and with the head doctor, he brought groceries, bought the little odds and ends, and then went to the library to while away the remaining time. For the first time in his life, he'd smiled because the days made him happy. He'd been able to breathe in deeply and take in raw oxygen, close his eyes and feel the sun against the lids, and he'd felt at peace. Better yet, he'd seen Kelly at peace. Not perfect, but as good as he'd ever seen her. A very long and light rain had closed out the summer. Not what he'd thought of as natural disaster rain. They'd been laughing at how everything was wet, sorting out the van, when the mud had come down, rolling the van, swamping and mostly burying them. Burying them alive. It had been Kelly who had talked him down when he'd broken down, after the van's horn stopped working, because he'd exhausted the battery or, from his rudimentary car knowledge, corrosion under the van's hood. He'd known he wasn't rationing it out enough, but he'd panicked, because Kel needed help. Kel had kept him sane, helped him to relax, and hadn't once blamed him for overusing the horn. Rationally, he knew the campground had records that put him and Kelly on the hillside. It was a question of time. He'd heard helicopters. His chair squeaked and grated as he twisted around, his hand extended, reaching for her hand. She didn't take it. Instead, she pressed something into his palm, reached out, and closed his fingers around it. Whatever happens... No matter how this turns out, you absolutely cannot let my parents have her. They don't see her, they don't talk to her, they do not touch her. In the gloom, his hands traced the outline of the thing he had been given. He was careful, because he already knew the shape of the handle. Promise me, she said. Promise me, promise me, promise me. I promise, he said. Even though he was still wrapping his head around what she wanted. Or he understood, like he understood the knife, but there was always that doubt in his mind when it came to Kelly. Once in a long while, she would go off on a tangent, and he would be so tired that he believed her without question, only to find himself having to catch up, second guess, and realize she wasn't making sense. Then he would tell her, tell her to eat and sleep, and she'd usually listen, or she'd talk at him for another few hours while he tried to steer the conversation. The lines of reality could be that much blurrier for her when she was tired, and the tricky part was that they'd been joined at the hip for the past two years, which meant he was often tired when she was tired. It was easy to get drawn in. And he was tired now. He was running on empty, too. Was this the thing to do? Was there another way? Could they wait? Was Kelly even that hurt? I know I'm not the coolest, I'm not smart, I didn't finish high school she said. If you want to lie to her about who I was, I understand. Do... No, he said. He would have teared up if he weren't dehydrated. The mud had dried up enough to become dirt around them. No, what? No. You're the best person. I'm really not. You're the first decent person I met in my life, he said. You're the first person who put a real smile on my face. The first person who opened minds of people instead of closing them. You never had a mean word to say about anyone I did. Anyone who didn't deserve it. You can't let my parents... I won't, he said, firm. And she'll know you if I have to talk about you every day. No, I don't want to be a weight, like... She kept going back to that. The weight she hadn't been able to leave behind. She blamed her parents for the unusually early onset to her schizophrenia, hinting at stress causing it, but he'd talked to the therapist, and there wasn't any evidence that stress was linked to age of onset. More concerning, there might have been a delirious edge to the fact she kept going back to that place. It spooked him. So he talked, talked over her even, 
because he found himself in a place where if he didn't keep going or working his way forward, he would stop and find himself paralyzed. Because he could talk of warmer things, and all of the good things he liked about Kelly, and hopefully lift her up and keep her away from that kind of thinking. His entire life his parents had told him that they loved him, and not once had they shown it. His grandparents, his aunts, his uncles, they said the same. Teachers said he had potential, urged him onward, but even the most supportive of those relationships hadn't seemed to mean anything. He'd written an email to a favourite teacher from the library, thanking her for her support and letting her know he was happy now. He'd signed with his name. The reply had been a telling, Who is this? His parents had been fine as parents, but they hadn't felt like family. He could imagine sending his parents a status update and getting a reply like he had from his teacher. That might be the delirium talking. I want to see her, Kel said, insistent enough to cut through his rambling. Don't worry about hurting me. I can't feel anything. I haven't been able to feel a lot for a while now. He wasn't positive she was telling the truth, but he set to work, using the knife. Eyes forward, she said. Focus on what comes next. He'd had moments where he'd faced down a crisis and he'd been calm. A past landlord who had pushed his way into the apartment. Dealing with hostile and drunk campers who seemed convinced this was their spot. Leaving the van and the tent they'd hooked up at the rear as an extension to the van, only to find himself ten feet away from what might have been a pair of coyotes. Moments he'd faced down danger with composure and came away from it feeling like a man. He didn't feel like that here panic set in, and Kelly's voice didn't help like it had after the horn had given out. The situation was too messy. There were too many question marks. In the midst of it all, he ceased feeling like himself. He was an outside observer, somehow cataloguing every detail and not registering or keeping a one. Time blurred, and the act seemed endless. And somewhere in the midst of all of that, he found himself being swept up by a current, lost in the midst of a greater flow of connections that threatened to distract him. He wanted to focus on this, on the future like she'd said, and this rush of sensations and images threatened to pull him away from it. He flew among planets, but he really only wanted to be in this planet, in this van, in this mud, with Kelly. In the midst of it all, he felt it give way. There was almost a sentiment to it, a sigh, a frustrated concession. Power crackled along the knife, and it glowed faintly, illuminating the work he was doing. It was just hot enough to cauterize the open cut. Kelly, silent, touched his face. The child was silent as he pulled it free, eleven weeks early. With the edge of panic, he almost shook it to make it start crying. A bad sign for the kind of parent he'd end up being, he thought. A good thing that Kelly took the child into her arms. He'd been warned by the prenatal nurse that it could feel like mothers had a nine-month head start into being a parent. He felt that now. He was glad for that warning, because he very much felt like Kelly was more ready for this. The child didn't cry as much as he'd anticipated, and its initial whimpers and complaints were easily shushed. He let Kelly have every moment, his focus purely on managing the wound he'd created. She whispered to herself, like she tended to do when she was hearing the voices, but he liked to imagine she was introducing those voices to their child. A deeper connection. What do we name her? Kelly asked. He wasn't sure at first that she was talking to him, but the illumination from the glowing knife he'd stabbed into the back of one of the van's seats gave him a view of her eyes. We could name her after you. No, Kelly said, firm. There was some back and forth. In the midst of it, her coherence faltering, Kelly passed the child to him, her arms almost too weak to manage the meagre weight. He was just in time to catch it. You have her? she asked. Her had a penis, it seemed. He found himself caught in a dilemma. I have her, he said. Kel had wanted a girl so badly, 
Had she not noticed? Or was she already that out of it? You'll take good care of her. You took good care of me. He wasn't sure, but he nodded. The glowing knife let them see each other. He was barely concerned with it. It was secondary, unimportant. The name, she said. He couldn't give the child a girl's name, and he couldn't bring himself to provide a name he would later change. That would betray Kel. Addison, he said. Gender neutral. And maybe if Kelly had been gifted like he'd been gifted, in this tomb of theirs, and she'd seen something in Addison, then the name should work then, too. Good, Kelly agreed. The child missed Kelly's warmth, and it might have wanted more of the meal it had been given. It might have disliked that cool waft of air that came in from the gaps in the mud above the broken window. He did what he could to bundle it up, and tucked it into his shirt, head poking out of his collar, the tiny body laying along the crook of his arm and armpit, head cresting near his chin. But Addison cried, and another of the prenatal nurse's warnings was made evident, because he'd been told the pitch of a baby's cry had been keyed by evolution to strike at the heartstrings and drill into the mind. He'd been told it was okay to put the baby down, to walk into the next room, even step out of the house, because the crying could be overwhelming. He was overwhelmed. He couldn't walk into a next room. His heartstrings were strained to their limits as they were. He felt the weight of Addison on his arm, and he focused his mind forward, focusing on what he needed to do next. He and the baby waited for their rescue. Their world was illuminated by the glowing knife he laid in the hollow above the glove compartment. He could already feel more power building up inside him, and he instinctively knew that when time came, he'd be able to put more power into something. For now, it was an insignificant thing. Dauntless he turned away from the window. The sun was setting, and the force fields over the floating headquarters gave it some interesting hues, bringing out the subtler colours. Inside, everything was white and black, faintly tinted by those same hues outside. Battery and Challenger were approaching. Everything okay? he asked. Things are good, Battery said. She smiled. Listen, Armsmaster and Miss Militia got the latest calendar. We're the only ones on patrol tonight, so we get first pickings. I'm really, really hoping you take one of these. Can you guess which? The calendar. The schedule was more focused on the week, and that was for Armsmaster to write up and for the director to sign off on or amend, much like how Armsmaster would get his say about hires or personnel changes in the protectorate and wards, but it was ultimately down to the director. The calendar wasn't the schedule. The calendar was a list of events coming over the next month, though sometimes there was notice of something coming months later. Armsmaster would usually pull in Miss Militia and Triumph to help make the top-level decisions. Already, some roles were penned in. Triumph and Gallant were down for the video game thing, probably because they were the only ones who hadn't sat in yet. Velocity's name filled in a blank beside an event at a conference with Maine State Law Enforcement. No reason given for that. A long way to travel, maybe. There were a lot of shorthand codes and notes by each entry. One person was to give presentations at every school in the city. The shorthand indicated they needed to write up a draft of what they would present and get it cleared. There was a lot of work, which was probably why it was indicated with a B, or pay bonus. The director wanted to step things up with crisis points, checking in with victims and the vulnerable. There was room for two names there, accelerated schedule, more work, no bonus indicated. There was work with local law enforcement, giving them the rundown on the powers and the gangs, a refresher on what to do in a given circumstance, as well as policies for different classifications, and then a stint of increased coordination after that, riding along. The job included babysitting wards. It was a diversion from normal work, marked with the DFP code, and that meant taking it on would mean reduced patrols for the duration. If someone was recuperating from an injury or scare, the bosses would usually pen them in for something like that. Morning TV and radio. Everyone knew that was a trap, but the people at the very top of the PRT wanted to push high visibility and approachability, and it was important a lot of people start the occasional days hearing from the heroes. 
it was too easy for the capes to all be denizens of the night. Standing representative at an event opening, Mayor Craig had pledged to reopen the ferry as a campaign promise. Those were always a bore, and if the promise fell through, it'd look bad for the heroes. It was purely a political move, winning points with the mayor that could later be cashed in. The line would remain blank until someone needed punishment detail. That someone would probably be assault. And someone, it seemed, would be getting a vacation. A trip to Toronto, where a TV show was being filmed. Just about every television drama had its token cape episode, if capes weren't a casual background element. A recognition that powers were a thing, for a single episode or three episode story arc. Even the mention that a protectorate cape or ward would play a part would provoke interest in the mid-season. He paged through the papers that were part of the bundle. There were more details on the show. Flip, a relationship show with a science fiction premise. Facial prosthetics and partial mask. The role was supposed to be as part of an elite force. Always positive, or the PRT wouldn't sign off on it. Two members of the elite force would be a couple, no doubt because even a whisper of a relationship between capes in real life would stir fans and supporters into a frothing tizzy. You want me to take the TV show? He guessed. Battery had a natural aversion to anything coupley. Please, Battery said. I'm not good in front of cameras, Challenger said. She had a red bodysuit with epaulets that had fine chains dangling from them and other decoration, and with her headgear off, strikingly different facial features, with a very sharp, pronounced chin, lines that joined nose to jaw if she had any expression that wasn't neutral, and very sharply drawn black eyebrows over green eyes. Her hair was damp, and while it was normally straight, when damp it took on a slight curl as though it had been finely braided. There were capes who didn't wear full masks, and who used makeup, wigs, or altered their hair to change their costumed identities. There were also ones like Challenger, who were normal in costume, and who went to more extreme measures out of costume. Her headgear, which was in her hand, was a chin strap, ear cover, and a diagonal blindfold that covered one of her eyes. She'd lost her sight in the eye after an incident in a past city. She walked a final line with identity given the lack of a full face helmet or cover, and with her features being the kind that someone would take notice of, he could understand her not wanting the scrutiny that came with the television camera. "'Why not you?' he asked Battery. "'Why do you want me to take this?' "'If I go, Assault will want to go too. Miss Militia warned me it was possible and they would jump at the chance.' "'Ah.' He wasn't sure what to say to that. There were a lot of times, he found, that he couldn't seem to find the right words. He knew Assault and Battery were dating, they'd formally told the people in charge, but didn't seem to him like it was a good thing. Already she was playing defensive, making excuses, and pulling strings to avoid the bad instead of seeking the good. Please? I'll have to talk to my wife. If I can take Addison to see Toronto, then I might, he said. It pays? It pays a lot. It's in the last few pages. He flipped through. 65,000 an episode, two episodes. To be filmed across nine days. Reduced taxes paid on said income, because PRT work was technically government work. He didn't need the money for himself. That wasn't an aspiration. He had been happy living in a van with a girl he loved who loved him back, running into town twice a week for groceries and catching his own meat. Addison's education fund was at its limit. Anything more would be excess. Jennifer would probably like more things for the house, but Jennifer was constantly on the lookout for the next move up, and now that they lived in the Towers, the nicest area in Brockton Bay, she was hinting at possible moves to other cities. He had the charity he'd set up out of respect for Kel, but if he did a few episodes of television, Jennifer would wonder where the money ended up. It would put him in the position of lying or justifying the charity again but he really did want to help those guys out. Battery shifted her weight. He glanced up at her, and he was struck by a thought that he judged her an assault by a measure he wasn't applying to himself and Jennifer. The problem was, Jennifer was really, really good for Addison. I'll think about it. I'll give you an answer before tomorrow morning. If it's a yes, you can forge my signature on there and pretend it was always there. Thank you, Battery said. I can't promise yes. 
Thank you, though, she said. You're not due to patrol yet, right? Not yet, he said. He glanced out the window. The sunset had changed dramatically over the course of the conversation and reading. But if you cover the last bit of my schedule, it'll give me more time to convince my wife. I can do that, Battery said. Do you want a ward? Sure, he said, smiling. At best, they were some terrific kids. At worst, they were good training for dealing with teenagers with issues, in case Addison ended up struggling. They made their way down to the platform, where the bikes were all arranged in a row. Aegis, Gallant, and Kidwin were there, eating sandwiches from the vendor who was set up in one corner to serve staff. No vista? he asked them. I thought she was coming tonight. She's missing it because her grades slipped, and she's really mad about it, Gallant said. Are you coming? Yeah. Stretch my legs some. Enjoy the nice weather. Crack some skulls, Challenger said, as she fit her headgear into place. Challenger said, as she fit her headgear into place. No, Battery said. We avoid trouble while we've got the wards riding along. Or we set a good example. Challenger rolled her eye, looking at Aegis, who matched the expression. Good example indeed. She gave Kidwin a push on the shoulder, and he looked uneasy in smile and posture both. Are you biking? Kidwin asked. Yeah, Dauntless replied. You can't fly yet? Dauntless tested his power, feeling out for the boots and activating them. He lifted himself up into the air, but it was shaky, too brief before the power burned out. It would enhance his leaps and bounds, but not flying, not yet. He'd wanted firepower first. There were a few people around the city who were pretty scary. The Nazis. Lung and Lung's flunky Oni Lee. That's too bad, Gallant said. Soon, Dauntless said. We were talking about who would ride with who, Gallant said. Can I ride with you? Kid win with battery? I seem to be left out. Challenger groused. You get me, he just pointed out. You fly, and you'll fly off if given the choice, Challenger replied. She opened a locked case in the wall and lifted down her axe, a weapon as tall as she was. She held it with one hand and grabbed her rifle, which was similarly proportioned. Each weapon was mounted on one side of her bike, which had been repainted. No vehicle tech yet? Dauntless asked Kidwin. He got a shake of the head in response. Battery goes five miles an hour over the speed limit max, Gallant murmured. Challenger rides like a maniac. Kidwin was scared to ride with her, and I was preparing myself to be nice, but I'm glad I don't have to. Got it, Dauntless said. I could mention it to people if you wanted. Maybe, Gallant said, in the young teenager way that signaled a yes. They divided up the city. Dauntless climbed onto the bike, Gallant climbed on behind. Kid Wynn got on behind Battery, and Challenger revved her bike's engines. As Battery input the details for the people managing the floating HQ's force fields, Dauntless leaned to one side to look at Gallant over one shoulder. I need to call home. If you could turn a deaf ear to that? I'll put my music on. Tap my knee when you're done. The force field bubble flickered off. The hue of the sky changed, and that wasn't just his own perception. With the light reflecting off of the bubble, it tinted the clouds above in rainbow hues. The dropping of the bubble was something people across the city would notice. In a way, it signaled that evildoers and criminals should beware. Challenger roared off, speeding toward the platform's edge, even before the force field path over the water had been fully laid out. Headed to the boardwalk and the docks. She popped a wheelie, even. Battery was next. She sometimes liked to go full speed when they had the clear, straight path over the water, then ride more conservatively in the city, but with Kid Wynn on board, she was more moderate. Dauntless took off. His path was curved, the start of it extending off the south edge of the platform, the curve sweeping out over the bay itself, the final length of the force field path pointing west. He was headed downtown. The curve wasn't perfectly flat, with a slight dip to his right and a rise to his left, and he'd always liked that, that he tilted at an angle to meet the curve squarely. 
He exaggerated the effect for Gallant's benefit until they were almost horizontal and put his boot out. It glowed, providing some propulsion and helped stabilize them. Gallant whooped. Jennifer picked up while Gallant was still making noise. Early patrol tonight. Batteries covering the later shift. I'll be coming home early. I'll see Addison before he goes to bed. He'll like that. Should I keep dinner warm? Please. There was a brief exchange to follow. He had a sinking feeling as it concluded. That thought that had passed through his mind as he'd talked to Battery wasn't leaving him. He'd loved more than a few people over the course of his life. Addison. Kelly, Jennifer, some other women over the years. In a way, he loved his team and the wards. He was fond of some people from the charity, and he'd loved that they'd been receptive to his wavelength and what he wanted to do. Kel's way wasn't the right way, but it had been a way forward. With the money and resources he'd put in, the charity helped ensure more teenagers with mental health problems or other crises had a way forward. But when it came to receiving and feeling love, though he had a growing number of fans and supporters in the community, and he'd married a beautiful woman who had beamed on their wedding day, it rarely registered. It only felt like real love with Addison, and back in the days with Kelly. He and Gallant sped forward, a mostly invisible bridge between them and the roiling water. The wind whipped by, and the engine of the bike vibrated beneath them, powerful, special issue. With his thumb, he flipped through settings on the bike, cheating a little. He reached the end of the glowing force field and entered the city proper, still going faster than he should. The bike's onboard computers were hooked into the traffic network. People at red lights were treated to flashing signs in the corners to warn them that the light wasn't about to turn green. The coast was clear to sail through the first few intersections. The city worked with him. The flow of traffic was his flow. To better stabilise with his nascent flight, he put more power into his boots. The power crackled and danced around his feet before solidifying, pressing further in until there was something almost crystalline about the configuration. He could see the facets, the power, and he could see the shape of what it was doing. He couldn't decide the end results, but the results made sense, given what the object was and what he was doing with it. It meant a little something, this headway. Done digesting? Sean asked. He was as nervous talking to his son as he was on any first date or first day of the job. As nervous as he'd been when stepping up to participate in his first costumed fight against Blackball. A thirteen-year-old Addison sat at the kitchen counter, his laptop beside him. The boxes from their recent move were still unpacked. I'll start with the obvious. It's not a desk job? Addison asked. No, Sean said. Sometimes, a lot of the time, but no. Addison was thoughtful, prone to his own ruminations. He was almost a carbon copy of Kelly, dark in style but always well-meaning, with a lot going on beneath that mop of black hair that hung too far into his eyes. The girls in his class were bananas crazy about him, to use phrasing he'd heard from one of Addison's female friends, a fact which seemed to fluster his son twice as much as it pleased him. Sean had learned Addison liked to have time to process things, or he got easily frustrated. He'd provided the information, the full information about who his dad was, with helmet set on the kitchen counter as some evidence, then let Addison have the space to work his way through it. He'd done the same with punishments, letting Addison think about what he'd done wrong before they talked about it. He'd done it when Sean's dad had died. He'd really fucking wish Jennifer had done it when dropping the news about the divorce, but there was nothing he could do about that. The issue was, the approach had a way of moving things to the far other extreme of the spectrum of reactions. Addison seemed disconcertingly calm about it all. Okay, Addison said. I understand why you lied. For the record, Sean said, I didn't lie. When I told you I had paperwork, I was telling the truth. When I said I'd be late, I wasn't mentioning I was busy wearing a costume. Addison nodded. I felt it was important not to lie to your face. 
Okay, Addison said. Thanks, I guess. I understand why you did it. Okay, Sean responded. He felt very aware of the pause. Any questions? When you said I should be careful about if I inherit Mum's whole... Addison gestured at his head. That wasn't Mum's whole thing, Sean said. It was one part of your mum that wasn't in the top three defining qualities about her, just so you know. She was luckier than some, but even if she wasn't, it wouldn't be her in whole. Bad word, sorry, Addison said. He seemed to ruminate for a second before asking, It wasn't code for superhero stuff? No, but you might get powers because I have them. Wow. Addison said, voice dry. Whichever parent I get something from, it's going to be interesting. Fuck. Could be neither. Could be both. Could, Sean said, feeling that nervousness again. I looked you up. Dauntless. And? And there was this interview question. It's on video. Addison turned the laptop 90 degrees. Sean approached his son, one hand touching his back, and leaned down to better see. It meant a hell of a lot that Addison didn't shy away or react to the proximity or the touch. One of the school events. I heard that you get powers from being awesome, a girl on the screen said, the camera struggling to find her, focusing in only as she finished saying awesome. Can you tell us what you did? The question evoked a lot of defensive squabbling, some students protesting that you couldn't ask that sort of thing. Even some teachers were ready to protect his identity. I can't tell you the exact details, but I saved a life, the Dauntless on screen said. One that meant everything to me. Addison glanced from screen to his dad. I did. It's not the exact truth, but I did save a life. Yours. It was much too panicked to be something that I'm proud of, but I saved you, and I'm proud of that. You're not going to explain it anymore? When you're a bit older. His son gave him a look. As far as Addison was concerned, he was old enough for everything now. But the response was a calm... Okay. Why? I was just wondering who you are, I guess. The words hurt. Who Dauntless is, Addison clarified. Maybe he'd seen the hurt. He's me, trying to do my best. Why tell me now? Because you're about the right age to possibly get powers. And because Jennifer's moving away, I don't have someone helping cover my tracks, and you're too damn smart. I can't hide it, and I'd rather tell you than get caught. Addison nodded. Addison's hand gripped the fabric at the back of Sean's shirt, and a moment later the boy was standing, hugging him. He hugged back, fierce. I'm going to worry, Addison said. That's allowed. I'm sorry you have to. I saw some other stuff. Fights. Yeah. I'm backed by some good people, and I'm good at it. But yeah. Call me. Every time you're back and safe, keep me updated. Not the usual 13-year-old. He was a sensitive soul, and one that was feeling hurt and bewildered by the divorce. This timing hadn't been the best. I promise. Oh, about covering tracks and hiding it? Addison said. He broke the hug and picked up the helmet, feeling its weight in his hands. I invited Mo over to help me unpack... She's coming in 20 minutes. Mo. I like Mo, Sean said. She was Addison's friend who had remarked about how crazy the girls in the class were over him. She was very much on Addison's wavelength, with the friendship clicking so easily and quickly they seemed to just belong together, but she hadn't indicated any interest as of yet. Sean found himself secretly rooting for the two, but he didn't want to force things. You say that a lot. 
If she wants to help, we should ensure she's rewarded for her efforts. She's not going to work. She'll keep me company and read my comics while I do the unpacking. Tell her that if she helps some, and helps the two of us move some furniture around, she can decide what we order for dinner. Addison rolled his eyes. No. She likes Greek. All right. Greek. I'll look up some places. There's a place downtown. Zervis. We ate there a week ago. It's awesome. Sean gave his son a kiss on the top of the head. Got it. We're going to a movie later. I don't suppose you'd give me some money? For the two of you? Yes. There'll be five of us. If you and Mo get some real unpacking done and help me move furniture, I'll pay for the two of you. I'll give you all a ride if... Addison was making a face at that last sentence. Okay. No ride. But let me know what the plan is before you leave. Can everyone hang here before we head to the movie? Addison asked. How much can I milk you feeling guilty? That much. Go clean up a bit before she comes, he said. He didn't mention that he wasn't motivated by the guilt. Addison was sharp, but he wasn't right about everything. Those scary days would come in a few years, Sean guessed. It's so crazy that you're a superhero, Addison said. I'm going to tell everyone. Don't, Sean said, stern, fully aware Addison was joking. Not even Mo. Not before talking to me about it first. That got him a nod. The helmet was handed back to him, and Addison picked up his laptop before heading to his room. The helmet did have some heft to it, Sean found. He bounced it in his hands, feeling that weight. Concentrating, he tapped into that reserve of power he felt inside himself and crystallized that power into the helmet's capabilities. Sensory, protective, and some general shielding capabilities. Your kid is pretty great, he told Kelly, looking down at the helmet, which now glowed white hot, the energy arcing along its length and width. He'd heard the air raid sirens, and was out of bed and dressed before the phone call came in. He pulled on his dauntless boots, checked his power. The phone rang, and he answered mid-ring. Where and how bad? Here, Miss Militia answered. Leviathan, he thinks. Sent you the location as I made the call. I'll be there. I need to contact the others. Good luck, Sean. He hadn't wanted to hear that. Good luck. You too, Hannah, he told her. She hung up. Addison was out of bed, pulling a shirt on. He looked in through the bedroom doorway, clearly alarmed and trying to hide it. Get ready. Boots. Jacket. What is it? What is it? Leviathan, Sean said. Oh. Addison breathed the word. He's attacking Boston or something? Brockton Bay, Sean said. He wouldn't start lying now. Get ready. But you... The best thing you can do for me is to get ready, as soon as possible. I want you somewhere safe, then I can focus. You're going to fight? Sean opened his mouth to say something. Addison seemed to shake himself out of it, and didn't even wait for the answer to the question. He was gone, feet tromping as he ran down the hall. The rest of his dauntless gear went into a gym bag. He pulled on a jacket, flipping up the hood well in advance of stepping outside. He lifted the gym bag, and had to put straps over his shoulder because of the weight of it. Addy was waiting in the hallway as he emerged, shoes on, coat on, ready to go. Come on. You could back out. You get stronger every day if you skipped the one. Addison, no. He guided Addison toward the door. Outside the front window of the house, he could see other people had emerged from their homes. Some wore night clothes and were looking around for guidance. Others were dressed and were hurrying in the directions they were supposed to go, for the nearest shelter. If you skipped this, wouldn't you get so much stronger for the next one? I could skip that one for the fight that comes after, he answered, and the one that comes after that. We don't know if my power has a limit, but it's possible it does and the time I supposedly buy ends up being for nothing. 
This is my city, Addison. A city with you in it, with Jennifer, with your friends, your teachers, the places you love. There's never going to be a place that I'll step up to defend faster or with more conviction than our city. Okay, Addison said. He didn't sound like it was okay. Fourteen now, and still soft-spoken, still not fond of sudden twists or things being sprung on him. Nobody is here. Get dressed and hurry to the shelter, Mr. Combe. Sean raised his voice, calling out across the street. The elderly Mr. Combe turned around, hurrying inside. In another circumstance, Sean would have helped the man. In this circumstance, he tried to tell himself he was still helping by going to the front lines. Robin lived a couple of blocks away, and had made a beeline for him right away. The Pelhams lived in the neighbourhood too. Not a neighbourhood of Jennifer's level of taste, but a nice area. Robin was staying human, jogging over at a normal speed, one hand in pocket, the other with phone pressed to ear. He had a grim look on his face. Neil and Eric were nearby, both in costume already. Sean idly wondered if they slept in the things, or if they hadn't slept at all last night and had been on their way back from patrol. The bombings had only calmed down a short while ago, and they had been immediately followed up by the attacks by Empire 88 with Purity's rampage. Eric raised a hand to wave hi to Addison. Addison raised a hand in response. Because of the periodic barbecue and because they both went to the same cape-safe therapist, the two had found each other in the same circles, enough to know names and talk about movies or shows. A light rain already pattered down around them. Hey, Robin said as he caught up. He laid a hand on Dauntless's shoulder. Hi, Addison. Hi. You good to go? Sean nodded. As soon as I've taken care of Addison. That's fine. It's not far. We're heading over now. Even Eric? Addison asked. Yeah, Robin said. Even Eric. There weren't any parting words. No urging to come, no commentary on the possibility he could take his son and simply make a break for it to get as far away as possible. They all had to. Sean led his son along with the crowd toward the archives building. Government owned, and that always made setting up the shelter easier. The stairs were packed with people, with police managing the flow of people in past the circular bank vault-like door. Jean, Sean called out, a neighbour. Jean jogged over. Look after him? he asked her. I don't need looking after. I don't need looking after. Are you sure? Jean asked. I have to... Sean started. He couldn't finish the sentence. Mr. Combe needs help, Addison said. If I can't get him to this shelter or if it hits capacity in the meantime, I'll go to the one at the library. Please. Jean nodded. He dropped to his knees, the heavy gym bag making some noise as it landed. He was aware he was getting his knees and things wet. He pulled Addison into a hug that was probably too tight. A dumb thing to do, as he buried his face into his son's neck. He couldn't bring himself to let go. Call me as soon as... He nodded. It was Addison who pulled away, turning his back immediately to go to Jean, who he only casually knew hugging her with one arm. He was just tall enough to put his head against her shoulder. Jean turned and gave Sean a somber nod. She probably knew. The times he'd called her over to watch things because of an emergency call, especially when the bombings had been happening. He watched Addison go for longer than he should have. Had he left sooner, he wouldn't have seen Addison rub at his eyes. He hefted his bag, turning his back to the scene. He didn't wait until he was fully in the clear before using his boots to lift himself off the ground. He flew up to a rooftop and let the bag fall. Piece by piece, he strapped on his armour. Some of it had only received a few crystallizations of power. But the spear, in multiple pieces that he screwed together, the shield, which was small at the outset, and his helmet were all things he'd focused on over the years. He left spare clothes and the gym bag behind. It didn't matter. The cloud of heaviest rain was advancing steadily toward the bay. Armsmaster had been right. The guy was an asshole who had it in for him from the start, but he didn't screw up when it came to things like this. 
Clock Blocker and Browbeat were on the scene, standing outside the building and waiting for everyone to arrive. They stared out over dark water. There was a crack, a boom, and Strider came in with a group, the teleportation contractor the PRT had been using recently. Strapping Lad, Young Buck, Chronicler and Exalt were in that group. Idolin was head and shoulders above them all, and rose even higher as he took flight. Surveying the threat and the city, taking note of Dauntless and a few of the other flyers who were doing similar things, Lady Photon was up here. Idolin dropped out of the sky, landing in a clear spot by the building entrance. The people in the way parted to let him through. They've wondered out loud if I would become like you, Dauntless thought. How many years? I never asked for it but it's not impossible. The image of his son wiping away tears stayed with him. Addison had tried to hide it for just this reason, he guessed, to avoid distracting. They had been rescued a little while after Addison had been born, and Kel had gone to the hospital. He couldn't claim to understand the thought processes that had driven her to refuse visitation, or the piece of legalese that had been mailed to his parents because she didn't know where else to contact him forfeiting her parental rights. Panic, maybe. Maybe self-doubt. She had never believed in herself enough, and he'd wondered in retrospect if her calm in that buried van had been because she no longer had to worry about herself and her role in it all. He desperately, desperately wished she'd stayed, but she'd needed to do what was good for her, and he needed to do what was good for Addison. So he'd signed, and he'd done his best. He'd avoided saying an unkind word about her to their son, and he'd organised the charity to do what he could to avoid a similar heartbreak from happening again. Jennifer had told him he put too much on his son's shoulders. He had the day's power to allocate, a fractional bonus to one of his items, the kind of thing that likely wouldn't make a difference, but felt important. Weapon, to better hurt the thing. Helmet, to better understand it. Think faster in a pinch. Boots? To move out of the way? Breastplate? Something he'd neglected. Potentially to turn something lethal into something he could survive. He was struck by the thought of dying in muck, partially paralysed. And he thought of Kel. He infused the breastplate, channeling the power in there, hand over heart. He's every bit like you. Every good part. He stared at the approaching storm, then dropped down to the ground, pulsing boots on and off to lower himself. I do this for him. Boots, was the thought, as the tail snaked around him. The Leviathan had him, and he'd just been a little too slow to get out of the way. If he'd infused the boots, then maybe... He was flung, with a force he knew would kill him. He used his boots to try to slow the movement. He didn't die. Things around him flickered, then dissipated. No rain, no dust, no debris. The crowd of people around the space was a blur, viewed through a screen that was beaded with an uneven layer of water. The crowd mutated, drew close, disappeared, each of those things happening in eye blinks. No, was his thought, and things around him moved in the time it took him to form that thought. The tail end of that single word was coupled with the dawning realisation he had power available. Not one day, not ten, not fifteen, not thirty or sixty or ninety. No, was the follow-up thought. His hand couldn't meet anything before he had another ninety or more days pass. Instead, He pushed power from head to helm. He didn't get to choose what happened, but what happened made sense. His thoughts slowed, and though his body was trapped in time, moving with glacial slowness, those ninety days of accumulated power were spent in the helm, giving him control over the speed of his own thinking, which put him in the circumstance of being trapped, unable to do anything but think. Initially, he fought. He had some residual power, like change left over after he'd spent the bulk on his helmet, and that power was spent on boots, on weapon. 
as if he could force himself free with enough power from the boots or enough offensive power from his spear. His arc lance, as the PRT had dubbed it. Now he was aware of the days moving past him at normal speeds. The world beyond was mottled, pollen and dust and construction materials settled on the surface of the globe. He had 24 hours without sleeping to break it up, to decide on each allocation of power. Helmet. In hopes of reversing this trap he'd found with his mind moving at normal speed while his body remained frozen, or of finding a better way out. Another day followed, where he felt like he looked back on every decision he'd made in his life, prayed to every deity he could think of, and he realized it was possible Alabaster was in much the same circumstance. At set intervals, Alabaster reverted states, going back to the one he was in when he had entered this time-slowing bubble. It was possible Alabaster was in the same circumstance he was, and had been from the start. Helmet again. Another 24 hours. It had only been what felt like a day, and already the events that played and replayed in his mind became distorted. He couldn't help going back to them at the same time. He felt like his ego was disintegrating in this space where nothing could happen. He watched the world beyond the bubble, silhouettes moving throughout a rebuilding boardwalk, and tried to divine particulars or hints about the outcome, who might have survived. There was a festival to close out the evening. The music was muffled, as if from a house next door, but it did a lot to stave off the low points in the circular thinking. The sun rose, and he had another choice. Helmet because anything else would offer only the smallest benefit, and he knew he had a long way to go. On the third day, he almost managed to convince himself that some individual parts of his past were fictional, figments of his imagination. Almost. Noon came around, and a group of young students passed through the area. Some came to see him. A teacher or someone followed them, and one of them read off the placard. He hadn't been aware there was a third person in here. Again there was a festival. He could have wept, he was so grateful for the stimulation. It lasted until what had to be one or two in the morning. People slept. He found himself remaining where he was, doubting everything. Sunrise came. With it he had more power to give. Again he chose the helmet. His perception of the world beyond the bubble clarified. And so it went. Helmet, helmet, helmet. For 23 days. By the 23rd, he was capable of seeing and hearing everything that went on in the buildings nearby. Businesses. He watched people like he would watch bad television. Every visit was a panacea for the soul. He learned the faces of the repeat visitors and he learned the whys. Some came from out of state. It meant something in this place where meaning was lost to a black, insensate void. He constructed elaborate storylines in his head, of his own devising, ones where he and Kelly had tried to raise Addison together, and it had been hard, but Addison had turned out much the same, because it was hard to improve Addison. Anything else would have broken his own suspension of disbelief. One storyline a day, to answer a question or to explore a theory. He lost count of the days, but he estimated where he'd been, and he counted from that estimate forward. With the helmet giving him the ability to construct better thoughts and see much of the city around him, forward and backward, he built up his ideas and theorized. He unraveled what had happened and to whom, and tallied up a mental list of people to investigate. He picked a person he knew and didn't know the outcome for, and he searched everybody nearby to try and decipher what had become of them. Whole days were lost to despair that ate at him, and left him unable to think straight for more days afterwards. He focused on the boots, and on the other things. He balanced certain lines of thinking with certain applications, to see if it felt different. Hundreds of days in, so fast he'd thought he'd reverted to that accelerated time, the city crumbled. A flash of light, and the buildings fell, giving him a view of the water, of water frothing and foaming as waterside properties tipped into it. For nine days after that, people tried to pick up the pieces. On the tenth day, they mostly disappeared, leaving only stragglers. 
With every passing moment, he scoured and scanned those stragglers, used every awareness at his disposal to try to decipher, investigate, and see if they knew anyone or had seen anyone. Had one said Addison for any reason at all, it might have stoked some hope. By the thirtieth day, after the city fell, the people who had remained were gone. Many were dead, unable to survive or sick. Others left for places where food would be more plentiful. He pushed and tried to push his awareness through the distorted portal in the belly of the city, and no matter the investment, he couldn't. There was only the water now. Watching the weeds growing into the cracks, tracking the wildlife, and the steady resurgence of those species best able to survive. He mourned the world, and he vowed that if this was it, if this was the end perpetrated at the hands of their best hero, then he would retain some ability to explain what had happened, if somehow something else were to come and pay a visit. A deity, an alien, a person from the past or from the future. He was the most powerful person on their earth, as far as he could tell, and possibly their most helpless. Easy, when he was one of the only ones left. The bubble popped. His body was freed, and his body was utterly trapped. He'd infused power into every article of clothing he owned, sometimes years' worth of power, and that power had come due. Every time he had passed on power to his helmet, it had shifted imperceptibly, to become something mythic, something to be proud of. Now, however, it all came due at once. His helmet was a crown, extending up and above him like a skyscraper, impossibly tall. He might have snapped into pieces, but other articles worked their way into it. He'd called it a crystallization once, and now the crystal crept over him. There had been ten thousand times he'd snapped while in that bubble. Ten thousand times he'd broken from reality, broken from memory, from hope, from everything. And in those moments, he'd glimpsed something greater. For longer and longer each time. Each effort a vain attempt by his collaborator, his agent, to form a connection and reach out. But that wasn't how this worked. He didn't get to have connections. That hadn't been the unspoken bargain he'd apparently struck. He didn't get the tools to better cut and cauterize wounds and save his son's mother for nothing. But it had tried, and as with the helmet and the rest of that crystallized effort, he felt it come due. Connections. Enough connections to the Nazi to pull him apart and draw the composite pieces into the crystallization. All were broken connections, reaching out to other broken things to find the most tenuous purchase. But if the crystal was machinery and the agent the power source, then the connection let him have a hand on the wheel. It was enough to keep himself up, once he'd grown enough that it was ungainly. The connection came, and the connection stayed. He saw enough. You're going to have to explain, Victoria said, whispering, because if you can make any sense at all out of this... She hovered over a ledge, and that ledge overlooked the distant sight, a figure so tall his heads were in the clouds. The growth that extended up from the head was fractal, geometric, crystal, but with veins instead of straight lines. That growing extended to the legs, starting at the feet and working its way up. A skirt, a dress, a lower body that was a mountain. Limbs and body, all in the rough silhouette of a giant, a titan writ in a strike of white lightning that didn't budge, flicker, readily change shape nor stop. We mentioned it was a structural issue, Harbinger 2 said. Where to start? Harbinger 3 asked. I'd start by outlining that you have an array. One connects to two, connects to three. No numbers, Swansong growled. No numbers, Victoria agreed. Harbinger 3 sighed. 
Then you have an alphabet. A connects to B connects to C, and you tend to end with X, Y, Z. Sometimes there's a wrinkle in the works, and A connects to L, G, E, B, R, and... No numbers, Swan Song said. It's a word, Harbinger 3 said. At the same time, Harbinger 2 said, Not a number, and Harbinger 5 said, It isn't. Carry on, Victoria said. Swan Song audibly harumphed. Connects back around to A, Harbinger 3 said. And it connects to P, P again, L and E. But the underlying structure is gone. A flounders, trying to find a connection to anything. And in the process, it finds a connection to P, O. Enough, Victoria said. I appreciate the explanation, but I'm too tired to have people spell things out for me. Abbreviate? Like a localized misspelled apocalypse, Harbinger 5 said. You get things meant for endings at the beginning, like Z, and that connects to E, which connects to everything, and a few steps later, nothing. Houses of cards that shouldn't stack up that do, and cards that should that don't. But they will, by process of natural selection, form their own wills, as we see here. He thinks? Capricorn asked. His armor was in tatters. We think he's been thinking this whole time, the harbinger said. Fuck, Capricorn said. He blurred. He shifted, tattered red plate armor to tattered blue scale mail. Fuck, Capricorn said again. Nobody deserves that. And now we get to see what that all added up to, Harbinger 2 said. No numbers, Swan Song said. No math terms. Added up. Wholly accidental, the Harbinger said before turning to wink at one of his brothers. There was no humour on any other faces. The dauntless titan stood in the ruins of Brockton Bay, mostly unmoving. He, or it, was there in Earth Gimel, and he was there in Earth Bet at the same time. He was in an equivalent location in Earth Cheat, in Earth N, and every Earth they were aware of. As well as many they weren't. He reached out, his range unfiltered now by a bubble of compressed time. He deciphered everything he'd tallied up as answers he needed to seek out. He found what he was looking for, and he reached out. Not gently enough. His efforts at speaking were blunt, and destroyed more machines than he could easily count, in many worlds. Better not to move, to wait. It took nearly eight hours, but Dauntless's son came. The boy drove in a truck, and he reached the perimeter that capes and other forces had gathered as a just-in-case measure. They let Addison through, along with Addison's wife. Not Mo, which disappointed Dauntless, but a pretty young lady, with a child in her stomach. He couldn't speak, and he couldn't trust himself to move, so he listened. Addison had found his mother, and the two had cobbled together an uneasy relationship. There was that. He'd had holidays with that neighbour Jean, who'd taken up a role, and who had taken it on herself to look after Addison well past the point anyone sane would do so, and he'd periodically visited with Jennifer, his stepmom, who took on the role of the aunt and manager of Sean's estate. Dauntless's son was okay, and that was what was important. After a couple of hours, they decided to leave. Satisfied, it thought, to that colonel of Dauntless. He was. A terrible weight, and an even more terrible pain had been lifted, somehow, by that relatively brief visit. It remained where it was, waiting. It waited and watched, even as the forces arrayed around it readied for an assault, panicked, then retreated. Up here the air was so thin that Dauntless's thoughts buzzed. Buried in crystal, he was almost claustrophobic, his thoughts running away from him. But he didn't let them. He could only remain where he was. 
The reason for the panic and the imminent assault hadn't been him, but another guest. She settled on one arm, comparatively tiny, a weight on one arm and on one shoulder. Feathered wings draped his arm. And she cried. And the cries were pitched to pull at the heartstrings and to tug at the mind. He couldn't step into another room or walk away to leave those cries behind to find a chance to breathe. And he was tired, in a way that would have made it so easy to believe anything anyone told him. He dwelt on that weight on his arm, his power illuminating every world around him, some occupied, many not. There was no more power inside him to give. For now he could only wait, endure as he'd endured for four years. He had his son and all the people he'd come to love, who'd loved him and visited him in his bubble, and that was the most significant thing. Arc 12. Heavens. Interlude. When the television cut out and the lights flickered, Presley could see a momentary set of images on the screen, a face in silhouette, that silhouette serving as its own frame for another image in silhouette, leading the eye to a place before it all went dark and terminated early. The sound was a single syllable, as loud as the television would allow. She was about to rise from her seat at her computer when the icon in the upper right corner drew her attention. No internet. Oh shit! She heard the creak of footsteps. Shit, she muttered. What was that? The knock at the door served as both knock and simultaneous push on door. Her mom leaned into the room. The internet's out, Presley complained. The internet's out all the time, Press. She clicked the icon. It didn't try for more than a second before returning the fail result. It's really out. They'll fix it. They've been good about it. Maybe you can focus on better things. Soccer's only twice a week, and we can't practice outside. What about afternoon classes? Her mom asked, archly. Cleaning up? A finger moved around the room. The house was the kind that had come in pieces that all slotted together. Presley was offended that her mother pointed at the cards she'd slotted into the seams where the upper half of her bedroom fit into the lower half. The top row was soccer cards, the lower row was superhero cards, and there was a very small section in the narrow space between wall and window on another wall of the room where she had Hero League soccer cards. Nobody was interested in trading them, and everyone knew it was about as real as wrestling, but they were cheap, and she could always grab a few packs if she had change left over. Presley rolled her eyes as her mom's finger pointed at the different messes, pointing at some twice. Go to sleep early, her mom said, more gently. Do you need a ride to the arena tomorrow? I'd check what the weather is like if there was internet or a weather channel, Presley said. She saw the face her mom made, and she smiled. Let me know. For now, go to sleep, her mother said. She intruded into the room, approached Presley's desk, and there wasn't anything Presley could say about it because the rule that was that computer time was parents could enter the room time. Her mother laid a hand on top of her head, stroking hair that had been made a bit crispy by the bleach, and gave her a kiss goodnight, between two fingers on hair. Night, Mom. Her mom pointed at the screen. There was a row of soccer cards displayed, with players standing behind them, stats displayed along the bottom. It was a good booster, too, but the no connection sign was glaring red, and the way the soccer game worked, a purchase that failed partway through was a loss, to prevent scrubbing. I'm not spending any of my money on it. They give you five packs for free, and I buy more with the currency I get from trading up. Okay, okay. Be careful. And I don't really care about that, even if it was a good pack. 
The team had something big going on, I think. I wanted to ask if they were okay. She pointed to make it clear which team she meant. She had three printed out pictures above and below the Hero League cards, each picture in a clear plastic jacket like the cards were in hard laminate sleeves, less to protect them, and more because the cheap printer paper had gotten wavy after the ink soaked into it, and the sleeve helped to keep it flat. Antares and Swansong. Swansong decked out in costume with eyes smoking and a picture of their headquarters, which was just as messy as her room if not more, and had a glowing sci-fi computer terminal at the far end, with lots of floating screens and stuff which was really cool. Don't bother the team, her mom said, with the kind of emphasis that suggested she was trying to be clever or make a point. She turned off the monitor, which made Presley wince. At least she hadn't turned off the computer, which would have definitely cost her the value of the pack. Sleep. Presley nodded, sliding chair over to the window to adjust the curtains. She stopped where she was, looking out. Her voice had a less sure note to it when she said, Mom? Rather than close, the curtains were opened wider, her mother stepping up to the window. A glowing figure on the horizon. Taller than any mountain, not glowing, but so white that it looked like a cutout from reality, head extending up like a wedge, lower body extending down the same way, creating a very narrow hourglass shape, but with a narrow torso in the center, with arms, what looked like a lightning bolt or a spear, and what might have been a round shield. With it, there was a horrible feeling in her middle. It was like when the Endbringers came. All her life, the years had been punctuated by these big, shadowy monsters that came and changed the tone of the day and the week after, in what she'd once heard a bad comedian call the opposite of holidays. It had always come with a bad feeling mixed with a bad relief that it had been so far away. The kind of relief that made you feel bad. Except she didn't feel that relief now, and she didn't feel any less bad. What do we do? I'm going to talk to your father. Stay here. Presley nodded. No, her mom said before she'd finished walking out of the room. Not here. Not by the window. Just in case, stay away. Presley took a step to one side, so the window was further away. She could have stepped toward the bed and settled in there, but hiding under the covers felt like such a kid thing to do, and she wasn't really a kid anymore. And being where she was, she could see the photos of the team. Something big, they'd said. This had to be what they were doing. And, being where she was, she could turn on the monitor, maneuver the trackball to the internet icon, and see if it was back. There was some connection, but it was yellow, marked low priority. That was pretty usual for when big emergencies happened. She typed out a response, leaning over to glance out the window at the figure. It wasn't moving. The delay after her message was sent ate at her. Then the reply, from Antares. We're waiting and seeing. It didn't ease her worries exactly. But if Antares was replying, then things couldn't be that bad. She confirmed the pack opening, closed the game, and then called out, Mom! Dad! They replied! Lookout moved her hands, and through the link that Darlene provided, Candy could feel the motions in hand and attached finger, and moved appropriately. C. Apostrophe. One, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, one, one. I think you're making this up, Candy said, her hand moving to hit the keys. When she wasn't sure, she waited for the word that told her what she was supposed to be hitting. I am making this up, Lookout said. I make stuff up and make that stuff work. That's what tinkering is. What are you even doing? Flying a broken camera. It needs coordinates. See? That looks like a screen that's half black, half blue, and covered in gibberish. Ground, air, and data. Calling it a camera is like calling a Swiss Army knife a knife. 
which it is. You use it for the knife a lot, but I want to know everything I'm missing out on. I switch modes and... Clear picture, Candy said. She looked over her shoulder at where Chicken Little was sleeping in the bed across from Lookouts. He'd been medicated so he could actually sleep. They were keeping the mask on, but there were bandages now. Darlene had settled into the chair by his bed. It was the comfortable, puffy sort of chair, and her feet were up on the seat with her. Two blankets were gathered up and around her legs in her lap, piled up to almost chin height, and another was on top of the chair, pulled down a bit so it covered her head and shoulders. She wasn't sleeping, wasn't accepting medication, on excuse of needing to help look out, and she wasn't taking her eyes off of Chicken Little. Blink, Dar. Darlene closed her eyes, then opened them. Focus, Lookout said. Look, clear picture. Sec, Candy dismissed her. Ah, uh, this is important. The mayor showed up, and she has people and... Shh, a nurse said from the hallway. There were two capes from Victoria's mom's team by the door, standing guard. Candy focused instead on Darlene, counting the seconds. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two... Blink more than one time, Darlene, Candy said. Darlene pulled a hand out from under the covers and gave Candy the finger. Surely, Candy muttered. She's hurting, Lookout said, quiet, giving Candy a smile and an elbow to the arm. It sucks. She's been hurt before, Candy said. Nathan pushed her down these concrete stairs that went from the street to the water, and she had to use her power to make him feel it, but he was mad, so he wouldn't. She had to tough it out longer than him before he cracked. But other people are hurt. Her favorite person. She's seen me get hurt, and I was her favorite person once. You still are, Can Can, Darlene muttered. One of them. When you're not being a pest. You can hear me from over there? It's quiet, Darlene said. Candy settled in, lying over the covers while Lookout was beside her, lying on them. Laptop in front of her, the screen swiveled one way, while the keyboard was swiveled in Candy's direction. Darlene had done a lot of the work to help Jury rig the setup, before Lookout got frustrated that she was too distracted. Too distracted and tired. Candy had taken over, and now, on the topic of being frustrated, Lookout was trying to drum her fingers with fingers that weren't there, and Candy could feel it through the link Dar had established. She was antsy. How are you doing? Candy asked. Your hands hurt. We can stop if you want to, Lookout said. Candy was feeling that hurt through the link, but she could grit her teeth and deal with fake pain. Lookout had taken some medication, but every time she tried to move her fingers, her hands hurt, and Candy felt it. No, this is important, right? Lookout nodded before whispering, Thank you. It's important enough I'm doing it even though it hurts to do. Can we, can we do my thing again? Now that you're done talking to Darlene, I'm missing stuff. Okay, Candy said. Help in, gripe out. When people were hurt, it was important to help those closer to the problem and the hurt, and any complaints were saved for those further from it than she was. It was a rule that Samuel's mom had imparted on them before her violent end. There was an inverse of that rule, but it had to do with hurting people related to the source and keeping evidence in. Not so applicable here, only if Aunt Rachel failed and Candy got a chance to go after the people who did it. Slumping down, she adjusted the laptop, which prompted Lookout to adjust the screen. E, I, one, five, can you hold down the right arrow key until I say stop? Candy obeyed. This time, Candy was more careful to be quiet. I can't tell if you and Dar are going to be best friends or if you're going to kill- Stop. Each other. Candy finished. Go back one. What do you mean? The screen showed a bunch of squares and lines, identifying faces, then framing each face. The camera was pointed one way, but somehow depicted the face from another angle. Lips were covered by another, bolder square, and then weird arrangements of letters and symbols appeared. Each was like a dial of letters on a lock that might read A-A-A-A, with the lock cracker changing each letter in turn. In this case, the lip-reading technology spat out words that included a Dina and Contessa, names in a royal title. 
Seemingly disinterested in anything that wasn't a mention from her friends, Lookout had Candy use the trackball to switch over to another camera shot, focusing on a grid of security camera images. The prior image was visible at the very edges of the screen, with a dotted line feeding into a bubble that read, Logs. What do you mean? Lookout asked again. How was Lookout this energetic at this hour, this hurt? Candy had been in the one big fight with Nursery and Lord of Loss, and all the people with guns, and she was exhausted. She'd forgotten what she was even going to say, but now Lookout was staring at her with large eyes. In the gloom of the room, the whites of the eyes were contrasted with dark skin, the orbs capturing the movements of lines and windows from the computer screen. I mean, you know she likes chicken. If you get in the way, she will literally tear- Stupid choice of ways to put it. She was tired. Tear me to pieces? Mm-hmm. Because she likes him a lot. Yeah, I like people that much. And you like him, Candy said. I do. And I like her. And I like you. And I like my team. You know what I mean. Lookout stared at her screen. Candy elbowed her. I'm being good, Lookout said, quiet. And I won't get in the way. I'm being good was the kind of thing that made far too much sense to Candy. She had heard similar things from a lot of her siblings and cousins, which was their term for the sisters and brothers by another mother. She'd even heard the line about being good from some of their quirkier and more messed up unpowered siblings. It was a simple thing to say that said a lot. Candy moved her mental evaluation and whether Darlene would find herself strangling Lookout or being best friends with her one bit towards best friends. What happens if he decides he likes you? I always thought maybe he liked boys. Like one of the Capricorn brothers. Or like my d- Like some people I knew did. Do. He was a big fan of Rain, both with and without the fake face. No, Candy said. No? But- No, I'm an expert on these things. Most of us are. He just thinks Rain's badass. He likes girls. Or he will when he figures out what he's doing. Okay, Lookout said, quiet. Rain is badass. He's one of my favorite people. Is everyone one of your favorite people? Uh, not the jerks who did this to my hands, but Rain, yes, and my team, yes, and Swansong, very yes, and Victoria, very yes, and you guys, very yes. You're the kind of girl in school who has five friends who are all her best friends, huh? Nah, Lookout said. I never had school friends. Hey, is it weird that I'm relieved Chicken likes girls? Candy moved her mental evaluation of the strangle versus friendship thing two bits towards strangle. Because Darlene? she asked, hopefully. I guess? Kind of? Not a definitive yes. Another three bits towards strangle. She'd have to be careful. The portal's open, Lookout said. Her leg jiggled beneath the covers. Hey, the portal's open. That's a thing. Move, type. Shh! A nurse made a noise from the hallway. Type! Lookout hissed through her teeth, waggling her hands. Trackball! The screen was filling up with more white numbers against an orange-tinted security camera image. Nobody was coming through, despite the fact the portal was open. We have weird readings. Powers on the other side, filtered because some powers don't work through or around portals. The camera changed. The mayor's group was entering the station. Snuff was with them. Tattletale probably had a reason for why he was there and not here. Tense minutes passed. Then the message came over the phone. It's Antares. Type, 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 type. Lookout urged. Shh, the nurse in the hallway said. She approached until the capes at the door stopped her. Or I will ask to have your things taken away. Candy was focused enough on the typing and hitting the right keys that she didn't process the words until the exchange was done. And by then... Lookout was having her type in more coordinates. Move that slider to the red, Lookout said. Red? Candy asked. As she did, the subscreen with the data and a few wacky star-shaped symbols changed to be white text on a structured red background. Why? Because it's cool, Lookout whispered. And because the whip was red, and this is the whip, and... She touched a fingerless hand to the screen, smudging it. Below the smudge, a reel of numbers and characters was flying by too fast to read. This is it. 
Phone? Text messages? We need to let Antares know. Candy obeyed. And this next part is long but important, okay? Work with me? If it helps, Candy said. It'll help. It should. I really hope it does. Shh, was the urging from the cape at the door. The two were goalpost and fireaxe. Firax couldn't even use his power in the hospital without setting off alarms, which was dumb. It was Goldpost who was shushing instead of the nurses now. Type, 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 type. Candy typed. It took fifteen minutes. The code made her head spin, and she was providing Lookout the hands to write it. The boxes of dense code were arranged like spokes on a gear, and Lookout kept having her use the trackball to rotate that gear around to add something to one block, or fill in another block. Okay, Lookout paused. Hit the print button. Print? It had to be something. Candy hit the button. Red light crackled and flared at Lookout's hand, and she removed the bandages that were already being pushed away and strained by the emerging growth. Yes! Shush! A nurse barked, looking in. But then she stopped. It was all growing back, the wound seeming to travel to the extremities, with Lookout gritting her teeth in a weird smile as it happened. Darlene sat up, moving the blankets that covered her. Her leg was growing back now. We did it! They did it! Lookout said, bouncing. Her most intact hand gripped the most injured one until the last of the regrowth finished. Then, like it was finally okay to do, she let out a long sigh with a superphysical shudder of relief that shook her entire body. Darlene stood, wobbly at first. She approached Chicken Little, and she moved his mask gingerly. Then she burst into tears. Good tears. The nurses rushed into the room to examine their patients and edged a cherry-eyed Darlene out of the way. If looks could kill, a heart glared through wet eyes, over wet cheeks. Be good, Darlene. Darlene gave her a look that could kill. They're helping him. Darlene relaxed, and with that relaxation, broke down again. She rushed to Lookout's bedside and hugged her friend. We have more work to do? Candy asked. After such a hollow, hurt feeling sitting in her upper chest for so long tonight, she felt buoyant. No, that's everyone, and I don't think that weapon will work again. Not without a lot of rejiggering. Hopefully that protects everyone. Everyone. Candy had an ominous feeling, but was too tired to put it to words. Floor. Darlene put it to word before Candy was done. Candy scrambled out of the bed so fast she almost knocked the laptop to the ground. Darlene followed. Floor was in the hospital room two doors down, but getting there wasn't easy. There weren't any shouts, no noises of alarm, just... A lot of the capes from Antares' mom's team, two security officers, and several nurses. Let me through! Let me through! Candy shouted. You guys don't... Floor was out of bed, wearing a hospital gown. Her hair ruffled up at the back because she had had it on a pillow. A nurse was on her knees beside her. Don't, Candy said. Floor didn't budge, studying the room. It's been a lousy night that's only now getting better. Don't make it suck again. They'll shoot you. Floor looked around. I'll play your freaking fashion princess video game with you, Candy said. She indicated Darlene. We'll take turns playing it with you. Hey, Darlene said. Jerk, don't volunteer me. But Flora backed down. The nurse scrambled away. I thought we said to cuff her to the bed, Candy said. You also said not to touch her. It didn't seem like she was going anywhere, one of the heroes said, watching as Flora crawled back into her bed. She obviously did. Useless heroes. Darlene was already pulling on her arm, dragging her out of the room. They returned to the room. The hustle and bustle surrounding Chicken Little had died down, but some nurses were on either side of the bed. It was Candy's turn to drag Darlene over to where Lookout was tapping away on her phone. Talking to the team? Darlene asked. Tell them thank you. Talking to the team lawyer, Natalie, Lookout said. She says she's suspicious I won't be able to stay with my team. I've been hospitalized twice in a really short span of time. Makes sense, Darlene said. Yeah. Lookout said. She smiled at Darlene. Makes sense. I'll figure something out. The smile was jarring, but Candy didn't know what to say. Darlene climbed up into the hospital bed beside Lookout, 
her attention largely on Chicken Little, who was still drugged to sleep, and Lookout's attention was on the screen, on her team. Candy sat at the edge of the bed, being careful not to block Dar's view, because tonight wasn't a night for teasing. She adjusted the blanket at the foot of the bed to cover herself. The hospital was chilly, and cold air wafted in, seemingly through the single pane windows. Darlene was letting exhaustion overtake her. Her head rested on Lookout's shoulder, and Lookout gave her a pat on the leg. We could make our own team, Candy said. You two, me, chicken. But, Lookout said, I'd be betraying people. Swan song. Then we contract out, Candy added. Exclusively to one team. Maybe two. Cheat the system. Maybe, Lookout said, the smile dropping from her face. Could work. Outside the window, Chicken Large screeched. Narwhal watched as Undersider and Breakthrough climbed out of their vehicles. Government vehicles by the color of the plates. Rides provided by the illustrious mayor of the unnamed city. It had been hours now. The sun would rise in another few hours. Were it a warmer month, it would already be rising. The figure that had once been dauntless loomed above them. Dormant. Quiet. Alone. As alone as any of them were. Narwhal's costume was layered, crystals grown large and each gap covered by another crystal, enough times that her entire figure had changed. Crystals were her boots, so her feet weren't resting against snowy ground, and they framed her chin, nose, eye sockets and ears, while providing the structure that held up her horn. A lot of that was to keep the cold off. Temperature didn't conduct through force field, so it kept her insulated. Here and there she adjusted, exposing neck, collarbone and shoulder above the crystalline suit. Her heart was pounding, breathing was hard, and getting past it seemed impossible. She kept her shoulders back and square, her feet securely beneath her, and hands at her sides. People looked to her, and if she let the facade crack, then it would affect them. She had never been good at giant slaying. She could hold her own against the Endbringers and the other enemies of similar scale, throw up defenses, launch her force fields for offense, but it wasn't the environment where she felt like she did the most good. And she'd been stuck here, facing down the attack from March, and she hadn't done enough good here. It was more frustrating that the higher-ups and paper-pushers would blame her because a power like March's didn't translate to paperwork. It meant expressing that Defiant and Dragon could have three ships in the air, and a squadron of parahumans and soldiers could be in just the right spot at just the right time to make them dangerously able to flank if the ships try to fly past. Move around, open fire, the routes were blocked or there were other obstructions, people who would get caught in the collateral damage. Not permanently. There was always a way, but by the time that way was sought and found, March was on the offensive, and it was always easier to attack than defend. The paper pushers wouldn't get it. They'd talk about budgets, and hint at budget cuts, and blame would be shifted, and it would be a repeat of prior engagements against Jack Slash all over again. But they had the boy who had beaten Jack Slash and the Wardens. Jack Slash had had an unknown factor giving him an edge. His power gave him the upper hand against any parahuman, and his slaughterhouse nine made it next to impossible for civilians to get to him. March's coterie didn't cover a weakness so much as it augmented her strengths. It was possible that made it more fragile, but Narwhal wouldn't get the chance. Her strength was in wading into confrontations and walking out the other side with her enemy broken. Warlords, gangs, armies. 
but her eternal tragedy was that she was often the only one both capable and willing to step up and be a leader, negotiating the balance between leadership and dealing with the people behind desks and benches. The undersiders and breakthrough parted. Truce between them now done. Hero and villain each had a side to go to. The mayor's hench people, harbingers, went their own way. Neither hero nor villain. Well, most. Weld had arrived. He was the kind of young man she would have drafted into any of her teams at any point. Driven, conscientious, kind and just wounded enough that there was something to look after, where she could have him under her wing without feeling like his talents weren't being wasted leading a team elsewhere. Antares led well to one of the last vehicles in the convoy. He opened the door and was embraced by what Narwhal took to be his girlfriend. That was a mess. Narwhal had seen him making eyes at one of the other girls in the warden, Slikian. She'd noticed and she'd approached him, and he turned her down. It wouldn't have been easy. This... That? It couldn't be good. It was too far from human, and Weld was more in touch with humanity than a lot of humans were. If he'd asked Narwhal for advice, she would have told him she liked Slickian for him more than she liked this girl. That he had his own healing and growing to do, and it seemed to her that he was putting it on hold. It was maybe better that he hadn't asked her. It was even possible that he knew her well enough to know what the advice she would give would be. If that were true, then when and if he needed help making the hard decision, he would ask her. Cracks, Narwhal thought. Her fingers touched a damaged force field she hadn't yet dismissed, tracing the fissures and missing pieces. We all have them. If we have to slay this giant... We'll have to find his. Cracks in the individual, yes. That was a thing. Weld had his. Narwhal knew she certainly had her own. But between, too. Between Weld and his current girlfriend. Breakthrough and the undersiders had closed the gap, at least a little. But some fissures remained. Foil didn't join Breakthrough, and she didn't rejoin the Undersiders. Her focus was on the giant. Narwhal approached, dismissing the damaged shield. How is your girlfriend? Narwhal asked, to open the conversation and let Foil know she was there. Perian? I'm surprised you were keeping enough track of me to know. She's fine now. She has to be careful when eating or drinking, but she'll mend. You should go to her. We don't think the situation will change any time soon. Foyle nodded, but she didn't budge. I can listen if you need to talk, Narwhal said. I don't know what I'd say. Every time I'm faced with this stuff, I find myself less able to deal with it, get images out of my head. It takes longer to ease down. Yes, when the feeling of your heart pounding and your adrenaline surging becomes normal and the moments of rest or tranquility are the thing that you have to go looking for. Not exactly that. Feeling freaked out. I saw the woman I love get hurt in a really grisly way because of March in a roundabout way. And I'm worried that if I go see her... I won't be able to stop seeing her get hurt. Does that make sense? It makes sense. But you can't avoid seeing her forever, Foyle. Lily? Foyle looked surprised at the mention of her name. Narwhal gave her a sympathetic look. We thought about recruiting you. We looked you up. It was determined it would be too antagonistic with a mid-tier power. Tattletale, Foyle asked. She sounded angry. We can talk about options after, if you want. 
don't hold it against Tattletail. Please don't hold it against us. I'm distracting you from what you were talking about. You're avoiding Perean? I'm avoiding the reminder. It's like there's all this stuff in the past. Bloody, messy, grisly, so much death. Perean's helping her family, and I'm helping her help them. Family is important to her, and we're getting them the last few surgeries they really need. But that's bloody messy and grisly, too. Do you feel like you have to? Do I... What? I do it anyway. But does it feel obligatory? Narwhal asked. They come as part and parcel with your partner. Does it feel like you have to, to keep her beside you? But I would anyway. Yes, because you're heroic by nature, but it being something you must do makes it feel like a trap. A nuisance becomes a torture when you're trapped. Foyle shrugged. Maybe the wrong approach. Foyle ventured, all that stuff in the past, all that stuff going in the background when we're home, in the present, and then I find myself worrying. What if March comes again? What if I have to watch my girlfriend drag a baby out of her windpipe, or if someone does to her what happened to her family, or... Foyle lifted her arms, then let them fall. You can control the future, Narwhal said. I can, though. I can control what comes back home. I'm thinking about retiring, at least in the short term, just to get away from the grisly messy stuff, messy relationships and team dynamics. That would be an awful shame, Narwhal said. You're a good cape. Thank you for saying so. You should go home and take care of your girlfriend. Sleep, rest. This... This is scary. What happened tonight? The deaths and the damage. It's horrific. But a good night's sleep with someone you love will put a surprising amount of distance between that and how you feel about it. Do you have that? Good nights of sleep? Someone to hold? No, Narwhal said. She extended foil an apologetic expression. No. When I was in similar straits to where you are now, I chose not to go home. Then there was nobody to go home to. I got my power trying to protect someone, and I didn't have anyone to protect anymore. I stopped being able to have quiet days. I don't sleep without thinking about what I should be doing. I felt much like you seem to feel now, and... I went on one more mission, because carrying on was easier than bringing it home. It's not like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Narwhal nodded. I know. We're different people. But maybe if you'd gone home, then you would have found yourself unable to stop dreading the mess that comes tomorrow, and you would have found it all disintegrating. Who knows? Narwhal asked. I might stay for a while, just to be safe, offer my assistance if anyone needs it. I could order you. You're not my boss, Foyle said. But I could order you. I bet you'd listen. I want to go after her, Foyle said. Tell me you have leads. Narwhal was quiet. Please. I want her gone, so Perean doesn't have to worry about her, so I can know that tomorrow will be... Easier? Foyle looked up at the dauntless titan. There were names being bandied around for it. Marchless, Foyle said. But you were hinting that I would be making a mistake if I went on one more mission, even when I'm not exactly... I haven't been active lately. It's been months. I feel like you're painting me as an alcoholic when I've had a drink every six months and done fine. But if I take this one next drink, it's somehow going to destroy me. 
I'm painting you as an alcoholic because you just had a drink and you're telling me you're not fine and you want to take another now. What would you do different if you could go back? Narwhal took a deep breath. Slices of force field rubbed against one another. Sorry, Foyle said, if that's a personal question. I wouldn't go alone. Foyle nodded, her arms folded. Before the girl could open her mouth, Narwhal said, I'll phone you what we have. Foyle was already moving, driven. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go before the trail gets any colder, then. Thank you. Rachel, hey, I need your hound, will you? Not what I meant by not going alone, Narwhal thought. Foyle, she said, her voice stern. Foyle stopped. You could die. I know. But I couldn't live with it if she does something... Anything like this again, and I could have stopped it. Either I stop, or I stop her. Who did we lose? Swansong asked. Tempera, Antares answered. Withdrawal is hurt. Finale is beside herself. How is your mother? Swansong asked. The question was loaded. Swansong and Antares' mother had been at one another's throats. Antares didn't immediately respond. You don't have to say. I'll find out some other way. She's going to Earth, Sheen, Antares finally answered. Uh, I'm sorry. Antares shook her head. It'll either go well or it won't. I have no idea what to say, whatever happens. But Amy knows enough to explain things to my parents. Fill in the blanks. Hmm. Swansong made a sound. Antares turned her head skyward, hands up near her head, as if she were making a plea to the heavens. Except the heavens were largely occupied by the massive titan that loomed in the upper end of what had been New Brockton Bay, straddling the portal there. I'm just telling myself that Lookout is happy, healthy, and with friends. The other kids are fine. Capricorn is intact. Precipice's cluster members are in custody. He doesn't have to worry about that. You're intact again. We are okay. Sveta has welled, Swansong said, pointing. Antares nodded without smiling. We made a good impact, Swansong said. We made an impact. The Harbingers counted the injured and the dead. Thirty individuals bound for hospitals. Twelve are dead. Four of those are our fault. Our fault. Not counting me. Play imbecile games. Win imbecile prizes, Swansong said. I threw Etna and her stupid costume into a hill and I didn't see her recover. I didn't overdo it, but... She could be one of the three that are possibly me. I liked her costume, Swansong said. Really? Swansong extended a finger towards Antares. Don't question my tastes. Flaming sorceress raiment over a long coat is perfectly acceptable costuming. It's so overwrought. It's wrought. And whether it's overwrought or underwrought is a question of the person who wears it. She didn't live up to it, yes? We'll compromise by agreeing on that, Antares said. Swansong nodded, smiling. Harbinger too told me that one of the dead is definitely me. I think the reason I'm thinking of Etna, the big question mark, and trying to put her face onto one of those bodies is that I don't even know what the face of the guy I took down looks like. Imagine a smashed pumpkin filled with hamburger patty, Swansong said. Not funny. No, but it's reality. It's what I did to my mother. Not the face. That was intact. <sighs> Antares groaned. She's alive. She'll live. 
That's better than some outcomes, Swan Song said. That the violence happened at your hands is something you learn to live with. Do I want to, though? Lookout's content. Capricorn's intact. Prespice doesn't have to worry about his cluster for now. Possibly ever, depending on how you want to resolve that. Antares sighed. Sveta gets to end the day by hugging her boyfriend. I'm intact. The navigators are healed and being cared for. Hopefully, we've broken the back of this stupidity that overtook the villains of the city. Not stupidity. Mania? Pushback. I don't know. This thing, that was dauntless. It's like a giant nail stuck in the middle of things. It's frozen the entire situation. We are all so caught up waiting for the other shoe to drop that we're back to where we were a year ago. I'm happier than I was a year ago, Swansong said. So is Lookout. She's not with her parents anymore. So is Prespis, I think. Sveta? Work on that. Focus on that. Trying. Good. Perfect. And, Danzel said deciding to approach before this became any more saccharine. You don't need to worry about me anymore. What? Swansong asked. I'm going. I have the money. I have what I need. I'll send my people to get my things in a few days. You don't have people, Swansong said. That irritated. Danzel bit back a reply because appearance was too important here, with potential enemies and allies watching. Swan Song didn't have people either. Not in the proper, respectable way. She was so ruined by this whole dynamic that she would have said she was an equal or partner. Member of a team. But she was following orders and being subordinate to someone who had just been the coach just a little while ago. I will. Besides, it's not like I can stay. You could if you wanted, Swansong said. I cut you. You won't be able to rest easy with the knowledge that I could do it again while you sleep. You know I would. I know who we are, Swansong said. And if you think you're safe sleeping under the same roof as her, Damsel told Antares, think again. Keep your distance from her if you know what's good for you. Because if you don't splatter her against the wall until there's more of her on the wall than on the ground, then she'll do it to you. Enough, Swansong said. Enough? Don't you mean stop? Damsel asked, archly. Her tone became vicious. <laughs> Remember. Stop. You stop. Wasn't that what you said to him before you put a hole in his chest? I did have that dream, you know. And I say dream, not nightmare. That registered. Not any of the soft friendship, not looking after lonely little girls, nor scruffy teenage boys. That moment meant more than all of this put together, and you're trying to pretend it didn't. You're embarrassing us, Swan Song said. There is no us, Damsel raised her voice, because I'd be disgusted to be grouped with you at this point. You want to talk about overwrought? You don't live up to your own damn standards. Hey, Norwell said. A force field appeared between Damsel and the pair. The material like a crudely cut piece of crystal, or thick glass with the edges chipped to a razor edge, bearing a rainbow sheen. She stared into it and through it, and the reflection was distorted. If it wasn't for the fact that the face she saw was standing alone, she could have thought she were looking through at her wretched sister. She scoffed and turned her back on the scene. Lights beyond the window flickered on. A soft alarm began playing. May had to crawl out from beneath the covers and over Tori to get to the computer by the bed. Oh my god, she murmured. 
If we hadn't been interrupted, I could be the one saying that, Tori groused. What is it? You sound delighted. We have company, May said. She stood from the bed and she stretched, working every muscle in her body. And eight minutes before that company finds me. That company being... who? Foil and a dog. They're sniffing around. I'll contact the others, Tori said. May moved her phone. She switched to a map icon, showing the location of everyone in the area. They're up. Take it? Confirm. They should start moving. They'll be here in six, six and a half, seven, and nine minutes. Then wait it out. No, May said. No need. I have this. Dress me. Hm? Tori asked. Like a squire, dressing her knight for battle, May said. She bent down to kiss Tori. Come on. Dressing her knight to go romance someone else. I'm a romantic. Every interaction I have with someone has a flair of romance to it. You might as well ask water not to make what it touches wet. Tori muttered. This interruption and the way you're acting is making me dry up faster than the Sahara. Don't crab at me, baby. Come, help. May kissed Tori passionately enough that Tori allowed herself to believe in the feelings behind the act. Reluctantly, she sat up, swung her legs down by the side of the bed, and picked up the articles of clothing that lay in a heap. Undergarments, a semi-elastic sleeve of mesh backed by silk that extended from armpit to the bottom of the hips, then the long sleeve top and leggings she had to roll up. May's entire body was muscular, lean. No, with the costume going on, she was approaching the threshold of becoming March rather than May. With this stupid vendetta-slash-obsession, she was well past that threshold. This was when she ceased being Tori's May and became Foyle's March. She was bitter, but she tried not to let it show. When March was going to battle, the wrong words and sentiments could put the wrong ideas into her head. There was that slim risk that a moment's doubt at the wrong time could lead to a critical and terminal error. Paralyzing. But she'd known what she was getting into with May. She'd been forewarned and reminded time and again. It was stupid to have any illusions. With leggings and long sleeve top on, it could have been a rather plain skin-tight costume. The pants and jacket were next. March, probably conscious of time, picked up her own belt. Mask. Hat. March took the hat before it was placed on her head, performed a motion where it flipped in the air and settled onto her head. Her hair was messy, and she had morning breath. More than morning breath. But there was only so much time, and March was mindful of time. Tori threw on a bathrobe so she would be covered, if not necessarily decent. On a level, being indecent felt like it was important, as if she could remind Foyle of where things stood. She put on her coat, but left the front undone, and stepped into her boots, following a few paces behind March, who exited. She reached out to tow the door to her hand instead of letting it close. March spun on her heel, shooting her a wink, using her rapier to blow a kiss. No. Tori said impulsive, hating herself for saying it. Take this seriously. I take nothing seriously. Not even me? Tori asked. That's different. Then prove it, Tori said, still hating herself. You say she doesn't matter? Not in the short term, but a lot of things that don't matter are still worth messing with. Prove it, Tori said. Kill her. But, or I'm walking away. That's silly. Tori remained silent. We'll get to see how Ixnay's doing, March said. She flourished her blade. All right. Tori watched as March ventured down the street. The dog ran out from a nearby alleyway, stopping in the middle of the road. Foyle followed it. As rumpled as March was, her hair in some disarray, Foyle was crisp, hair straight. She didn't look like someone who had been up all night. No, not until she moved. Tori saw and delighted in the faintest sway as the girl turned and dismissed the hound, bidding it to step to one side. March had slept like a baby until the early dawn hours, and they'd languished in bed. As messy as she was, she was sharp mentally. "'You found me,' March said. "'There were sightings. The hound got me the rest of the way.' "'Perfect,' March said. Foyle drew her weapon. March was the first to move. A dash forward, weapon thrusting, Foyle's weapon shimmered before it met March's. 
small localized explosion marked the conflict between the two powers, each nullifying the other. There was no attack. Defense. Pause here. March maintained the attack, one parry becoming a thrust in the next instant, every step of her foot an attempt to slip past Foyle's guard. She leaned back as the blade passed within half an inch of her throat. Close, March said. Closer than I and Foyle stabbed, and March was forced to stop talking when she dodged the onslaught that followed. She found an opportunity to take two quick steps back, then returned. Instead of an attack that was parried or avoided, it was attack met by attack. Two rapiers, and for what looked like five consecutive thrusts, the tip of each rapier met the tip of the other. Foyle threw nails, augmented with her power, and March avoided them. March struck at the ground, sending power-infused dirt in Foyle's direction, and it detonated in the air. Foyle turned away from it. "'One of my arms is pretty torn up. I'm doing pretty well, considering—' "'Stop talking!' Foyle barked the words. "'I don't want to hear your voice!' March laughed. "'Don't fucking laugh!' Foyle advanced, harder this time. March spun with every step, each spin seeing the blade catch at the ground as it passed her left or right, and met Foyle's blade every time she faced Foyle. Once, it seemed, while her back was to the woman. Foyle sidestepped the dirt that exploded with scintillating colors, pressing the attack. Tori's hand moved. If she tugged Foyle... Foyle threw more nails. March struck three of them out of the air. The fourth found its way to Tori's middle finger, embedding it to the doorframe. Her knees buckled with the pain. Poor form, March said, jovial. She didn't care. Then Tori didn't either. She used her power, a tug, to pull Foyle off balance. March's swing was already underway. Foyle hastily parried it, then fell because she was off balance. March hung back, waiting for Foyle to get back to her feet. She glanced back at Tori, head tilted. I'm not going to end it there, but I am going to allow it. It's fair play. You involve her, she involves you. Speaking of, March said, her sword flicked to one side. Wind stirred a bit of snow around them. Foyle glowered, hand gripping her weapon's handle. You did something clever. Did you assassinate my mega cluster? March asked, voice light. She laughed. No, I don't think you could have. But you have a friend. I hate that laugh. You're going to hear it again, you know. I adore this. This is what it's all about, my dear. We lead lives that are nasty in the best way, brutish in the bloodiest way, and short in my case because I'm just a little bit vertically challenged. Then we're together forever. You've said something like that before. You know this, Foyle, March said. Deep down inside, you feel hate because it's a close emotion to love. But we are connected. We're inexorably intertwined. In power. In mind. And maybe, hopefully... In body. You know that we're going to end up together in the same way that you know how to put power into that metal rapier of yours. Or you know how to move to utilize your enhanced accuracy. Delusion, Foyle said. Reality. More real than any of this. I've seen it. How do you think I know cluster triggers as well as I do? I've seen the network, the landscape, and how it all fits together. I've seen the spots that are reserved for us. Homer's already there. When all's said and done, that's where we go. To spend a few eons talking and intertwining until we dissolve into a greater consciousness. Foyle stopped, her rapier dropping a fraction. Tori sank lower, head down. Her heart plummeted. It's glorious. That sounds like a nightmare. You'll see, March said. There's nothing you can do to change it. It's inevitable. You, me, Homer... Together for a long enough time, it might as well be forever. More snow blew. Foyle threw a nail. March deflected it. Come on, don't be childish, March chided. If that's true, then I can't kill you, Foyle said. I'll have to trap you somewhere else, in another state. Even Greyboy's famous bubbles will only last 10,000 years or so, March said. I asked when we were working on the ways to break the time effects. That's like delaying an 80-year marriage by two days. Foyle's neck was rigid, hand-clenching her weapon. Then, Foyle said, and she was clearly floundering, then I have to destroy you. That. You, March. Your identity. 
Every inch of you that wants to talk, your personality, your understanding of English, every other language you could speak, you. March swished her sword a few times. Foyle's head shook with the intensity of what she was saying and feeling. There was no swish to her sword. I'd rather become the kind of monster who can do that, or who can hire people who do that, than I'd go to this hell you describe. March looked over her shoulder at Tori. Guess you get what you wanted, Tor. Foyle lunged. Before Tori could do anything, the pair were out of sight. Tori focused on her hand. She tried to drag her finger along the nail to the end, but the spike threaded through the bone. The bone reached the flared head of the nail, and it stopped. She pulled, one half of her hand at the tip of the finger, the other half on the other end of the finger, split between the two sides of the nail. She hauled, screaming. Wood creaked, but didn't release the nail, and her flesh squeezed between the head of the nail and the bone until it separated out in every direction. The bone threatened to break by the sheer pain of it. Whoops. Tori felt the pain in her throat, then the flood of blood washing down her front and onto her lap. Her one hand wasn't enough to staunch the entire flow, and immediately her thoughts began to go dark and fuzzy, like all of the buoyancy and light had just dropped out of her brain leaving it dark and heavy. She'd experienced this before with the cluster. Bianca had done it to her. So had their red priest. It didn't surprise her in the least that this was how she met her end. She almost, not quite, but almost found her peace with the realization. She saw a glimpse of an arm. Mar was her gurgling scream. Tori, was the response. Dang it! Tori saw the arm in shadows. Her second thoughts and resentments fell away like the blood from her slit throat. She did love May. She would... She reached out and used her power. Only a pulse, whatever her power drew on physiologically, it needed oxygen and blood supply in the brain, and she didn't have enough. But it caused a delay. The figure had just revealed herself, holding a bloody knife, a girl in a gray demon mask. Imp. March struck her rapier through Imp's ribcage. Heart on. Foyle's headlong rush tried to capitalize on the distraction. Without turning around, March struck the now gleaming rapier beneath her armpit and backward. The explosion marked the conflict of the powers, and helped to push Foyle's rapier far enough away that she could put the weapon through Foyle's chest as well. Come on, Tori. Let's get you looked after, March said as the pair fell to the ground behind her. I suppose I'm going to have to kill their friends, because they'll be out for revenge. Tori's fuzzed senses heard March's voice. That's not supposed to be there. She forced herself to focus. March, backing up, two figures advancing. March tripped. It's not the timing of my reinforcements that you fudged, March said as she rose to her feet. She stumbled a little on the retreat. It's the... Foil stabbed. March deflected. There was another thrust, and March met this one with a riposte. Her thrust extended toward Foyle's chest, and Foyle met the tip with her hand. From Tori's side-on perspective, she could see how it worked. Harder to see head-on or from the wielder's perspective. The blade grew shorter as it traveled. There was resistance as it met flesh, but the wound was relatively shallow. The blade didn't extend out the back of the hand as Foyle closed her hand around the guard. Just as it hadn't extended through the backs, or hearts, of the pair March had just stabbed. It's the space, March said. There was no dodging or pulling away. She pushed power into the tip, setting the timer. The wound at the center of Foyle's left hand detonated, but the weapon had been compressed. The explosion was smaller, localized. Chunks of meat went flying, but Foyle seemed to consider it worth the price. She returned the favor by stabbing March. Tori let her head hang. 
foil spat. Spinning on her. Wow. Deserves it. Sure, not going to say no, but wow. Can we go get my arm back? Yeah, let's. And let's get me a new left hand while we're at it. Tori looked up and saw the two walking away. The girl in the demon mask had her arm raised, waving off to someone distant. They whistled for the dog, and it padded by. Tori thought of what May had said, about what awaited her, and allowed herself to recognize that Bianca would be there, as would the others. The thought gripped her as the darkness carried her away. The warped length of a dropped rapier and the distortion of the ground around her reverted to normal, leaving only snow and blood to alter the ground. This was a production of Ward by Parahuman Audio. Ward and the Parahuman Stories are written and owned by J.C. McRae. You can find the original text and support the author at parahumans.net. For more of the Ward audiobook, as well as other community works, please visit parahumanaudio.com. Music for this chapter was by Anexia. Editing by Samurai Buko. Narration by Robert Rain Ramsey. Find more of their work at our website. Thank you for listening.